Part three, chapter five of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part three, chapter five. A very striking looking man with perfect manners and beautiful hands. Her head bent over her sewing, Polly repeated these words to herself with a happy little smile. They had been told her in confidence by Mrs. Glendinning, and had been said by this lady's best friend, Mrs. Urquhart of Yarangabilly. On the occasion of Richard's second call at Dandaloo, he had been requested to ride to the neighbouring station to visit Mrs. Urquhart, who was in delicate health. And, of course, Polly had passed the flattering opinion on, for though she was a rather good hand at keeping a secret, Richard declared he had never known a better, yet that secret did not exist, or up to now had not existed, which she could imagine herself keeping from him. For the past few weeks these two ladies had vied with each other in singing Richard's praises, and in making much of Polly. The second time Mrs. Glendinning called, she came in her buggy, and carried off Polly and Trotty too to Urangabilly, where there was a nestful of little ones for the child to play with. Another day a whole brakeful of lively people drove up to the door in the early morning, and insisted on Polly accompanying them, just as she was, to the race-course on the road to Creswick's Creek and everybody was so kind to her that Polly heartily enjoyed herself, in spite of her plain print dress. She won a pair of gloves and a piece of music in a Philippine with Mr. Urquhart, a jolly carroty-haired man, beside whom she sat on the box-seat coming home, and she was lucky enough to have a half-crown on one of the winners. An impromptu dance was got up that evening by the merry party in a hall in the township, and Polly had the honour of a turn with Mr. Henry Ocock, who was most affable. Richard also looked in for an hour toward the end, and waltzed her and Mrs. Glendinning around. Polly had quite lost her heart to her new friend. At the outset Richard had rather frowned on the intimacy, but then he was a person given to taking unaccountable antipathies. In this case, however, he had to yield, for not only did a deep personal liking spring up between the two women, but a wave of pity swept over Polly, blinding her to more subtle considerations. Before Mrs. Glendinning had been many times at the house, she had poured out all her troubles to Polly, impelled thereto by Polly's quick sympathy and warm young eyes. Richard had purposely given his wife few details of his visits to Dandaloo, but Mrs. Glendinning knew no such scruples, and cried her eyes out on Polly's shoulder. "'What a dreadful man the husband must be, for she really is the dearest little woman, Richard, and means so well with every one. I've never heard her say a sharp or unkind word. Well, not very clever, perhaps, but everybody can't be clever, can they? And she's good, which is better. The only thing she seems a teeny-weeny bit foolish about is her boy. I'm afraid she'll never consent to part with him. Polly said this to prepare her husband, who was in correspondence on the subject with Archdeacon Long and with John in Melbourne. Richard was putting himself to a great deal of trouble, and would naturally be vexed if nothing came of it. Polly paid her first visit to Dandaloo with considerable trepidation. For Mrs. Urquhart, who herself was happily married, although it was true her merry red-haired husband had the reputation of being a little too fond of the ladies, and though he certainly did not make such a paying concern of Urangabilly as Mr. Glendinning of Dandaloo, Mrs. Urquhart had whispered to Polly as they sat chatting on the veranda, "'Such a dreadful man, my dear, a perfect brute! Poor little Agnes! It's wonderful how she keeps her spirits up!' Polly, however, was in honour bound to admit that to her the owner of Dandaloo had appeared anything but the monster report made him out to be. He was perfectly sober the day she was there, and didn't touch wine at luncheon, and afterwards he had been most kind, taking her with him on a quiet little broad-backed mare to an outlying part of the station, and giving her several hints how to improve her seat. He was certainly very haggard-looking and deeply wrinkled, and at table his hand shook so that the water in his glass ran over. But all this only made Polly feel sorry for him, and long to help him. "'My dear, you are favoured. I never knew James make such an offer before.' whispered Mrs. Glendinning, as she pinned her ample riding-skirt around her friend's slim hips. The one thing about him that disturbed Polly was his manner towards his wife. He was savagely ironic with her, and trampled hobnailed on her timid opinions. But then Agnes didn't know how to treat him. Polly soon saw that. She was nervous and fluttery, evasive, too, and once during lunch even told a deliberate fib. 
Slight as was her acquaintance with him, Polly felt sure this want of courage must displease him, for there was something very simple and direct about his own way of speaking. "'My dear, why don't you stand up to him?' asked little Polly. "'Dearest, I dare not. If you knew him as I do, Polly, he terrifies me. Oh, what a lucky little woman you are to have a husband like yours!' Polly had recalled these words that very morning as she stood to watch Richard ride away. Never did he forget to kiss her good-bye, or to turn and wave to her at the foot of the road. Each time she admired afresh the figure he cut on horseback, he was so tall and slender, and sat so straight in his saddle. Now, too, he had yielded to her persuasions and shaved off his beard, and his moustache and side-whiskers were like his hair, of an extreme silky blond. Ever since the day of their first meeting at Beamish's family hotel, Polly had thought her husband the handsomest man in the world and the best as well. He had his peculiarities, of course, but so had every husband, and it was part of a wife's duty to study them, to adapt herself to them, or to endeavour to tone them down. And now came these older, wiser ladies, and confirmed her high opinion of him. Polly beamed with happiness at this juncture, and registered a silent vow always to be the best of wives. Not like—but here she tripped and coloured on the threshold of her thought— she had recently been the recipient of a very distressing confidence, one, too, which she was not at liberty to share, even with Richard. For after the relief of a thorough-paced confession, Mrs. Glendinning had implored her not to breathe a word to him. I could never look him in the face again, love. Besides, the affair was of such a painful nature that Polly felt little desire to draw Richard into it. It was bad enough that she herself should know. The thing was this— once, when Polly had stayed overnight at Dandaloo, Agnes Glendinning, in a sudden fit of misery, had owned to her that she cared for another person more than for her own husband, and that her feelings were returned. Shocked beyond measure, Polly tried to close her friend's lips. "'I don't think you should mention any names, Agnes,' she cried. "'Afterwards, my dear, you might regret it.' But Mrs. Glendinning was hungry for the luxury of speech. Not even to Louisa Urquhart had she broken silence, she wept and that for the sake of Louise's children, and she persisted in laying her heart bare. And here certain vague suspicions that had crossed Polly's mind on the night of the impromptu ball, they were gone again in an instant, quick as thistledown on the breeze, these suddenly returned life-size and weighty, and the name that was spoken came as no surprise to her. Yes, it was Mr. Henry Ocock to whom poor Agnes was attached. There had been a mutual avowal of affection, sobbed the latter. They met as often as circumstances permitted. Polly was thunderstruck. Knowing Agnes as she did, she herself could not believe any harm of her, but she shuddered at the thought of what other people, Richard, for instance, would say, did they get wind of it. She implored her friend a caution. She ought never, never to see Mr. Ocock. Why did she not go away to Melbourne for a time? And why had he come to Ballarat? to be near me, dearest, to help me if I should need him. Oh, you can't think what a comfort it is, Polly, to feel that he is here, so good and strong and clever. Yes, I know what you mean, but this is quite, quite different. Henry does not expect me to be clever, too, does not want me to be. He prefers me as I am. He dislikes clever women, would never marry one. And we shall marry, darling, some day, when— Henry Ocock. Polly tried to focus everything she knew of him— all her fleeting impressions in one picture, and failed. He had made himself very agreeable the single time she had met him, but there was Richard's opinion of him. Richard did not like him or trust him. He thought him unscrupulous in business, cold and self-seeking. Poor, poor little Agnes, that such a misfortune should befall just her. Stranger still that she, Polly, should be mixed up in it. She had, of course, always known from books that such things did happen, but then they seemed quite different and very far away. Her thoughts at this crisis were undeniably woolly, but the gist of them was that life and books had nothing in common. For in stories the woman who forgot herself was always a bad woman, whereas not the harshest critic could call poor Agnes bad. Indeed, Polly felt that even if someone proved to her that her friend had actually done wrong, she would not on that account be able to stop caring for her or feeling sorry for her. It was all very uncomfortable and confusing. While these thoughts came and went, she half sat, half knelt, a pair of scissors in her hand. 
She was busy cutting out a dress, and no table being big enough for the purpose had stretched the material on the parlour floor. This would be the first new dress she had had since her marriage, and it was high time, considering all the visiting and going about that fell to her lot just now. Sarah had sent the pattern up from Melbourne, and John, hearing what was in the wind, had most kindly and generously made her a present of the silk. Polly hoped she would not bungle it in the cutting, but skirts were growing wider and wider, and John had not reckoned with quite the newest fashion. Steps in the passage made her note subconsciously that Ned had arrived— Jerry had been in the house for the past three weeks with a sprained wrist. At this moment her younger brother himself entered the room, Trotty throned on his shoulder. Picking his steps around the sea of stuff, Jerry sat down and lowered Trotty to his knee. Ned's grizzling for tea. Polly did not reply. She was laying an odd-shaped piece of paper, now this way, now that. For a while Jerry played with the child, then he burst out, "'I say, Paul!' and since Polly paid no heed to his apostrophe, "'Richard says I can go back to work to-morrow.' "'That's a good thing,' answered his sister, with an air of abstraction. She had solved her puzzle to within half a yard. Jerry cast a boyishly imploring glance at her back, and rubbed his chin with his hand. "'Polly, old girl, I say, wouldn't you put in a word for me with Richard? I'm hanged if I want to go back to the claim. I'm sick to death of digging.' At this Polly did raise her head to regard him with grave eyes. "'What, tired of work already, Jerry? I don't know what Richard will say to that, I'm sure. You'd better speak to him yourself.' Again Jerry rubbed his chin. "'That's just it, what's so beastly hard. I know he'll say I ought to stick to it.' "'So do I.' "'Well, I'd rather groom the horse than that.' "'But think how pleased you were at first. Jerry ruefully admitted it. One expects to dig out gold like spuds, while the real thing's enough to give you the blight. As for stopping a wages man all my life, I won't do it. I might just as well go home and work in a Lancashire pit. But Ned— Oh, Ned! Ned walks about with his head in the clouds. He's always blowing of what he's going to do, and gets his steam off that way. I'm different. But Jerry's words fell on deaf ears. A noise in the next room was engaging Polly's whole attention. She heard a burr of suppressed laughter, a scuffle, and what sounded like a sharp slap. Jumping up, she went to the door, and was just in time to see Ellen whisk out of the dining-room. Ned sat in an armchair with his feet on the chimney-piece. "'I had the girl bring in a log, Paul, he said, and looked back and up at his sister with his cheery smile. Standing behind him, Polly laid her hand on his hair. "'I'll go and see after the tea.' Ned was so unconcerned that she hesitated to put a question. In the kitchen she had no such tender scruples, nor was she imposed on by the exaggerated energy with which Ellen bustled about. "'What was that noise I heard in the dining-room just now?' she demanded. "'Noise? I don't know,' gave back the girl crossly without facing her. "'Nonsense, Ellen. Do you think I didn't hear?' "'Oh, get along with you. It was only one of Ned's jokes.' and going on her knees, Ellen set to scrubbing the brick floor, with a hiss and a scratch that rendered speech impossible. Polly took up the laden tea-tray and carried it into the dining-room. Richard had come home, and the four drew chairs to the table. Mahony had a book with him. He propped it open against the butter-cooler, and snatched sentences as he ate. It fell to Ned to keep the ball rolling. Polly was distraught to the point of going wrong in her sugars— Jerry uneasy at the prospect of coming in conflict with his brother-in-law, whom he thought the world of. Ned was as full of talk as an egg of meat. The theme he dwelt longest on was the new glory that lay in store for the Ballarat diggings. At present these were under a cloud. The alluvial was giving out, and the costs and difficulties of boring through the rock seemed insuperable. One might hear the opinion freely expressed that Ballarat's day as premier goldfield was done. Ned set up this belief merely for the pleasure of demolishing it. He had it at first hand that great companies were being formed to carry on operations. These would reckon their areas in acres instead of feet, would sink to a depth of a quarter of a mile or more, raise wash-dirt in hundreds of tons per day. One such company, indeed, had already sprung into existence out on Golden Point, and now was the time to nip in. If he, Ned, had the brass, or knew anybody who'd lend it to him, he'd buy up all the shares he could get. Those who followed his lead would make their fortunes. 
"'I say, Richard, it'd be something for you.' His words evoked no response. "'Sorry, though I shall be,' thought Polly. "'Dear Ned had better not come to the house so often in future. "'I wonder if I need tell Richard why.' Jerry was on pins and needles, and even put Trotty ungently from him. Richard would be so disgusted by Ned's blatherskite that he would have no patience left to listen to him. Mahony kept his nose to his book. As a matter of principle, he made a rule of believing, on an average, about the half of what Ned said. To appear to pay attention to him would spur him on to more flagrant overstatements. "'Do you hear, Richard? Now's your chance,' repeated Ned, not to be done. "'A very different thing, this, I can tell you, from running around dosing people for the collywobbles. I know men who are raising the splosh any way they can get in.' "'I dare say there's never been any lack of gamblers on Ballarat,' said Mahony dryly, and passed his cup to be refilled. "'Pig-headed fool!' was Ned's mental retort, as he sliced a chunk of rabbit pie. "'Well, I bet you'll feel sore some day you didn't take my advice,' he said aloud. "'We shall see, my lad, we shall see,' replied Mahony. "'In the meantime, let me inform you, I can make good use of every penny I have. So if you have come here thinking you can wheedle something out of me, you're mistaken.' He could seldom resist tearing the veil from Ned's gross hints and impostures. "'Oh, no, Richard, dear,' interpolated Polly, in her role of keeper of the peace. Ned answered huffily, "'Pon my word, I never met such a fellow as you for thinking the worst of people.' The thrust went home. Mahony clapped his book, too. "'You lay yourself open to it, sir. If I'm wrong, I beg your pardon, but for goodness' sake, Ned, put all these trashy ideas of making a fortune out of your mind. Digging is played out, I tell you. Decent people turned their backs on it long ago.' "'That's what I think, too,' threw in Jerry. Mahony bit his lip. "'Come, come now, what do you know about it?' Jerry flushed and floundered until Polly came to his aid. "'He's been wanting to speak to you, Richard. He hates the work as much as you did.' "'Well, he has a tongue of his own. Speak for yourself, my boy.' Thus encouraged, Jerry made his appeal, and fearing lest Richard should throw him, half heard, into the same category as Ned, he worded it very tersely. Mahony, who had never given much heed to Jerry, no one did, was pleased by his straightforward air. Still, he didn't know what could be done for him, and said so. Here Polly had an inspiration. But I think I do. I remember Mr. Ocock saying to me the other day he must take another boy into the business. It was growing so. The fourth this will make. I don't know if he's suited yet, but even if he is, he may have heard of something else. Only you know, Jerry, you mustn't mind what it is. After tea I'll put on my bonnet and go down to the flat with you, and Ned shall come too, she added with a consoling glance at her elder brother. Ned had extended his huff to his second slice of pie, which lay untouched on his plate. "'Somebody has always got something up her sleeve,' said Mahony affectionately, when Polly came to him in walking costume. "'None the less, wife, I shouldn't be surprised if those brothers of yours gave us some trouble before we're done with them.'" End of Part 3 Chapter 5Part three, chapter six of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part three, chapter six. In the weeks and months that followed, as he rode from one end of Ballarat to the other, from Uil Swamp in the west as far east as the ranges and gullies of Little Bendigo, it gradually became plain to Mahony that Ned's frothy tales had some body in them after all. The character of the diggings was changing before his very eyes. Nowadays, except on an outlying muddy flat or in the hands of the retrograde Chinese, tubs, cradles and windlasses were rarely to be met with. Engine sheds and boiler houses began to dot the ground. Here and there a tall chimney belched smoke beside a lofty puppet head or an aerial trolley line. The richest gutters were found to take their rise below the basaltic deposits. The difficulties and risks of rock mining had now to be faced, and the capitalist, so long held at bay, at length made free of the field. Large sums of money were being subscribed, and where these proved insufficient, the banks stepped into the breach with subsidies on mortgages. The population, in whose veins the gold fever still burned, plunged by wholesale into the new hazard, and under the wooden verandas of Bridge Street a motley crew of jobbers and brokers came into existence 
who would demonstrate to you, a la Ned, how you might reap a fortune from a claim without putting in an hour's work on it, without even knowing where it was. A temptation indeed, but one that did not affect him. Mahony let the reins droop on his horse's neck, and the animal picked its way among the impedimenta of the bush road. It concerned only those who had money to spare. Months, too, must go by before, from even the most promising of these cooperative affairs, any return was to be expected. As for him, there still came days when he had not a five-pound note to his name. It had been a delusion to suppose that in accepting John's offer he was leaving money troubles behind him. Despite Polly's thrift, their improved style of life cost more than he had reckoned. The patients, slow to come, were slower still to discharge their debts. Moreover, he had not guessed how heavily the quarterly payments of interest would weigh on him. With as good as no margin, with the fate of every shilling decided beforehand, the saving up of thirty-odd pounds four times a year was a veritable achievement. He was always in a quake lest he should not be able to get it together. No one suspected what near shaves he had, not even Polly. The last time hardly bore thinking about. At the eleventh hour he had unexpectedly found himself several pounds short. He did not close an eye all night, and got up in the morning as though going for his own execution. Then fortune favoured him. A well-to-do butcher, his hearty, "'What'll yours be?' at the nearest public-house waved aside, had settled his bill off-hand. Mahony could still feel the sudden lift of the black fog-cloud that had enveloped him, the sense of bodily exhaustion that had succeeded to the intolerable mental strain. For the coming quarter-day he was better prepared, if that was nothing out of the way happened. Of late he had been haunted by the fear of illness. The long hours in the saddle did not suit him. He ought to have a buggy and a second horse. But there could be no question of it in the meantime, or of a great deal else besides. He wanted to buy Polly a piano, for instance. All her friends had pianos, and she played and sang very prettily. She needed more dresses and bonnets, too, than he was able to allow her, as well as a change to the seaside in the summer heat. The first spare money he had should go towards one or the other. He loved to give Polly pleasure, never was such a contented little soul as she. And well for him that it was so. To have had a complaining, even an impatient wife at his side just now would have been unbearable but Polly did not know what impatience meant. Her sunny temper, her fixed resolve to make the best of everything, was not to be shaken. Well, comforts galore should be hers some day, he hoped. The practice was shaping satisfactorily. His attendance at Dandaloo had proved a key to many doors. Folks of the Glendinnings and Urquhart's standing could make a reputation or mar it as they chose. It had got abroad, he knew, that at whatever hour of the day or night he was sent for, he could be relied on to be sober— and that, unfortunately, was not always the case with some of his colleagues. In addition, his fellow practitioners showed signs of waking up to his existence. He had been called in lately to a couple of consultations, and the doyen of the profession at Ballarat, old Munce himself, had praised his handling of a difficult case of version. The distance is to be covered. That's what made the work stiff. And he could not afford to neglect a single summons, no matter where it led him. Still, he would not have grumbled, had only the money not been so hard to get in. But the fifty thousand-odd souls on Ballarat formed, even yet, anything but a stable population. A patient you attended one day might be gone the next, and gone where no bill could reach him. Or he had been sold off at a public auction, or his wooden shanty had gone up in a flare. Hardly a night passed without a fire somewhere. In these, and like accidents, the unfortunate doctor might whistle for his fee— it seldom happened nowadays that he was paid in cash. Money was growing as scarce here as anywhere else. Sometimes, it was true, he might have pocketed his fee on the spot had he cared to ask for it, but the presenting of his palm professionally was a gesture that was denied him, and this standoffishness drove from people's minds the thought that he might be in actual need of money. Afterwards he sat at home and racked his brains how to pay butcher and grocer. Others in the fraternity were by no means so nice. He knew of some who would not stir a yard unless their fee was planked down before them. Old stagers, these, who at one time had been badly bitten, and were now grown cynically distrustful, or tired. And, indeed, who could blame a man for hesitating of a pitch-dark night in the winter rains, or on a blazing summer day, whether or no he should set out on a twenty-mile ride, 
for which he might never see the ghost of remuneration. Reflecting thus, Mahony caught at a couple of hard, spicy grey-green leaves to chew as he went. The gums, on which the old bark hung in ribbons, were in flower by now, and bore feathery yellow blossoms side by side with nutty capsules. His horse had been ambling forward unpressed. Now it laid its ears flat, and a minute later its master's slower senses caught at the clop-clop of a second set of hoofs, the noise of wheels. Mahony had reached a place where two roads joined, and saw a covered buggy approaching. He drew rein and waited. The occupant of the vehicle had wound the reins around the empty lamp-bracket, and left it to the sagacity of his horse to keep the familiar track, while he dozed head on breast in the corner. The animal halted of itself on coming up with its fellow, and Archdeacon Long opened his eyes. "'Ah, good day to you, doctor. Yes, as you see, enjoying a little nap. I was out early.' He got down from the buggy, and with bent knees and his hands in his pockets, stretched the creased cloth of his trousers where this had cut into his flesh. He was a big, brawny, handsome man, with a massive nose, a cloven chin, and the most companionable smile in the world. As he stood, he touched here a strap, there a buckle on the harness of his chestnut, a well-known trotter, with which he often made a match, and affectionately clapped the neck of Mahony's bay. He could not keep his hands off a horse. By choice he was his own stableman, and in earlier life had been a daredevil rider. Now increasing weight led him to prefer buggy to saddle, but his recklessness had not diminished. With the reins in his left hand he would run his light two-wheeled trap up any wooded boulder-strewn hill and down the other side, just as in his harem-scarum days he had set it at fell trees, and if rumour spoke true, wire fences. Mahony admired the splendid vitality of the man, as well as the indestructible optimism that bore him triumphantly through all the hardships of a colonial ministry. No sick-bed was too remote for long, no sinner sunk too low to be helped to his feet. The leprous Chinaman doomed to an unending isolation, the drunken Paddy, the degraded white woman, each came in for a share of his benevolence. He spent the greater part of his life visiting the outcasts and outposts, beating up the unbaptized, the unconfirmed, the unwed. But his church did not suffer. He had always some fresh scheme for this on hand. Either he was getting up a tea-meeting to raise money for an organ, or a series of penny-readings towards funds for a chancel, or he was training with his choir for a sacred concert. There was a boyish streak in him, too. He would enter into the joys of the annual Sunday-school picnic with a zest equal to the children's own, leading the way in shirt-sleeves at leapfrog and obstacle-race. In doctrine he struck a happy mean between low-church practices and ritualism, preaching short, spirited sermons to which even languid Christians could listen without tedium, and on a weekday evening he would take a hand at a rubber of whist or a carte, and not for love, or play a sound game of chess. A man, too, who, refusing to be bound by the letter of the thirty-nine articles, extended his charity even to persons of the popish faith. In short, he was one of the few to whom Mahony could speak of his own haphazard efforts at criticising the Pentateuch. The archdeacon was wont to respond with his genial smile. "'Ah, it's all very well for you, doctor. You're a freelance. I'm constrained by my cloth.' And, frankly, for the rest of us, that kind of thing's too, well, too disturbing, especially when we have nothing better to put in its place. Doctor and Parson, the latter considerably over six feet, made Mahony, who was tall enough, look short and doubly slender, walked side by side for nearly a mile, flitting from topic to topic. The rivalry that prevailed between Ballarat's east and west, the seditious uprising in India, where both had relatives, the recent rains, the prospects for grazing— the last theme brought them round to Dandaloo and its unhappy owner. The archdeacon expressed the outsider's surprise at the strength of Glendinning's constitution, and the lively popular sympathy that was felt for his wife. "'One's heart aches for the poor little lady, struggling to bear up as though nothing were the matter. Between ourselves, doctor,' and Mr. Long took off his straw hat to let the air play around his head, "'between ourselves it's a thousand pities he doesn't just pop off the hooks in one of his bouts, or that some of you medical gentlemen don't use your knowledge to help things on. He let out his great hearty laugh as he spoke, and his companion's involuntary stiffening went unnoticed. But on Mahony voicing his attitude with, "'And his immortal soul, sir? Isn't it the Church's duty to hope for a miracle? Just as it is ours to keep the vital spark going?' 
he made haste to take the edge off his words. "'Now, now, doctor, only my fun. Our duty is, I trust, plain to us both.' It was even easier to soothe than to ruffle Mahony. "'Remember me very kindly to Mrs. Long, will you?' he said, as the archdeacon prepared to climb into his buggy. "'But tell her, too, I owe her a grudge just now. My wife's so lost in flannel and brown holland that I can't get a word out of her.' "'And mine doesn't know where she'd be with this bazaar if it weren't for Mrs. Mahony.' Long was husband to a dot of a woman, who, having borne him half a dozen children of his own feature and build, now worked as parish clerk and district visitor rolled in one, driving about in sunbonnet and gardening gloves behind a pair of cream ponies, tiny, sharp-featured, resolute, with little of her husband's large tolerance, but an energy that outdid his own, and made her an object of both fear and respect. "'And that reminds me, over at the crossroads by Spring Hill I met your young brother-in-law, and he told me, if I ran across you, to ask you to hurry home. Your wife has some surprise or other in store for you. No, nothing unpleasant. Rather the reverse, I believe, but I wasn't to say more. Well, good day, doctor. Good day to you. Mahony smiled, nodded, and went on his way. Polly's surprises were usually simple and transparent things. Someone would have made them a present of a sucking-pig or a bush-turkey, and Polly, knowing his relish for a savoury morsel, did not wish it to be overdone. She had sent similar chance calls out after him before now. When, having seen his horse rubbed down, he reached home, he found her on the doorstep watching for him. She was flushed, and her eyes had those peculiar highlights in them which led him jokingly to exhort her to caution, lest the sparks should set the house on fire. "'Well, what is it, Pussy?' he inquired, as he laid his bag down and hung up his wide-awake. "'What's my little surprise-monger got up her sleeve to-day? Oh, good Lord, Polly, I'm tired.' Polly was smiling roguishly. "'Aren't you going into the surgery, Richard?' she asked, seeing him heading for the dining-room. "'Aha! So that's it,' said he, and obediently turned the handle. Polly had on occasion taken advantage of his absence to introduce some new comfort or decoration in his room. The blind had been let down. He was still blinking in the half-dark, when a figure sprang out from behind the door, barging heavily against him, and a loud voice shouted, "'Bow, you old beef-brains! Bow to a goose!' Displeased at such horseplay, Mahony stepped sharply back. His first thought was of Ned having unexpectedly returned from Mount Ararat. Then, recognising the voice, he exclaimed incredulously, "'You dicky bird! You!' "'Dick, old man! I say, Dick! Yes, it's me right enough, and not my ghost, the old bad egg come back to roost!' The blind was raised, and the friends who had last met in the dingy bush hut on the night of the stockade stood face to face. And now ensued a babble of greeting, a quick fire of question and answer, the two voices going in and out and round each other singly and together like the voices in a duet. Tears rose to Polly's eyes as she listened. It made her heart glow to see Richard so glad. But when, forgetting her presence, Purdy cried, "'And I must confess, Dick, I took a kiss from Mrs. Polly,' "'Gad, old man, how she's come on!' Polly hastily retired to the kitchen. At table the same high spirits prevailed. It did not often happen that Richard was brought out of his shell like this, thought Polly gratefully, and heaped her visitor's plate to the brim. His first hunger stilled, Purdy fell to giving a slapdash account of his experiences. He kept to no orderly sequence, but threw them out just as they occurred to him. A rub with bushrangers in the Black Forest, his adventures as a long-distance drover in the Mill Dura, the trials of a week he had spent in a boiling-down establishment on the Murray. Where the stink was so foul, you two, that I vomited like a dog every day. Under the force of this odyssey, husband and wife gradually dropped into silence, which they broke only by single words of astonishment and sympathy, while the child Trotty spooned in her pudding without seeing it, her round, solemn eyes fixed unblinkingly on this new uncle, who was like a wonderful story-book come alive. In Mahony's feelings for Purdy at this moment there was none of the old intolerant superiority. He had been dependent for so long on a mere surface acquaintance with his fellows, that he now felt to the full how precious the tie was that bound him to Purdy. Here came one for whom he was not alone the reserved, struggling practitioner, the rather moody man advancing to middle age, but also the dick of his boyhood and early youth. He had often imagined the satisfaction it would be to confide his troubles to Purdy. Compared, however, with the hardships the latter had undergone, these seemed of small importance, and dinner passed without any allusion to his own affairs. 
and now the chances of his speaking out were slight. He could have been entirely frank only under the first stimulus of meeting. Even when they rose from the table, Purdy continued to hold the stage, for he had turned up with hardly a shirt to his back, and had to be rigged out afresh from Mahony's wardrobe. It was decided that he should remain their guest in the meantime, also that Mahony should call on his behalf on the Commissioner of Police, and put in a good word for him, for Purdy had come back with the idea of seeking a job in the Ballarat Mounted Force. When Mahony could no longer put off starting on his afternoon round, Purdy went with him to the livery barn, limping briskly at his side. On the way he exclaimed aloud at the marvellous changes that had taken place since he was last in the township. There were half a dozen gas-lamps in Sturt Street by this time, the gas being distilled from a mixture of oil and gum-leaves. "'One wouldn't credit it if one didn't see it with one's own peepers,' he cried, repeatedly bringing up short before the plate-glass windows of the shops, the many handsome verandahed hotels, the granite front of Christchurch. "'And from what I hear, Dick, now companies have jumped the claims and are deep sinking in earnest, fortunes will be made like one o'clock.' But on getting home again, he sat down in front of Polly, and said, with a business-like air, "'And now tell me all about old Dick. You know, Paul, he's such an odd fish. If he himself doesn't offer to uncork, somehow one just can't pump him. And I want to know everything that concerns him, from A to Z.' Polly could not hold out against this affectionate curiosity. Entrenching her needle in its stuff, she put her work away and complied. And soon, to her own satisfaction— for the first time in her married life she was led to discuss her husband's ways and actions with another, and to her amazement she found that it was easier to talk to Purdy about Richard than to Richard himself. Purdy and she saw things in the same light. No rigmarole of explanation was necessary. Now with Richard it was not so. In conversation with him one constantly felt that he was not speaking out, or, to put it more plainly, that he was going on meantime with his own very different thoughts and behind what he did say there was sure to lurk some imaginary scruple, some rather far-fetched delicacy of feeling which it was hard to get at, and harder still to understand. End of Part 3 Chapter 6《パート3 Chapter 7 of Australia Felix》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson Part 3 Chapter 7 Summer had come round again, and the motionless white heat of December lay heavy on the place. The low little houses seemed to cower beneath it, and the smoke from their chimneys drew black perpendicular lines on the pale sky. If it was a misery at this season to traverse the blazing dusty roads, it was almost worse to be within doors, where the thin wooden walls were powerless to keep out the heat, and flies and mosquitoes raged in chorus. Nevertheless, determined Christmas preparations went on in dozens of tiny zinc-roofed kitchens, the temperature of which was not much below that of the ovens themselves, and kindly well-to-do people like Mrs. Glendinning and Mrs. Urquhart drove in in hooded buggies with green fly-veils dangling from their broad-brimmed hats, and dropped a goose here, a turkey there, on their less prosperous friends. They robbed their gardens, too, of the summer's last flowers, arum lilies and brilliant geraniums, to decorate the archdeacon's church for the festival, and many ladies spent the whole day beforehand making wreaths and crosses, and festoons to encircle the lamps. No one was busier than Polly. She wanted to give Purdy, who had been on short commons for so long, a special Christmas treat. She had willing helpers in him and Jerry, the two of them chopped and stoned and stirred, while she, seated on the block of the woodstack, her head tied up in an old pillowcase, plucked and singed the goose that had fallen to her share. Towards four o'clock on Christmas Day they drew their chairs to the table, and with loosened collars set about enjoying the good things, or pretending to enjoy them. This was Mahony's case, for the day was no holiday for him, and his head ached from the sun. At tea-time Hempel arrived to pay a call, looking very spruce in a long black coat and white tie, and close on his heels followed old Mr. Ocock. The latter, having deposited his hat under his seat, and tapped several pockets, produced a letter, which he unfolded and handed to Polly with a broad grin. It was from his daughter, and contained the news of his wife's death. "'Died of the grumbles, I lay you, and the first good turn she ever done me.' 
The main point was that Miss Amelia, now at liberty, was already taking advice about the safest line of clipper-ships, and asking for a reply, by return, to a number of extraordinary questions. Could one depend on hearing God's word preached of a Sunday? Was it customary for females to go armed as well as men? Were the blacks converted, and what amount of clothing did they wear? "'Think she's come into the back of beyond, does Mealy?' chuckled the old man, and slapped his thigh at the sudden idea that occurred to him of taking a rise out of her. "'Won't she stare when she gets here, that's all?' "'Well, now you'll simply have to build,' said Polly, after threatening to write privately to Miss Amelia to reassure her. "'Why not move over west and take up a piece of ground on the same road as themselves?' But from this he excused himself with a laugh and a spit on the score that no land sales had yet been held in their neighbourhood. When he did turn out of his present four walls, which had always been plenty good enough for him, he wanted a place he could fit up tidy which it had stick in his throat to do so if he thought it might any day be sold over his head. Mahony winced at this, then laughed with an exaggerated carelessness. If in a country like this you waited for all to be fixed and sure, you would wait until doomsday. Nonetheless, the thrust rankled. It was a fact that he himself had not spent a sou on his premises since they finished building. The thought at the back of his mind, too, was why waste his hard-earned income on improvements that might benefit only the next comer. The yard they sat in, for instance. Polly had her hens in a ramshackle hen-house, but not a spadeful of earth had been turned toward the wished-for garden. It was just the ordinary colonial backyard, fenced around with rude palings which didn't match, and were mended here and there with bits of hoop-iron, its ground-space littered with a medley of articles for which there was no room elsewhere, boards left lying by the builders, empty kerosene tins, a couple of tubs, a ragged cane-chair, some old cases. Wash-lines, on which at the moment a row of stockings hung, stretched permanently from corner to corner, and the whole was dominated by the big round galvanised iron tank. On Boxing Day Purdy got the loan of a lorry, and drove a large party, including several children, comfortably placed on straw, hassocks and low chairs, to the races a few miles out. Half Ballarat was making in the same direction, and whoever owned a horse that was sound in the wind and anything of a stepper had entered it for some item in the programme. The grandstand, a bark shed open to the air on three sides, was resorted to only in the case of a sudden downpour. The occupants of the dust-laden buggies, wagonettes, brakes, carts, and drays preferred to follow events standing on their seats and on the boards that served them as seats. After the meeting, those who belonged to the Urquhart Glendinning set went on to Urangabilly and danced until long past midnight on the broad veranda. It was nearly three o'clock before Purdy brought his load safely home. Under the round white moon the lorry was strewn with the forms of sleeping children. Early next morning, while Polly, still only half awake, was pouring out coffee, and giving Richard, who, poor fellow, could not afford to leave his patients, an account of their doings, with certain omissions, of course. She did not mention the glaring indiscretion Agnes Glendinning had been guilty of in disappearing with Mr. Henry Ocock into a dark shrubbery. While Polly talked, the postman handed in two letters, which were of a nature to put balls and races clean out of her head. The first was in Mrs. Beamish's ill-formed hand, and told a sorrowful tale. Custom had entirely gone. A new hotel had been erected on the new road. Beamish was forced to declare himself a bankrupt, and in a few days the family hotel, with all its contents, would be put up at public auction. What was to become of them, God alone knew. She supposed she would end her days in taking in washing, and the girls must go out as servants. But she was sure Polly, now so up in the world, with a husband doing so well, would not forget the old friends who had once been so kind to her, with much more in the same strain which Polly skipped in reading the letter aloud. The long and short of it was, would Polly ask her husband to lend them a couple of hundred pounds to make a fresh start with, or failing that, to put his name to a bill for the same amount? "'Of course she hasn't an idea we were obliged to borrow money ourselves,' said Polly, in response to Mahony's ironic laugh. "'I couldn't tell them that.' "'No, nor that it's perpetual struggle to keep the wolf from the door,' answered her husband, battering in the top of an egg with the back of his spoon. "'Oh, Richard, dear, things aren't quite as bad as that,' said Polly cheerfully. Then she heaved a sigh. "'I know, of course, we can't afford to help them, but I do feel so sorry for them.' She herself would have given the dress off her back. 
"'And I think, dear, if you don't mind very much, "'we might ask one of the girls up to stay with us "'till the worst is over.' "'Yes, I suppose that wouldn't be impossible,' said Mahony, "'if you've set your heart on it, my Polly. "'If, too, you can persuade Master Purdy "'to forego the comfort of your good feather bed, "'and I'll see if I can ring out a fiver for you to enclose in your letter.' Polly jumped up and kissed him. "'Purdy's going anyhow. He said only last night he must look for lodgings near the police station.' Here a thought struck her. She coloured and smiled. "'I'll ask Tilly first, said she. Mahony laughed and shook his finger at her. "'The best laid plans are mice and men. And what's one to say to a matchmaker who's still growing out of her clothes?' At this Polly clapped a hand over his mouth, for fear Ellen should hear him. It was a sore point with her that she had, more than once of late, had to lengthen her dresses. As soon as she was alone, she sat down to compose a reply to Mrs. Beamish. It was no easy job. She was obliged to say that Richard felt unable to come to their aid, and at the same time, to avoid touching on his private affairs, had to disappoint as kindly as she could, to be truthful, yet tactful. Polly wrote and rewrote. The business cost her the forenoon. She could not even press Tilly to pack her box and come at once, for her second letter that morning had been from Sara, who wrote that, having decided to shake the dust of the colony off her feet, she wished to pay them a flying visit before sailing, pour faire mes adieux. She signed herself, Your affectionate sister, Zara, with a Z, and on her arrival explained that, tired of continually instructing people on the pronunciation of her name, she had decided to alter the spelling and be done with it. Moreover, a little bird had whispered in her ear that under its new form it fitted her rather French air and looks a thousand times better than before. Descending from the coach, Zara eyed Polly up and down and vowed she would never have known her, and on the way home Polly more than once felt her sister's gaze fixed critically on her. For her part she was able to assure Zara that she saw no change whatever in her since her last visit, even since the date of the wedding. And this pleased Zara mightily for, as she admitted, in removing hat and mantle and passing the damped corner of a towel over her face, she dreaded the ageing effects of the climate on her fine complexion. Close as ever about her own concerns, she gave no reason for her abrupt determination to leave the country. But from subsequent talk Polly gathered that, for one thing, Zara had found her position at the head of John's establishment, undertaken in the first place, my dear, at immense personal sacrifice. No sinecure. John had proved a regular martinet. He had countermanded her orders, interfered about the household bills, had even accused her of lining her own pocket. As for little Johnny, the bait originally thrown out to induce her to accept the post, he had long since been sent to boarding school. A thoroughly bad, unprincipled boy, was Zara's verdict. And when Polly, big with pity, expostulated, "'But Zara, he's only six years old!' Her sister retorted with a, "'My dear, I know the world, and you don't,' to which Polly could think of no reply. Zara had announced herself for a bare fortnight's stay, but the man who carried her trunk groaned and sweated under it, and was so insolent about the size of the coin she dropped in his palm, that Polly followed him by stealth into the passage to make it up to a crown. As usual, Zara was attired in the height of fashion. She brought a set of the hoops with her, the first to be seen on Ballarat, and once more Polly was torn between an honest admiration of her sister's daring, and an equally honest embarrassment at the notice she attracted. Zara swam and glided about the streets, to the hilarious amazement of the population, floated feather-light, billowing here, depressing there, with all the waywardness of a child's balloon, supported, or so it seemed, by two of the tiniest feet ever bestowed on mortal woman. "'Aha! But that was one of the chief merits of the hoops,' declared Zara, that and the possibility of getting still more stuff into your skirts without materially increasing their weight. There was something in that, conceded Polly, who often felt hers drag heavy. Besides, as she reminded Richard that night, when he lay alternately chuckling and snorting at woman's folly, custom was everything. Once they had smiled at Zara appearing in a hat, and now we're all wearing them. Another practical consideration that occurred to her she expressed with some diffidence— "'But, Zara, don't you—I mean, aren't they very draughty? Zara had to repeat her shocked but emphatic denial in the presence of Mrs. Glendinning and Mrs. Urquhart, both ladies having a mind to bring their wardrobes up to date. 
they agreed that there was much to be said in favour of the appliance over and above its novelty. Especially would it be welcome at those times when— but here the speakers dropped into woman's mysterious code of nods and signs, while Zara, turning modestly away, pretended to count the stitches in a crochet and a macassar. Yes, nowadays, says Mrs. Dr. Mahony, Polly was able to introduce her sister to a society worthy of Zara's gifts, and Zara enjoyed herself so well that had her birth not been booked she might have contemplated extending her visit. She overflowed with gracious commendation. The house, though of course compared with John's splendour a trifle plain and pokey, was a decided advance on the store. Polly herself much improved. "'You do look robust, my dear.' And though Zara held her peace about this, the fact of Mahony's being from home each day for hours at a stretch lent an additional prop to her satisfaction. Under these conditions it was possible to keep on good terms with her brother-in-law. Zara's natty appearance and sprightly ways made her a favourite with every one, especially the gentlemen. The Episcopal Bazaar came off at this time, and Zara had the brilliant idea of a bran pie. This was the success of the entertainment. From behind the refreshment store, where, with Mrs. Long, she was pouring out cups of tea and serving cheesecakes and sausage rolls by the hundred, Polly looked proudly across the beflagged hall to the merry group of which her sister was the centre. Zara was holding her own, even with Mr. Henry Ocock, and Mr. Urquhart had constituted himself her right hand. "'Your sister is no doubt a most fascinating woman,' said Mrs. Urquhart from the seat with which she had been accommodated, and heaved a gentle sigh. "'How odd that she should never have married!' "'I'm afraid Zara's too particular,' said Polly. "'It's not for want of being asked.' Her eyes met Purdy's as she spoke. Purdy had come up laden with empty cups, a pair of infant's boots dangling around his neck, and they exchanged smiles. For Zara's latest affair de coeur was a source of great amusement to them. Polly had assisted at the first meeting between her sister and Purdy with very mixed feelings. On that occasion Purdy happened to be in plain clothes, and Zara pronounced him charming. The next day, however, he dropped in, clad in the double-breasted blue jacket, the high boots and green-veiled cabbage-tree he wore when on duty, and thereupon Zara's opinion of him sank to null, and was not to be raised even by him presenting himself in full dress, white braided trousers, red-faced shell jacket, pill-box cap, cartouche-box, and cavalry sword. "'La, Polly, nothing but a common policeman!' In vain did Polly explain the difference between a member of the ordinary force and a mounted trooper of the gold escort. In vain lay stress on Richard's pleasure at seeing Purdy buckle to steady work, no matter what. Zara's thoughts had taken wing for a land where such anomalies were not, where you were not asked to drink tea with the well-meaning constable who led you across a crowded thoroughfare, or turned on his bull's-eye for you in a fog, preparatory to calling up a hackney-cab. But the chilly condescension with which from now on Zara treated him did not seem to trouble Purdy. When he ran in for five minutes of a morning, he eschewed the front entrance and took up his perch on the kitchen table. From here, while Polly cooked and he nibbled half-baked pastry, the two of them followed the progress of events in the parlour. Zara's arrival on Ballarat had been the cue for Hempel's reappearance, and now hardly a day went by on which the lay helper did not neglect his chapel work in order to pay what Zara called his devoirs. Slight were his pretexts for coming, a rare bit of dried seaweed for bookmark, a religious journal with a turned-down page, a nosegay. And though Zara would not nowadays go the length of walking out with a dissenter, she preferred on her airings to occupy the box-seat of Mr. Urquhart's four-in-hand. She had no objection to Hempel keeping her company during the empty hours of the forenoon, when Polly was lost in domestic cares. She accepted his offerings, mimicked his faulty speech, and was continually hauling him up the precipice of self-distrust, only to let him slip back as soon as he reached the top. One day Purdy entered the kitchen doubled up with laughter— in passing the front of the house he had thrown a look in at the parlour window, and the sight of the prim and proper Hempel on his knees on the woolly hearth-rug so tickled his sense of humour that, having spluttered out the news, back he went to the passage, where he crouched down before the parlour door and glued his eye to the keyhole. "'Oh, Purdy, no! What if the door should suddenly fly open?' But there was something in Purdy's pranks that a laughter-lover like Polly could never for long withstand. 
Here now, in feigning to imitate the unfortunate Hempel, he was sheerly irresistible. He clapped his hands to his heart, showed the whites of his eyes, wept, gesticulated, and tore his hair. And Polly, after trying in vain to keep a straight face, sat down and went off into a fit of stifled mirth, and when Polly did give way she was apt to set every one around her laughing too. Ellen's shoulders shook, she held a fist to her mouth. Even little Trotty shrilled out her tinny treble, without knowing in the least what the joke was. When the merriment was at its height, the front door opened, and in walked Mahony. An instant's blank amazement, and he had grasped the whole situation. Richard was always so fearfully quick at understanding, thought Polly ruefully. Then, though Purdy jumped to his feet and the laughter died out as if by command, he drew his brows together, and without saying a word, stalked into the surgery and shut the door. Like a schoolboy who has been caned, Purdy dug his knuckles into his eyes and rubbed his hind quarters, to the fresh delight of Trotty and the girl. "'Well, so long, Polly. I'd better be making tracks. The old man's on the warpath, and in an undertone, "'Same old grouser never could take a joke.' "'He's tired. I'll make it all right,' gave Polly back. "'It was only his fun, Richard,' she pleaded, as she held out a linen jacket for her husband to slip his arms into. "'Fun of a kind I won't permit in my house. What an example to set the child! What's more, I shall let Hempel know that he's being made a butt of, and speak my mind to your sister about her heartless behaviour. "'Oh, don't do that, Richard. I promise it shan't happen again. It was very stupid of us, I know. But Purdy didn't really mean it unkindly, and he is so comical when he starts to imitate people. And Polly was all but off again at the remembrance.' But Mahony, stooping to decipher the names Ellen had written on the slate, did not unbend. It was not merely the vulgar joke that had offended him. No, what really rankled was the sudden chill his unlooked-for entrance had cast over the group. They had scattered and gone scurrying about their business, like a pack of naughty children who had been up to mischief behind their master's back. He was the schoolmaster, the spoilsport. They were all afraid of him. Even Polly. But here came Polly herself to say, "'Dinner, dear,' in her kindest tone. She also put her arm around his neck and hugged him. "'Not cross any more, Richard. I know we behaved disgracefully.' Her touch put the crown on her words. Mahony drew her to him and kissed her. But the true origin of the unpleasantness, Zara, who in her ghoulish delight at seeing Hempel grovel before her, thus Mahony worded it, behaved more kittenishly than ever at table. Zara, Mahony, could not so easily forgive, and for the remainder of her stay his manner to her was so forbidding that she too froze, and to Polly's regret the old bad relation between them came up anew. But Zara was enjoying herself too well to cut her visit short on Mahony's account. Besides, poor thing, thought Polly, she's really nowhere to go. What she did do was to carry her head very high in her brother-in-law's presence, to speak at him rather than to him, and in private to insist to Polly on her powers of discernment. "'You may say what you like, my dear. I can see you have a very great deal to put up with.' At last, however, the day of her departure broke, and she went off amid a babble of farewells, of requests for remembrance, a fluttering of pocket-handkerchiefs the like of which Polly had never known. And to himself Mahony breathed the hope that they had seen the last of Zara, her fripperies and affectations. "'Your sister will certainly fit better into the conditions of English life.' Polly cried at the parting, which might be final, then blew her nose and dried her eyes, for she had a busy day before her. Tilly Beamish had been waiting with ill-concealed impatience for Zara to vacate the spare room, and was to arrive that night. Mahony was not at home to welcome the newcomer, nor could he be present at high tea. When he returned, towards nine o'clock, he found Polly with a very red face, and so full of fussy cares for her guest's comfort, her natural kindliness distorted to caricature, that she had not a word for him. One look at Miss Tilly explained everything, and his respects duly paid, he retired to the surgery, to indulge a smile at Polly's expense. Here Polly soon joined him, Tilly, fatigued by her journey and by her bounteous meal, having betaken herself early to bed. "'Ha! <laughs> laughed Mahony, not without a certain mischievous satisfaction at his young wife's discomfiture, and with the prospect of a second edition to follow. But Polly would not capitulate right off. 
"'I don't think it's very kind of you to talk like that, Richard,' she said warmly. "'People can't help their looks.' She moved about the room, putting things straight and avoiding his eye. "'As long as they mean well and are good. But I think you would rather no one ever came to stay with us at all.' Fixing her with meaning insistence, and still smiling, Mahony opened his arms. The next moment Polly was on his knee, her face hidden in his shoulder. There she shed a few tears. "'Oh, isn't she dreadful? I don't know what I shall do with her. She's been serving behind the bar, Richard, for more than a year, and she's come expecting to be taken everywhere, and to have any amount of gaiety. At coach time she had dragged a reluctant Purdy to the office, but as soon as he caught sight of Tilly, on the box, Richard, beside the driver, with her hair all towsy-wowsy in the wind, he just said, "'Oh, law, Polly!' and disappeared, and that was the last I saw of him. I don't know how I should have got on if it hadn't been for old Mr. Ocock, who was down meeting a parcel. He was most kind. He helped us home with her carpet-bag, and saw after her trunk. And, oh, dear, what do you think? When he was going away, he said to me in the passage, so loud I'm sure Tilly must have heard him, he said, "'Well, that's something like a figure of a female this time, Mrs. Doc, as fine a young woman as ever I see.' And Polly hid her face again, and husband and wife laughed in concert. End of Part 3 Chapter 7《Part Three, Chapter Eight of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. — Part Three, Chapter Eight. That night a great storm rose. Mahony, sitting reading after every one else had retired, saw it coming, and lamp in hand went round the house to secure hasps and catches, then stood at the window to watch the storm's approach. In one half of the sky the stars were still peacefully alight. The other was hidden by a dense cloud, which came racing along like a giant bat with outspread wings, devouring the stars in its flight. The storm broke. There was a sudden shrill screeching, a grinding, piping, whistling, and the wind hurled itself against the house as if to level it with the ground. Failing in this, it banged and battered, making windows and doors shake like loose teeth in their sockets. Then it swept by to wreak its fury elsewhere, and there was a grateful lull, out of which burst a peal of thunder. And now peal followed peal, and the face of the sky, with its masses of swirling, frothy cloud, resembled an angry sea. The lightning ripped it in fierce zigzags, darting out hundreds of spectral fangs. It was a magnificent sight. Polly came running to see where he was. The child cried. Miss Tilly opened her door by a hand's breadth, and thrust a red, puffy face, framed in curl-twists, through the crack. Nobody thought of sleep while the commotion lasted, for fear of fire. Once alight, these exposed little wooden houses blazed up like heaps of shavings. The clock-hands pointed to one before the storm showed signs of abating. Now the rain was pouring down, making an ear-splitting din on the iron roof, and leaping from every gutter and spout. It had turned very cold. Mahony shivered as he got into bed. He seemed hardly to have closed an eye when he was wakened by a loud knocking— at the same time the wire of the night-bell was almost wrenched in two. He sat up and looked at his watch. It wanted a few minutes to three. The rain was still falling in torrents, the wind sighed and moaned. Wild horses should not drag him out on such a night. Thrusting his arms into the sleeves of his dressing-gown, he threw up the parlour window. "'Who's there?' The hiss of the rain cut his words through. A figure on the doorstep turned at the sound. "'Is this a doctor's? I was sent here. Doctor, for God's sake!' "'What is it? Stop a minute. I'll open the door.' He did so, letting in a blast of wind and a rush of rain that flooded the oilcloth. The intruder, off whom the water streamed, had to shout to make himself audible. "'It's me. Matt Doyle's me name. It's me wife, doctor. She's dying. I've been all night on the road. Ah, for the love of—' "'Where is it?' Mahony put his hand to the side of his mouth to keep his words from flying adrift in the wind. "'Paddy's rest. You're the third I've been to. Not one of the dirty dogs'll stare a leg. Me girl may die like a rabbit for all they care.' The man's voice broke as he hallowed particulars. "'Paddy's rest. On a night like this, why, the creek will be out. "'Doctor, you're from the old country. I can hear it in your lip. Haven't you a wife, too, doctor? Then show a bit of mercy to mine.' 
"'Oh, tut, tut, man, none of that,' said Mahony curtly. "'You should have bespoken me at the proper time to attend your wife. "'Besides, there'll be no getting along the road to-night.' "'The other caught the note of yielding. "'Sure, and you'd go out, doctor, dear, without thinking to save your dog if he was drowning. "'I've got me buggy down there. I'll take you safe. "'And you shan't regret it. I'll make it worth your while, by the Lord Harry, I will.' "'Sure.' Mahony opened the door of the surgery and struck a match. It was a rough, grizzled fellow, a cocky on his own showing, who presented himself in the lamplight. His wife had fallen ill that afternoon. At first everything seemed to be going well. Then she was seized with fits, had one fit after another, and all but bit her tongue in two. There was nobody with her but a young girl he had fetched from a mile away. He had meant, when her time came, to bring her to the district hospital, but they had been taken unawares. While he waited, he sat with his elbows on his knees, his face between his clenched fists. In dressing, Mahony reassured Polly, and instructed her what to say to people who came inquiring after him. It was unlikely he would be back before afternoon. Most of the patients could wait till then. The one exception, a case of typhoid in its second week, a young Scotch surgeon, Brace, whom he had obliged in a similar emergency, would no doubt see for him. She should send Ellen down with a note. And having poured Doyle out a nobbler and put a flask in his own pocket, Mahony reopened the front door to the howl of the wind. The lantern his guide carried shed only a tiny circlet of light on the blackness, and the two men picked their steps gingerly along the flooded road. The rain ran in jets off the brim of Mahony's hat and down the back of his neck. Having climbed into the buggy, they advanced at a funeral pace, leaving it to the sagacity of the horse to keep the track. At the creek, sure enough, the water was out, the bridge gone. To reach the next bridge, five miles off, a crazy cross-country drive would have been necessary, and Mahony was for giving up the job. But Doyle would not acknowledge defeat. He unharnessed the horse, set Mahony on its back, and himself holding to its tail, forced the beast, by dint of kicking and lashing, into the water, and not only got them safely across, but up the steep sticky clay of the opposite bank. It was six o'clock on a cloudless morning, when, numb with cold, his clothing clinging to him like wet seaweed, Mahony entered the wooden hut where the real work he had come out to do began. Later in the day, clad in an odd collection of baggy garments, he sat and warmed himself in the sun, which was fast drawing up in the form of a blankety mist the moisture from the ground. He had successfully performed, under the worst possible conditions, a ticklish operation— and was now so tired that with his chin on his chest he fell fast asleep. Doyle wakened him by announcing the arrival of the buggy. The good man, who had more than one nobbler during the morning, could not hold his tongue, but made still another wordy attempt to express his gratitude. "'Whether me girl lives or dies, it'll not be Matt Doyle who forgets what you did for him this night, doctor. And if ever you want a bit of work done, or someone to do your lying awake at night for you, just you give me the tip.' "'I don't mind telling you now. I'd me shootin' iron here,' he touched his right hip, "'and if you'd refused, you was the third, mind you. I'd have drilled you where you stood. God damn me if I wouldn't.' Mahony eyed the speaker with derision. "'Much good that would have done your wife, you fathead. "'Well, well, we'll say nothing to mine, if you please, about anything of that sort.' "'No, may all the saints bless her and give her health. And as I say, doctor—' In speaking, he had drawn a roll of banknotes from his pocket, and now he tried to stuff them between Mahony's fingers. "'What's this? My good man, keep your money till it's asked for.' And Mahony unclasped his hands so that the notes fluttered to the ground. "'Then there let him lay.' But when, in clothes dried stiff as cardboard, Mahony was rolling townwards, his coachman, a lad of some ten or twelve, who handled the reins to the manor born, as they went, he chanced to feel in his coat-pocket, and there found five ten-pound notes rolled up in a neat bundle. The main part of the road was dry and hard again, but all dips and holes were wells of liquid mud, which bespattered the two of them from top to toe as the buggy bumped ceaselessly in and out. Mahony diverted himself by thinking of what he could give Polly with this sum. It would serve to buy that pair of gilt cornices or the heavy gilt-framed pier-glass on which she had set her heart. He could see her, pink with pleasure, expostulating, "'Richard, what wicked extravagance!' and hear himself reply, "'And pray, may my wife not have as pretty a parlour as her neighbours?" He even cast a thought in passing on the pianoforte with which Polly longed to crown the furnishings of her room, 
though of course at least treble this amount would be needed to cover its cost. But a fig for such nonsense! He knew but one legitimate use to make of the unexpected little windfall, and that was to put it by for a rainy day. At my age, in my position, I ought to have fifty pounds in the bank. Times without number he had said this to himself with a growing impatience, but he had not yet managed to save a halfpenny. Thrive as the practice might, the expenses of living held even pace with it. And now, having got its cue, his brain started off again on the old treadmill, reckoning, totting up, finding totals, or more often failing to find them, until his head was as hot as his feet were cold. Today he could not think clearly at all. Nor the next day either. By the time he reached home he was conscious of feeling very ill. He had lancinating pains in his limbs, a chill down his spine, an outrageous temperature. To set out again on a round of visits was impossible. He had just to tumble into bed. He got between the sheets with that sense of utter well-being, of almost sensual satisfaction, which only one who is shivering with fever knows. And at first very small things were enough to fill him with content. The smoothness of the pillow's sleek linen— the shadowy light of the room after long days spent in the dusty glare outside, the possibility of resting, the knowledge that it was his duty to rest, Polly's soft, firm hands, which were always of the right temperature, warm in the cold stage, cool when the fever scorched him, and neither hot nor cold when the dripping sweats came on. But as the fever declined, these slight pleasures lost their hold. Then he was ridden to death by black thoughts— not only was day being added to day, he meanwhile not turning over a penny, but ideas which he knew to be preposterous insinuated themselves in his brain. Thus for hours on end he writhed under the belief that his present illness was due solely to the proximity of the great swamp, and lay and cursed his folly in having chosen just this neighbourhood to build in. Again there was the case of typhoid he had been anxious about, prior to his own breakdown. Under his locum, peritonitis had set in and carried off the patient. At the time he had accepted the news from Polly's lips with indifference, too ill to care. But a little later the knowledge of what it meant broke over him, and he suffered the tortures of the damned. Not Brace, he alone would be held responsible for the death, and perhaps not altogether unjustly. Lying there, a prey to morbid apprehensions, he rebuilt the case in memory, struggling to recall each slight variation in temperature, each swift change for better or worse. But as fast as he captured one such detail, his drowsy brain let the last but one go, and he had to beat it up anew. During the night he grew confident that the relatives of the dead woman intended to take action against him for negligence or improper attendance. An attempt to speak of these devilish imaginings to wife and friend was a failure. He undertook it in a fit of desperation, when it seemed as if only a strong and well-grounded opposition would save his reason. But this was just what he could not get. Purdy, whom he tried first, held the crude notion that a sick person should never be gainsaid, and soothingly sympathised and agreed, until Mahony could have cried aloud at such blundering stupidity. Polly did better, she contradicted him, but not in the right way. She certainly pooh-poohed his idea of the nearness of Ewell Swamp making the house unhealthy, but she didn't argue the matter step by step and convince him that he was wrong. She just laughed at him as at a foolish child, and kissed him, and tucked him in anew. And when it came to the typhoid's fatal issue, she had not the knowledge needed to combat him with any chance of success. She heard him anxiously out, and allowed herself to be made quite nervous over a possible fault on his part, so jealous was she for his growing reputation. So that in the end it was he who had to comfort her. "'Don't take any notice of what I say to-day, wife. It's this blessed fever. I'm light-headed, I think.' But he could hear her uneasily consulting with Purdy in the passage. It was not until his pulse beat normally again that he could smile at his exaggerated fears. Now, too, reviving health brought back a wholesome interest in everyday affairs. He listened with amusement to Polly's account of the shifts Purdy was reduced to, to enter the house unseen by Miss Tilly. On his faithful daily call, the young man would creep around by the back door, and Tilly was growing more and more irate at her inability to waylay him. Yes, Polly was rather redly forced to admit she had abetted him in his evasions. "'You know, Paul, I might just as well tie myself up to old Mother B herself and be done with it.' 
Out of sheer pique, Tilly had twice now accepted old Mr. Ocock's invitation to drive with him. Once she had returned with a huge bag of lollies, and once with a face like a turkey-cock. Polly couldn't help thinking—no, really, Richard, she could not—that perhaps something might come of it. He should not laugh, just wait and see. Many inquiries had been made after him. People had missed their doctor, it seemed, and wanted him back. It was a real red-letter day when he could snap to the catches of his gloves again, and mount the step of a buggy. He had instructed Purdy to arrange for the hire of this vehicle, saddle-work being out of the question for him in the meantime. And on his first long journey it led him past Doyle's hut, now he was sorry to see in the hands of strangers, for the wife, on the way to making a fair recovery, had got up too soon, overtaxed her strength, and died and the broken-hearted husband was gone off no one knew where. On this drive, as mile after mile slid from under the wheels, Mahony felt how grateful was the screen of a hood between him and the sun. While he was laid up, the eternal question of how to live on his income had left him, relatively speaking, in peace. He had of late adopted the habit of doing his scraping and saving at the outset of each quarter, so as to get the money due to Ocock put by betimes. His illness had naturally made a hole in this, and now the living from hand to mouth must begin anew. With what remained of Doyle's money he proposed to settle his account at the livery stable. Then the unexpected happened. His reappearance—he looked very thin and washed out—evidently jogged a couple of sleepy memories. Simultaneously two big bills were paid, one of which he had entirely given up. In consequence he again found himself fifty pounds to the good and driving to Ocock's office on term-day, he resolved to go on afterwards to the Bank of Australasia, and there deposit this sum. Grindle, set off by a pair of flaming sideboards, himself ushered Mahony into the sanctum, and the affair was disposed of in a trice. Ocock was one of the busiest of men nowadays, he no longer needed to invent sham clients and fictitious interviews, and he utilised the few odd minutes it took to procure a signature, jot down a note, open a drawer, unlock a tin box, to remark abstractedly on the weather, and put a polite inquiry. "'And your good lady, in the best of health, I trust?' On emerging from the inner room, Mahony saw that the places formerly filled by Tom and Johnny were occupied by strangers, and he was wondering whether it would be indiscreet to ask what had become of the brothers, when Ocock cut across his intention. "'By the way, Jenkins, has that memorandum I spoke of been drawn up?' He turned to a clerk. With the sheet of fool's cap in his hand, he invited Mahony, with a beck of the chin, to re-enter his room. "'Half a moment.' "'Now, doctor, if you happen to have a little money lying idle, I can put you on to a good thing—a very good thing, indeed. I don't know, I'm sure, whether you keep an eye on the fluctuations of the share-market. If so, you'll no doubt have noticed the—let me say—extreme instability of poropunkers. After making an excellent start, they have dropped till they're now to be had at one-twentieth of their original value.' He did not take much interest in mining matters, was Mahony's reply. However, he knew something of the claim in question, if only because several of his acquaintances had abandoned their shares, in disgust at the repeated calls and the lack of dividends. Exactly. Well, now, Doctor, I'm in a position to inform you that poorer punkers will very shortly be prime favourites on the market, selling at many times their original figure. Their original figure, sir. No one with a few hundreds to spare could find a better investment. Now is the time to buy. A few hundreds? What does he take me for? thought Mahony, and declined the transaction off-hand. It was very good of Mr. Ocock to think of him, but he preferred to keep clear of that kind of thing. Quite so, quite so, returned Ocock suavely, and dry-washed his hands with a smile Mahony had never learnt to fathom. Just as you please, of course. I'll only ask you, doctor, to treat the matter as strictly confidential. "'I suppose he says the same to every one he tells,' was Mahony's comment as he flicked up his horse, and he wondered what the extent might be of the lawyer's personal interest in the Porapunka Company. Probably the number of shareholders was not large enough to rake up the capital. Still, the incident gave him food for thought, and only after closing time did he remember his intention of driving home by way of the bank. Later in the day he came back on the incident, and pondered his abrupt refusal of Ocock's offer. There was nothing unusual in this, he never took advice well, and was it forced upon him nine times out of ten, a certain inborn contrariness drove him to do just the opposite. 
Besides, he had not yet learned to look with lenience on the rage for speculation that had seized the people of Ballarat, and he held that it would be culpable for a man of his slender means to risk money in the great game. But was there any hint of risk in the present instance? To judge from Ocock's manner, the investment was as safe as a house, and lucrative to a degree that made one's head swim. Many times their original figure. An Arabian Nights fashion of growing rich and no mistake. Very different from the laborious grind of his days, in which he had always to reckon with the chance of not being paid at all. That very afternoon had brought him a fresh example of this. He was returning from the old magpie lead, where he had been called to a case of scarlet fever, and saw himself covering the same road daily for some time to come. But he had learned to adjudge his patients in a winking, and these, he could swear to it, would prove to be non-payers, of a kind even to cut and run once the child was out of danger. Was he really justified, cramped for money as he was, in rejecting the straight tip Ocock had given him? and he debated this moot point, argued his need against his principles the whole way home. As soon as he had changed, and seen his suspect clothing hung out to air, he went impetuously back to Ocock's office. He had altered his mind. A small gift from a grateful patient. Yes, fifty, please, they might bring him luck. And he saw his name written down as the owner of half a hundred shares. After this he took a new interest in the mining sheet of the star, turned to it, indeed, first of all. For a week, a fortnight, poor Apunkas remained stationary. Then they made a call, and if he did not wish to forfeit, he had to pay out as many shillings as he held shares. A day or two later they sank a trifle, and Mahony's hopes with them. There even came a day when they were not mentioned, and he gave up his money for lost. But of a sudden they woke to life again, took an upward bound, and within a month were quoted at five pounds, on rumour alone. "'Very sensitive indeed,' said the star. Purdy, his only confidant, went about swearing at himself for having let the few he owned lapse, and Mahony itched to sell. He could now have banked two hundred and fifty pounds. But Ocock laughed him out of countenance, even went so far as to pat him on the shoulder. On no account was he to think of selling. "'Sit tight, doctor, sit tight, till I say the word.' And Mahony reluctantly obeyed. End of Part 3, Chapter 8Part three, chapter nine of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part three, chapter nine. In the course of the following winter, John Turnham came to stand as one of two candidates for the newly proclaimed electoral district of Ballarat West. The first news his relatives had of his intention was gleaned from the daily paper. Mahony lit on the paragraph by chance one morning, said, "'Hullo, here's something that will interest you, my dear,' and read it aloud. Polly laid down her knife and fork, pushed her plate from her, and went pink with pleasure and surprise. "'Richard, you don't mean it!' she exclaimed, and got up to look over his shoulder. Yes, there it was, John's name in all the glory of print. Mr. John Millibank Turnham, one of the foremost citizens and most highly respected denizens of our marvellous metropolis, and a staunch supporter of democratic rights and the interests of our people.' Polly drew a deep breath. "'Do you know, Richard, I shouldn't wonder if he came to live on Ballarat. I mean, if he gets in. Does Trotty hear? This is Trotty's papa they're writing about in the papers. Of course we must ask him to stay with us. For this happened during an interregnum, when the spare room was temporarily out of use. Of course we must do nothing of the kind. Your brother will need the best rooms baths can give him, and when he's not actually on the hustings he'll be hobnobbing in the bar, standing as many drinks as there are throats in the crowd," gave back Mahony, who had the lowest possible opinion of colonial politics. "'Well, at least I can write and tell him how delighted we are,' said Polly, not to be done. "'Find out first, my dear, if there's any truth in the report. I can hardly think John would have left us in the dark to this extent.' But John corroborated the news, and in the letter Polly read out a week later, announced the opening of his campaign for the coming month. "'I shall feel much obliged to your husband, if he will meanwhile exert his influence on my behalf. He is no doubt acquainted professionally with many of the leading squatters around Ballarat, whom he can induce to support my candidature.' Hm, said Mahony grumpily, as he went on scooping out his egg. "'We're good enough to tout for him.' "'Hush!' warned Polly, with a glance at Trotty. 
Think what it means to him, Richard, and to us, too. It'll do your practice ever so much good, if he gets in, to be the brother-in-law of the member. We must help all we can, dear. She was going driving to Urangabilly that day, with Archdeacon Long, to see a new arrival Richard had recently brought into the world, and now she laid plans to kill two birds with one stone, entering into the scheme with a gusto that astonished Mahony. "'Upon my word, wife, I believe you're glad to have something to do.' "'Will my own papa give me a dolly, like Uncle Papa?' here piped Trotty. "'Perhaps, but you'll have to be a very good girl, and not talk with your mouthful or dirty your pinnies. Oh, here's a postscript.' Polly had returned to the sheet, and was gloating over it. John writes, "'Especially must he endeavour to win lawyer Ocock over to my side. I lay great weight on O's support.' "'Oh, Richard, now isn't that unfortunate. I do hope it won't make any difference to John's chances.' Polly's dismay had good grounds. A marked coolness had sprung up between her husband and the lawyer, and on no account she knew would Richard consent to approach Mr. Henry. Some very hot remarks made by the latter had been passed on to her by Mrs. Glendinning. She had not dared to tell Richard the worst. The coolness dated from an afternoon when Tilly Beamish had burst into the house in a state of rampant excitement. "'Oh, Polly! Oh, I say, my dear, whatever do you think, that old cove, old O, has actually had the cheek to make me a proposal!' "'Tilly!' gasped Polly, and flushed to the roots of her hair. "'Oh, my dear, I am pleased!' for Polly's conscience was still somewhat tender about the aid she had lent Purdy in his evasions. The two women kissed, and Tilly cried a little. "'It's certainly her first offer,' thought Mrs. Polly. Aloud, she asked hesitatingly, "'And do you—er, uh, shall you—I mean, are you going to accept him, Tilly?' But this was just where Tilly could not make up her mind. Should she take him, or should she not?' For two whole days she sat about debating the question, and Polly listened to her with all the sympathy and interest so momentous a step deserved. "'If you feel you could really learn to care for him, dear, of course it would be nice for you to have a house of your own, and how happy it would make poor mother to see you settled.' Tilly tore the last veil from her feelings, uttered gross confidences. Polly knew well enough where her real inclination lay— "'I've hoped against hope, Poll, that a certain person would come to the scratch at last.' Yes, it was true enough, he had nothing to offer her, but she wasn't the sort to have stuck at that. "'I'd have worked my hands to the bone for him, Poll, if he'd only said the word.' The one drawback to marriage with you-know-who would have been his infirmity. "'Somehow, Polly, I can't picture myself dragging an husband with a gammy leg at my heels.' From this Tilly's mind glanced back to the suitor who had honourably declared himself. Of course, old O hadn't a great deal of the gentleman about him, and their ages were unsuitable. He owns to fifty-eight, and as you know, Poll, I'm only just turned twenty-five. At which Polly drooped her head a little lower over the handkerchief she was hemming, to avoid meeting her friend's eye. Poor dear Tilly, she would never see thirty again, and she need hardly have troubled, thought Polly, to be insincere with her but in the same breath she took back the reproach. A woman herself, she understood something of the fear and shame and heart-burning that had gone into the making of the lie. Perhaps, too, it was a gentle hint from Tilly what age she now wished to be considered. And so Polly agreed, and said tenderly, yes, certainly, the difference was very marked. Meanwhile Tilly flowed on. These were the two chief objections. On the other hand, the old boy was ludicrously smitten, and she thought one might trust her, Tilly B., to soon knock him into shape. It would also, no doubt, be possible to squeeze a few pounds out of him towards assisting Pa and Ma in their present struggle. Again, as a married woman, she would have a chance of helping Jinny to find a husband. Though so Jin's gone off so, Polly, I bet you'd hardly know her if you met her in the street. To end all, a bird in hand, etc., and, besides, what prospects had she if she remained a spinster? So when she was asked, Tilly accepted, without further humming and hawing, an invitation to drive out in the smart dog-cart Mr. Ocock had hired for the purpose, and Polly saw her off with many a small private sign of encouragement. All went well. A couple of hours later Tilly came flying in, caught Polly up in a bear's hug, and danced her around the room. "'My dear, wish me joy! Oh, lor, Polly, I do feel happy!' She was wearing a large half-hoop of diamonds on her ring-finger. 
Nothing would do old O, but that they should drive there, and then to the finest jewellers in Sturt Street, where she had the pick of a tray full. And now Mr. Ocock, all a smirk with sheepish pride, was fetched in to receive congratulations, and Polly produced refreshments, and healths were drunk. Afterwards the happy couple dallied in the passage, and loitered on the doorstep, till evening was far advanced. It was Polly who, in clearing away, was struck dumb by the thought. But now whatever is to become of Miss Amelia? She wondered if this consideration troubled the old man. Trouble there was of some sort. He called at the house three days running for a word with Richard. He wore a brand-new pair of shepherd's plaid trousers, a choker that his work-stained hands had soiled in tying, a black coat, a massive gold watch-chain. On the third visit he was lucky enough to catch Mahony, and the door of the surgery closed behind them. Here Mr. Ocock sat on the extreme edge of a chair, alternately crushed his wide-awake flat between his palms, and expanded it again as though he were playing a concertina, and coughed out a wordy preamble. He assured Mahony, to begin with, how highly he esteemed him. It was because of this, because he knew Doctor was as straight as a pound of candles, that he was going to ask his advice on an awkward matter, devilish awkward, one nobody had any idea of either, except Henry. And Henry had kicked up such a deuce of a row at his wanting to marry again, that he was damned if he'd have anything more to do with him. Besides, the doctor knew what lawyers were, the whole breed of them, sharp as needles, especially Henry, but with a sort of squint in their upper story that made them see every mortal thing from the point of view of law. And that was no good to him. What he needed was a plain and honest, uh, he hesitated for a word, and repeated, a honest opinion, for he only wanted to do the right thing, what was straight and above board. And at last it came out. Did Doc think it would be acting on the square, and not taking a low-down advantage of a female, if he omitted to mention to the future Mrs. O., that up until six months back he had been obliged to—well, he'd spit it out short and say, obliged to report himself to the authorities at fixed intervals. Women were such shy cattle, so damned odd, you never knew how they'd take a thing like this. One might raise cane over it, another only laugh, another send him packing. He didn't want to let a fine young woman like Matilda slip if he could help it, by dad he didn't but he felt he must either win her by fair dealing, or not at all. And having got the load off his chest, the old colonist swallowed hard, and ran the back of his hand over his forehead. He had kept his eyes glued to the table-leg in speaking, and so saw neither his hearer's involuntary start at the damaging disclosure, nor the nervous tightening of the hand that lay along the arm of the chair. Mahony sat silent, balancing a paper-knife, and fighting down a feeling of extraordinary discomfort, his very finger-tips curled under the strain. It was of little use to remind himself that ever since he had known him, Ocock had led a decent, God-fearing life, respected both in his business relations and by his brethren of the chapel. Nor could he spare more than a glance in passing for those odd traits in the old man's character which were now explained his itch for public approval, his unvarying harshness towards the pair of incorrigibles who weighed him down. At this moment he discounted even the integrity that had prompted the confession. His attitude of mind was one of, why the deuce couldn't the old fool have held his tongue? Oh, these unbidden, injudicious confidences, how they complicated life! And as a doctor he was pestered with only too many, he was continually being forced to see behind the scenes. Now outsiders, too, must needs choose him for the storehouse of their privacies. Himself he never made a confidence, but it seemed as though just this buttoned-upness on his part loosened people's tongues. Blind to the flags of warning he hoisted in looks and bearing, they innocently proceeded, as Ocock had done, to throw up insurmountable barriers. He could hear a new tone in his own voice when he replied, and was relieved to know the old man dull of perception. For now Ocock had finished speaking, and sat perspiring with anxiety to learn his fate. Mahony pulled himself together. He could, in good faith, tender the advice to let the dead past bury its dead. Whatever the original fault had been, oh, no, no, please! And he raised an arresting hand. It was, he felt sure, long since fully atoned. And Mr. Ocock had said a true word. Women were strange creatures. The revelation of his secret might shipwreck his late-found happiness. It also, of course, might not, 
and personally Mahony did not believe it would, for Ocock's business throve like the green bay-tree, and Miss Tilly had been promised a fine two-storied house, with bow-windows and a garden, and a carriage-drive up to the door. Again the admission might be accepted in peace just now, and later on used as a weapon against him. In his, Mahony's eyes, by far the wisest course would be to let the grass grow over the whole affair. And here he rose, abruptly terminating the interview. "'You and I, too, sir, if you please, will forget what has passed between us this morning, and never come back on it. How is Tom getting on in the drapery business? Does he like his billet?' But none the less, as he ushered his visitor out, he felt that there was a certain finality about the action. It was, as far as his private feelings were concerned, the old man's moral exit from the scene. On the doorstep Ocock hoped that nothing that had been said would reach your dear little lady. "'To Henry too, Doc, if you'll be so good, mum's the word. Henry had never forgive me, nay, nor you either, if he'd got to his ears I'd been and let the cat out of the bag. And he's got a bit of a down on you as it is, for having been your place I met the future Mrs. O. at.' "'My good man!' broke from Mahony, and in this address, which would previously never have crossed his lips, all his sensations of the past hour were summed up. "'Has your son Henry the—' he checked himself. "'Does he suppose I, or I, or my wife, had anything to do with it?' He turned back to the surgery, hot with annoyance. This, too, not enough that he must be put out of countenance by indiscreet babbling, he must also get drawn into family squabbles, even be held responsible for them. He, who, brooking no interference in his own life, demanded only that those about him should be as intolerant as he. It all came from Polly's indiscriminate hospitality. His house was never his own. And now they had the prospect of John and his electoral campaign before them. And John's chances of success, and John's stump oratory, and the backstair work other people were expected to do for him, would form the main theme of conversation for many a day to come. Mrs. Glendinning confirmed old Ocock's words. She came to talk over the engagement with Polly, and sitting in the parlour cried a little, and was sorry. But then poor little Agnes cried so easily nowadays. Richard said her nerves had been shattered by the terrible affair just before Christmas, when Mr. Glendinning had tried first to kill her, and then to cut his own throat. Agnes said, "'But I told Henry quite plainly, darling, that I would not cease my visits to you on that account. It's both wrong and foolish to think you or Dr. Mahony had anything to do with it. And after the doctor was so kind, too, so very kind, about getting poor Mr. Glendinning into the asylum. And so you see, dear, Henry and I have had quite a disagreement.' And Agnes cried again at the remembrance— "'Of course, I can sympathise with his point of view. Henry is so ambitious. All the same, dearest, it's not quite so bad, is it, as he makes out? Matilda is certainly not very comme il faut. You'll forgive my saying so, love, won't you? But I think she will suit Henry's father in every way. No, the truth is, the old gentleman has made a great deal of money, and we naturally expected it to fall to Henry at his death. No one anticipated his marrying again.' Not that Henry really needs the money, he's getting on so well, and I have—I shall have plenty, too, by and by. But you know, love, what men are. Dearest Agnes, don't fret about it. Mr. Henry thinks too much of you, I'm sure, to be vexed with you for long. And when he looks at it calmly, he'll see how unfair it is to make us responsible. I'm like you, dear. I can't consider it a misfortune. Tilly is not a lady, but she's a dear warm-hearted girl, and will make the old man a good wife. I only hope, though, Agnes, Mr. Henry won't say anything to Richard. Richard is so touchy about things of that sort. The two women kissed, Polly with feelings of the tenderest affection. The fact that on behalf of their friendship Agnes had pitted her will against Mr. Henry's endeared her to Polly, as nothing else could have done. But when, vigilant as a mother hen, she sought to prepare her husband for a possible unpleasantness, she found him already informed, and her well-meant words were like a match laid to his suppressed indignation. "'In all my born days I never heard of such impudence!' He turned embarrassingly cool to Tilly, and Tilly, innocent of offence and quite unskilled in deciphering subtleties, put this sudden change of front down to jealousy, because she was going to live in a grander house than he did. For the same reason he had begun to turn up his nose at old O, or she was very much mistaken, and in vain did Polly strive to convince her that she was in error. I don't know any one Richard has a higher opinion of. 
but it was a very uncomfortable state of things, and when a message arrived over the electric telegraph announcing the dangerous illness of Mrs. Beamish, distressed though she was by the news, Polly could not help heaving a tiny sigh of relief. For Tilly was summoned back to Melbourne with all speed if she wished to see her mother alive. They mingled their tears, Polly on her knees at the packing, Tilly weeping wholeheartedly among the pillows of the bed. "'If it had only been Pa now, I shouldn't have felt it off so much.' and she blew her nose for the hundredth time. "'Pa was always such a rum old stick. But poor Ma, when I think how she's toiled and moiled her whole life long to keep things going. She's had all the pains and none of the pleasures. And now, just when I was hoping to be able to give her a helping hand, this must happen.' The one bright spot in Tilly's grief was that the journey would be made in a private conveyance. Mr. Ocock had bought a smart gig, and was driving her down himself, driving past the foundations of the new house, along the seventy-odd miles of road, right up to the door of the mean lodging in a Collingwood back street, where the old Beamishes had hidden their heads. "'If only she's able to look out of the window and see me dash up in me own turnout,' said Chilly. Polly fitted out a substantial luncheon-basket, and was keenest sympathy to the last. But Mahony was a poor dissembler, and his sudden thaw as he assisted in the farewell preparations could, Polly feared, have been read aright by a child. Tilly hugged Polly to her, and gave her kiss after kiss. "'I shall never forget how kind you've been, Poll, and all you've done for me. I've had my disappointments here, as you know, but perhaps after all it'll turn out to be for the best. One of the good sights to it, anyhow, is that you and me'll be next-door neighbours, so to say, for the rest of our lives.' "'And I'll hope to see something of you, my dear, every blessed day. "'But you'll not often catch me come into this house, I can tell you that. "'For if you won't mind me saying so, Poll, "'I think you've got one of the queerest sticks for a husband that ever walked this earth. "'Blows hot one day and cold the next, for all the world like the wind in spring, "'and without caring tuppence whose corns he treads on.' "'Which, thought Polly, was but a sorry return on Tilly's part for Richard's hospitality, after all, it was his house she had been a guest in. Such were the wheels within wheels, and thus it came about that when the question rose of paving the way for John Turnham's candidature, Mahony drew the line at approaching Henry Ocock. End of Part 3 Chapter 9《Part 3 Chapter 10 of Australia Felix This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson, Part Three, Chapter Ten. John drove from Melbourne in a Dragon Four, accompanied by numerous friends and well-wishers. A mile or so out of Ballarat, he was met by a body of supporters headed by a brass band and escorted in triumph to the George Hotel. Here, the horses having been led away, John at once took the field by mounting the box seat of the coach and addressing the crowd of idlers that had gathered around to watch the arrival. He got an excellent hearing, so Jerry reported, who was an eye and ear witness of the scene, and was afterwards borne shoulder-high into the hotel. With Jerry at his heels, Mahony called at the hotel that evening. He found John entertaining a large impromptu party. The table of the public dining-room was disorderly with the remains of a liberal meal. Napkins lay crushed and flung down among plates piled high with empty nutshells. The cloth was wine-stained and bestrewn with ashes and bread-crumbs, the air heady with the fumes of tobacco. Those of the guests who still lingered at the table had pushed their chairs back or askew, and sat, some astraddle, some even with their feet on the cloth. John was confabbing with half a dozen black-coats in a corner. Each held a wine-glass in his hand from which he sipped, while John, legs apart, did all the talking, every now and then putting out his forefinger to prod one of his hearers in the middle button of the waistcoat. It was some time before he discovered the presence of his relatives, and Mahony had leisure to admire the fashion in which this corner talk over, John dispersed himself among the company, drinking with this one and that, glibly answering questions, patting a glum-faced brewer on the back, and simultaneously checking over, with an oily-haired agent, his committee meetings for the following days. His customary arrogance and pompousness of manner were laid aside. For the nonce he was a simple man among men. Then espying them, he hurried over, and rubbing his hands with pleasure, said warmly, "'My dear Marnie, this is indeed kind. Jerry, my lad, how do you do? Still growing, I see. We'll make a fine feller of you yet. Well, doctor, 
"'We've every reason, I think, to feel satisfied with the lie of the land.' But here he was snatched from them by an urgent request for a pronouncement. "'A quite informal word, sir, if you'll be so good, on the vexed question of vote by ballot. And this being a pet theme of John's, and a principle he was ready to defend through thick and thin, he willingly complied. Mahony had no further talk with him. The speech over, it was a concise and spirited utterance, and, if you were prepared to admit the efficacy of the ballot, convincing enough, Mahony quietly withdrew. He had to see a patient at eleven. Polly, too, would probably be lying awake for news of her brother. As he threw back his braces and wound up his watch, he felt it incumbent on him to warn her not to pitch her hopes too high. "'You mustn't expect, my dear, that your brother's arrival will mean much to us. He is now a public man, and will have little time for small people like ourselves. I'm bound to admit, Polly, I was very favourably impressed by the few words I heard him say,' he added. "'Oh, Richard, I'm so glad,' said Polly, who had been sitting on the edge of the bed, stood on tiptoe, and gave him a kiss. As Mahony predicted, John's private feelings went down before the superior interests of his campaign. Three days passed before he found time to pay his sister a visit, and Polly, who had postponed a washing, baked her richest cakes and pastries, and clad Trotty in her Sunday best each day of the three. Polly was putting a good face on the matter, and consoling herself with Jerry's descriptions of John's triumphs. How she wished she could hear some of the speechifying, but Richard would never consent, and electioneering did certainly seem, from what Jerry said, a very rough and ready business, nothing for ladies. Hence her delight knew no bounds when John drove up unexpectedly late one afternoon, between a hard day's personal canvassing and another of the innumerable dinners he had to eat his way through. Tossing the reins to the gentleman who sat next to him, he jumped out of the wagonette. It was hung with placards of vote for Turnham, and gave a loud rat-a-tat on the door. Forgetting in her excitement that this was Ellen's job, Polly opened to him herself and drew him in. "'John, how pleased I am to see you!' "'My dear girl, how are you? God bless me how you've altered! I should never have known you!' He held her at arm's length to consider her. "'But you haven't changed in the least, John, except to grow younger. Richard, here's John at last. And Trotty, John, here's Trotty. Take your thumb out of your mouth, you naughty girl. She's been watching for you all day, John, with her nose to the window. And Polly pushed forward the scarlet, shrinking child. John's heartiness suffered a distinct check as his eyes lit on Trotty, who stood stiff as a bit of Dresden china in her bunchy, starched petticoats. "'Come here, Emma, and let me look at you.' Taking the fat little chin between thumb and first finger, he turned the child's face up and kept it so, till the red button of her mouth trembled and the great blue eyes all but ran over. Hm, mm, yes, a notable resemblance to her mother. Ah, time passes, Polly, my dear, time passes. He sighed. I hope you mind your aunt, Emma, and are properly grateful to her. Abruptly quitting his hold, he swept the parlour with a glance. A very snug little place you have here, upon my word. While Polly, with Trotty pattering after, bustled to the larder, Mahony congratulated his brother-in-law on the more favourable attitudes towards his election policy which was becoming evident in the local press. John's persuasive tongue was clearly having its effect, and the hostility he had met with at the outset of his candidature was yielding to more friendly feelings on all sides. John was frankly gratified by the change, and did not hesitate to say so. When the wine arrived, they drank to his success, and Polly's delicacies met with their due share of praise. Then, having wiped his mouth on a large silk handkerchief, John disclosed the business object of his call. He wanted specific information about the more influential of their friends and acquaintances, and here he drew a list of names from his pocket-book. Mahony, his chin propped on the flaxen head of the child whom he nursed, soon fell out of the running— for Polly proved far the cleverer at grasping the nature of the information John sought, and at retailing it. And John complimented her on her shrewdness, ticked off names, took notes on what she told him, and when he was not writing sat tapping his thick carnation-red underlip and nodding assent. It was arranged that Polly should drive out with him next day to Urangabilly by way of Dandaloo, while for the evening after they plotted a card-party, at which John might come to grips with Archdeacon Long. John expected to find the reverend gentleman a hard nut to crack, their views on the subject of a state aid to religion being diametrically opposed. Polly thought a substantial donation to the chancel fund might smooth things over, 
while for John to display a personal interest in Mrs. Long's charities would help still more. Then there were the Ococks. The old man could be counted on, she believed, but John might have some difficulty with Mr. Henry, and here she initiated her brother into the domestic differences which had split up the Ocock family and prevented Richard from approaching the lawyer. John, who was in his most democratic mood, was humorous at the expense of Henry, and declared the latter should rather wish his father joy of coming to such a fine, bouncing young wife in his old age. The best way of getting at Mr. Henry, Polly considered, would be for Mrs. Glendinning to give a luncheon or a bushing party with the lawyer among the guests. Then you and I, John, could drive out and join them, either by chance or invitation, as you think best. Polly was heart and soul in the affair. But business over, she put several straight questions about the boy, little Johnny. Polly still blamed herself for having meekly submitted to the child's removal from her charge, and was not to be fobbed off with evasions. The unfavourable verdict she managed to worm out of John. "'Incorrigible, my dear Polly, utterly incorrigible. His masters report him idle, disobedient, a bad influence on the other scholars.' She met staunchly with, "'Perhaps it has something to do with the school. Why not try another? Johnny has his good qualities, in many ways was quite a lovable child.' For the first time Mahony saw his wife and her eldest brother together, and he could not but be struck by Polly's attitude. Greatly as she admired and reverenced John, there was not a particle of obsequiousness in her manner, nor any truckling to his point of view, and she plainly felt nothing of the peculiar sense of discomfort that invariably attacked him in John's presence. Either she was not conscious of her brother's grossly patronising air, or aware of it did not resent it, John having always been so much her superior in age and position. Or was it indeed the truth that John did not try to patronise Polly? that his overbearing nature recognised in hers a certain springy resistance which was not to be crushed. In other words, that in a turnum, turnum blood met its match. John retook his seat in the front of the wagonette. Trotty was lifted up to see the rosettes and streamers adorning the horses. The gentlemen waved their hats, and off they went again at a fine pace, and with a whip-cracking that brought the neighbours to their windows. Polly had pink cheeks with it all, and even sought to excuse the meagre interest John had shown in his daughter. Trotty was only a baby in arms when he saw her last. Besides, I think she reminded him too much of her dear mother, for I'm sure, though he doesn't let it be seen, John still feels his loss. "'I wonder,' said Mahony slowly, and with a strong downward inflection, as he turned indoors. On the eve of the polling, Polly had the honour of accompanying her brother to a performance at the Theatre Royal. A ticket came for Richard, too, but as usual he was at the last moment called out. So Purdy took her on his arm and escorted her. Not exactly comfortably, for, said Polly, no one who has not tried it knew how hard it was to walk arm in arm with a lame person, especially if you didn't want to hurt his feelings. Purdy took her to the theatre, helped her to unmuffle and to change her boots, and bore her company until her brother arrived. They had seats in the centre of the front row of the dress-circle, all eyes were turned on them as they entered, and Polly's appearance was the subject of audible and embarrassing comment. In every interval John was up and away to shake a hand here, pass the time of day there, and watching him with affectionate pride, Polly wondered how Richard could ever have termed him high-handed and difficult. John had the knack, it seemed to her, of getting on with people of every class, and of always finding the right word to say. But as the evening advanced, his seat remained empty, even while the curtain was up, and she was glad when, between the fourth and fifth acts, her husband at last appeared. On his way to her, Mahony ran into his brother-in-law, and John buttonholed him to discuss with him the prospects of the morrow. As they talked, their eyes rested on Polly's glossy black chignon, on the nape of her white neck, on the beautiful rounded young shoulders which, in obedience to the fashion, stood right out of her blue silk bodice. Mahony shifted his weight uneasily from one foot to the other. He could not imagine Polly enjoying her exposed position, and disapproved strongly of John having left her. But for all answer to the hint he threw out, John said slowly, and with somewhat unctuous relish, "'My sister has turned into a remarkably handsome woman.' Words which sent the lightning thought through Mahony, that had Polly remained the insignificant little slip of a thing of earlier days, she would not have been asked to fill the prominent place she did this evening. John sent his adieu and excuses to Polly. He had done what was expected of him in showing himself at a public entertainment, 
and a vast mass of correspondence lay unsorted on his desk, so Mahony moved forward alone. "'Oh, Richard, there you are! Oh, dear, what you've missed! I never thought there could be such acting!' and Polly turned her great dark eyes on her husband. They were moist from the noble sentiments of the true Briton. The day of the election broke, a gusty spring day, cut up by stinging hail-showers, which beat like fusillades on the galvanised iron roofs. Between the showers the sun shone in a gentian blue sky, against which the little wooden houses showed up crassly white. Ballarat made holiday. Early as Mahony left home, he met a long line of conveyances heading townwards, spring-carts, dog-carts, double and single buggies, in some of which, built to seat two only, five or six persons were huddled. These and similar vehicles drew up in rows outside the public-houses, where the lean, long-legged colonial horses stood jerking at their tethers. And they were still there, still jerking, when he passed again toward evening. On a huge poster the unicorn offered to lunch free all those thinking men who registered their vote for the one and only true Democrat, the miner's friend and tyrant's foe, John Turnham. In the hope of avoiding a crush, Mahony drove straight to the polling booth, but already all the loafers and roughs in the place seemed to be congregated around the entrance, after the polite custom of the country, to chivy, to boo, to huzzah those who went in. In waiting his turn, he had to listen to comments on his dress and person, to put up with vulgar allusions to blue pills and black draughts. Just as he was getting back into his buggy, John rode up, flanked by a bodyguard of friends. John was galloping from booth to booth to verify progress, and put the thumbscrew on wobblers. He beamed, as well he might. He was certain to be one of the two members elected, and quite likely to top the poll by a respectable majority. For once Mahony did not grumble at his outlying patience, was only too thankful to turn his back on the town. It was pandemonium. Bands of music, one shriller and more discordant than the next, marched up and down the main streets, from the fifes and drums of the fire brigade to the kerosene tins and penny whistles of the mere determined noisemakers. Straggling processions, with banners that bore the distorted features of one or other of the candidates, made driving difficult and to add to the confusion the schoolchildren were let loose to overrun the place, and fly advertisement balloons around every corner. And so it went on until far into the night, the dark hours being varied by torchlight processions, fireworks, free fights, and orgies of drunkenness. The results of the polling were promised for two o'clock the following day. When, something after this hour, Mahony reached home, he found Polly and the gentle oxide Jinny Beamish, who was the present occupant of the spare-room, pacing up and down before the house. According to Jerry, news might be expected now at any minute. And when he had lunched and changed his coat, Mahony, bitten by the general excitement, made his way down to the junction of Sturt Street in the flat. A great crowd blocked the approaches to the hustings. Here were the four candidates, who, in attending the issue, strove to look decently unconcerned. John had struck a quasi-Napoleonic attitude, his right elbow propped in the cup of his left hand. He held his drooped chin between thumb and forefinger, leaving it to his glancing black eyes to reveal how entirely alive he was to the gravity of the moment. Standing on the fringe of the crowd, Mahony listened to the piebald jokes and rude wit with which the people beguiled the interim, and tried to endure with equanimity the jostling, the profane language and offensive odours by which he was assailed. Half an hour elapsed before the returning officer climbed the ladder at the back of the platform, and came forward to announce the result of the voting. Mr. John Millibank Turnham topped the poll with a majority of four hundred and fifty-two. The crowd, which at sight of the clerk had abruptly ceased its fooling, drowned his further statements in a roar of mingled cheers and boos. The cheers had it. Hats were tossed into the air, and loud cries for a speech arose. John's advance to grip the railing led to a fresh outburst, in which the weakening opposition was quashed by the singing of "'When Johnny Comes Marching Home' and "'Cheer, boys, cheer for home and mother country!' An incongruity of sentiment that made Mahony smile. And John, having repeatedly bowed his thanks from side to side, joined in and sang with the rest. The opening of his speech was inaudible to Mahony. Just behind him stood one of his brother-in-law's most arrant opponents, a butcher by trade. And directly John began to hold forth, this man produced a corner to piston and started to blow it. In vain did Mahony expostulate. 
he seemed to have got into a very wasp's nest of hostility, for the player's friends took up the cudgels and baited him in a language he would have been sorry to imitate, the butcher blaring away unmoved, with the fierce solemnity of face the cornet demands. Mahony lost his temper, his tormentors retaliated, and for a moment it looked as though there would be trouble. Then a number of John's supporters, enraged by the bellowing of the instrument, bore down and forcibly removed the musician and his clique, Mahony along with them. Having indignantly explained and shaken coat and collar to rights, he returned to his place on the edge of the crowd. The speaker's deep voice had gone steadily on during the disturbance. Indeed, John might have been born to the hustings. Interruptions did not put him out. He was brilliant at repartee, and all the stock gestures of the public speaker came at his call. The pounding of the bowl of one hand with the closed fist of the other. The dramatic wave of the arm with which he plumbed the depths or invited defiance the jaunty standing at ease, arms akimbo, the earnest bend from the waist when he took his hearers into his confidence. At this moment he was gripping the rail of the platform as though he intended to vault it, and asserting, "'Our first cry, then, is for men to people the country, our next for independence, to work out our own salvation. Yes, my friends, the glorious future of this young and prosperous colony, which was once and most auspiciously known as Australia Felix, blessed, thrice-blessed Australia, rests with ourselves alone. We who inhabit here can best judge of her requirements, and we refuse to see her hampered in her progress by the shackles of an ancient tradition. What suits our hoary mother-country, God bless and keep her, and keep us loyal to her, is but dry husks for us. England knows nothing of our most pressing needs. I ask you to consider how, previous to 1855, that pretty pair of mandarins, Lord John Russell and Earl Grey, boggled and botched the crucial question of unlocking the lands. Even yet, gentlemen, the result of their muddling lies heavy on us. And the land question, though first in importance, is but one, as you know, of many. And here John, playing on the tips of five wide-stretched fingers, counted them off. He wound up with a flaming plea for the creation and protection of purely national industries. For what, I would ask you, is the true meaning of democracy in a country such as ours? What, for us, is the democratic principle? The answer, my friends, is conservatism. Yes, I repeat it, conservatism. And thus to a final peroration. In the braying and hurrahing that followed, the din was heightened by some worthy mounting a barrel to move that this year Johnny Turnham was not a fit person to represent the constituency, by the barrel being dragged from under him, and the speaker rolled in the mud. While this went on, Mahony stood silent, and he was still standing meditatively pulling his whiskers, when a sudden call for a doctor reached his ear. He pushed his way to the front. How the accident happened, no one knew. John had descended from the platform to a veranda where countless hands were stretched out to shake his. A pile of shutters was leaning against the wall, and in some unexplained fashion these had fallen, striking John a blow that knocked him down. When Mahony got to him, he was on his feet again, wiping a drop of blood from his left temple. He looked pale, but pooh-poohed injury or the idea of interfering with his audience's design, and Mahony saw him shouldered and borne off. That evening there was a lengthy banquet, in which all the notables of the place took part. Mahony's seat was some way off John's. He had to lean forward, did he wish to see his brother-in-law. Towards eleven o'clock, just as he was wondering if he could slip out unobserved, a hand was laid on his arm. John stood behind him, white to the lips. "'Can I have a word with you upstairs?' Here he confessed to a knife-like pain in his left side. The brunt of the blow, it seemed, had met him slantways between hip and rib. A cursory examination made Mahony look grave. "'You must come back with me, John, and let me see to you properly.' Having expressed the chief guest's regrets to the company, he ordered a horse and trap, and helping John into it, drove him home. And that night John lay in their bed, letting out the groans he had suppressed during the evening, while Polly snatched forty winks beside Jinny Beamish, and Mahony got what sleep he could on the parlour sofa. End of Part 3 Chapter 10《Part Three, Chapter Eleven of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part Three, Chapter Eleven. There, for some weeks, John was a prisoner, with a fractured rib encased in strips of plaster. 
"'In your element again, old girl,' Mahony chuffed his wife, when he met her bearing invalid trays. "'Oh, it doesn't all fall on me, Richard. Jinny's a great help sitting with John and keeping him company.' Mahony could see it for himself. Oftenest, when he entered the room, it was Jinny's black-robed figure. She was in mourning for her parents, for Mrs. Beamish had sunk under the twofold strain of failure and disgrace, and the day after her death it had been necessary to cut old Beamish down from a nail. Oftenest it was Jinny he found sitting behind a curtain of the tester-bed, watching while John slept, ready to read to him or listen to his talk when he awoke. This service set Polly free to devote herself to the extra cooking, and John was content. "'A most modest and unassuming young woman,' ran his verdict on Jinny. Polly reported it to her husband in high glee. "'Who could have ever believed two sisters would turn out so differently?' Tilly to get so, so, well, you know what I mean, and Jinny to improve as she has done. Have you noticed, Richard, she hardly ever, really quite seldom now, drops an H? It must all have been due to Tilly serving in that low bar. By the time John was so far recovered as to exchange bed for sofa, it had come to be exclusively Jinny who carried into him the dainties Polly prepared. The wife, as usual, was content to do the dirty work. John declared Miss Jinny had the foot of a fay, also that his meals tasted best at her hands. Jinny even succeeded in making Trotty fond of her, and the love of the fat, shy child was not readily won. Entering the parlour one evening, Mahony surprised quite a family scene. John, stretched on the sofa, was stringing cat's cradles. Jinny sat beside him, with Trotty on her knee. On the whole, though, the child did not warm to her father. "'Auntie, can that man take me away from you?' "'That man? Why, Trotty, darling, he's your father,' said Polly, shocked. "'Can he take me away from you and Uncle Papa?' "'He could if he wanted to, but I'm sure he doesn't,' answered her aunt, deftly turning a well-rolled sheet of pastry. And writing her dolly, which she had been dragging upside down, Trotty let slip her fears with the sovereign ease of childhood. From the kitchen Polly could hear the boom of John's deep bass. It made nothing of the lath and plaster walls. Of course, shut up as he was, he had to talk to somebody, poor fellow, and Richard was too busy to spare him more than half an hour of an evening. Jinny was a good listener. Through the crack of the door Polly could see her sitting, humbly drinking in John's words, and even looking rather pretty in her fair full womanliness. "'Oh, Polly!' she burst out one day, after being held thus spellbound. "'Oh, my dear, what a splendid man your brother is! I feel sometimes I could sink through the floor with shame at my ignorance when he talks to me so.' But as time went on, Mahony noticed that his wife grew decidedly thoughtful, and if John continued to sing Jinny's praises, he heard nothing more of it. He had an acute suspicion what troubled Polly, but did not try to force her confidence. Then one afternoon, on his getting home, she came into the surgery looking very perturbed, and could hardly find words to break a certain piece of news to him. It appeared that not an hour previously Jinny, flushed and tearful, had lain on her neck, confessing her feelings for John, and hinting at the belief that they were returned. "'Well, I think you might have been prepared for something of this sort, Polly,' he said with a shrug, when he had heard her out. "'Convalescence is notoriously dangerous for fanning the affections.' "'Oh, but I never dreamt of such a thing, Richard. Jinny is a dear good girl and all that, but she's not John's equal. And that he can even think of putting her in poor Emma's place. What shall I say to him?' "'Say nothing at all. Your brother John is not the man to put up with interference.' "'He longs so for a real home again, Polly, darling,' said Jinny, wiping her eyes. "'And how happy it will make me to fulfil his wish!' "'Don't let me feel unwelcome and an intruder, dear. I know I'm not nearly good enough for him, and he could have had the choice of ever such handsome women, but he's promised to be patient with me and to teach me everything I ought to know.' Polly's dismay at the turn of events yielded to a womanly sympathy with her friend. "'It's just like poor little Agnes and Mr. Henry over again,' was her private thought, for she could not picture John stooping to guide and instruct. But she had been touched on a tender spot— that of ambitious pride for those related to her, and she made what Mahony called a real turn of attempt to stand up to John, against her husband's express advice. For if your brother chooses to contract a misalliance of this kind, it's nobody's business but his own. Upon my word, though, Polly, if you don't take care, this house will get a bad name over the matches that are made in it. 
"'You'd better have your spare room boarded up, my dear.' Mahony was feeling particularly rasped by John's hoity-toity behaviour in this connection. Having been nursed back to health, John went about with his chin in the air, and hardly condescended to allude to his engagement, let alone talk it over with his relatives. So Mahony retired into himself. After all, the world of John's mind was so dissimilar to his own, that he didn't even care to know what went on in it. "'The fellow has been caught on the hop by a buxom form and a languishing eye,' was how he dismissed the matter in thought. "'I raise my wife to my own station, Mary, and you will greatly oblige me by showing Jane every possible attention,' was the only satisfaction Polly could get from John, made in his driest tone. Before the engagement was a week old, Tilly reappeared. She was to be married from their house on the hither side of Christmas. At first she was too full of herself and her own affairs to let either Polly or Jinny get a word in. Just to think of it, that old cabbage-grower Devine had gone and bought the block of land next to the one Mr. O was building on. She'd lay a bet he would put up a house the dead spit of theirs. Did anyone ever hear such cheek? At the news that was broken to her, the first time she paused for breath, she let herself heavily down on a chair. "'Well, I'm blowed!' was all she could ejaculate. "'Blowed! That's what I am!' But afterwards, when Jinny had left the room, she gave free play to a very real envy and regret. "'In all my life I never did! Jin to be Mrs. John! And as like as not the Honourable Mrs. John before she's done! Oh, Polly, my dear, why ever didn't I wait!' On being presented to John, however, she became more reconciled to her lot. "'He's got a temper, your brother has, or I'm very much mistaken. It won't be all beer and skittles for her ladyship, for Jin hasn't a scrap of spunk in her, Polly. She got so mopey the last year or two there was no doing anything with her. Now it was just the other way round with me. No matter how black things looked, I always kept my pecker up. Poor Ma used to say I grew more like her every day.' and at a still later date. No, Polly, my dear, I wouldn't change places with the future Mrs. T. After all, thank you, not for Joseph. I say, she'll need to mind her P's and Q's. For Tilly had listened to John explaining to Jinny what he expected of her, what she might and might not do, and had watched Jinny sitting meekly by and saying yes to everything. There was nothing in the way of the marriage. Indeed, did it not take place immediately, Jinny would have to look about her for a situation of some kind. And, said John, that was nothing for his wife. His house stood empty, he was very much in love, and pressed for the naming of the day. So it was decided that Polly should accompany Jinny to lodgings in Melbourne, help her choose her trousseau, and engage servants. Afterwards there would be a quiet wedding, by reason of Jinny's mourning, at which Richard, if he could possibly contrive to leave his patience, would give the bride away. Polly was to remain in John's house while the happy couple were on honeymoon to look after the servants. This arrangement would also make the break less hard for the child. Trotty was still blissfully unconscious of what had befallen her. She had learnt to say, new mamma, parrot-wise, without understanding what the words meant and meanwhile the fact that she was to go with her aunt for a long, exciting coach-ride filled her childish cup with happiness. As Polly packed the little clothes, she thought of the night, six years before, when the fat, sleeping babe had been laid in her arms. "'Of course it's only natural John should want his family around him again, but I shall miss the dear little soul,' she said to her husband, who stood watching her. "'What you need is a little one of your own wife.' "'Ah, don't I wish I had,' said Polly, and drew a sigh. "'That would make up for everything. Still, if it can't be, it can't.' A few days before the set time John received an urgent summons to Melbourne, and went on ahead, leaving Mahony suspecting him of a dodge to avoid travelling en famille. In order that his bride-elect should not be put to inconvenience, John hired four seats for the three of them. But he might just as well have saved his money, thought Polly, when she saw the coach. Despite their protest, they were packed like herrings in a barrel, had hardly enough room to use their hands. Altogether it was a trying journey. Jinny, worked on by excitement and fatigue, took a fit of hysterics. Trotty, frightened by the many rough strangers, cried and had to be nursed, and the whole burden of the undertaking lay on Polly's shoulders. She had felt rather timid about it before starting, but was obliged to confess she got on better than she expected. 
A kind old man sitting opposite, for instance, a splitter he said he was, actually undid Jinny's bonnet strings and fetched water for her at the first stoppage. Polly had not been in Melbourne since the year after her marriage, and was looking forward intensely to the visit. She went laden with commissions. Her lady friends gave her a list as long as her arm. Richard, too, had entrusted her to get him second-hand editions of various medical works as well as a new stethoscope. Thirdly, she had promised old Mr. Ocock to go to Williamstown to meet Miss Amelia, who even now was tossing somewhere on the Indian Ocean, and to escort the poor young lady up to Ballarat. Having seen them start, Mahony went home to drink his coffee and read his paper in a quiet that was new to him. John's departure had already eased the strain. Then Tilly had been boarded out at the Methodist minister's. Now, with the exit of Polly and her charges, a great peace descended on the little house. The rooms lay white and still in the sun, and though all doors stood open, there was not a sound to be heard but the buzzing of the blowflies around the sweets of the fly-traps. He was free to look as glum as he chose of a morning, if he had neuralgia, or to be silent when worried over a troublesome case. No longer would Miss Tilly's bulky presence and loud-voiced reiterations of her prospects grate his nerves, or John's full-blooded absorption in himself and poor foolish Jinny's quavering doubts whether she would ever be able to live up to so magnificent a husband offend his sense of decorum. Another reason he was glad to see the last of them was that in the long run he had rebelled at the barefaced way they made use of Polly, and took advantage of her good nature. She had not only cooked for them and waited on them, he had even caught her stitching garments for the helpless Jinny. This was too much. Such extreme obligingness on his wife's part seemed to detract from her personal dignity. He could never, though, have got Polly to see it. Undignified to do a kindness? What a funny, selfish idea! The fact was, there was a certain streak in Polly's nature that made her more akin to all these good people than to him. Him, with his unsociable leanings towards a hermit's cell, his genuine need of an occasional hour's privacy and silence, in which to think a few thoughts through to the end. On coming in from his rounds, he turned out an old linen jacket that belonged to his bachelor days, and raked up some books he had not opened for an almost equally long time. He also steered clear of friends and acquaintances, went nowhere, saw no one but his patients and Ellen, to whose cookery Polly had left him with many misgivings, took things easy. "'He's so busy reading he never knows what he puts in his mouth. I believe he'd eat his boot soles if I fried him up neat with a bit of parsley,' she reported over the back fence on Doctor's Odd Ways. During the winter months the practice had, as usual, fallen off. By now it was generally beginning to look up again, but this year, for some reason, the slackness persisted. He saw how lean his purse was whenever he had to take a banknote from it to enclose to Polly. There was literally nothing doing, no money coming in. Then he would restlessly lay his book aside, and drawing a slip of paper to him, set to reckoning and dividing. Not for the first time he found himself in the doctor's awkward quandary, how to be decently and humanly glad of a rise in the health rate. He had often regretted having held to the half-hundred shares he had bought at Henry Ocock's suggestion— had often spent in fancy the sum they would have brought in had he sold when they touched their highest figure. Such a chance would hardly come his way again. After the one fictitious flare-up, poorer punkers had fallen heavily. The first main prospect drive, at a depth of three hundred and fifty feet, had failed to strike the gutter, and nowadays they were not even quoted. Thus had ended his single attempt to take a hand in the great game. One morning he sat at breakfast and thought over his weekly epistle to Polly. In general this chronicled items of merely personal interest. The house had not yet been burnt down, her constant fear when absent. Another doctor had got the asylum. He himself stood a chance of being elected to the committee of the district hospital. Today, however, there was more to tell. The English mail had come in, and the table was strewn with foreign envelopes and journals. Besides the usual letters from relatives, one in a queer, illiterate hand had reached him, the address scrawled in purple ink on the cheapest notepaper. Opening it with some curiosity, Mahony found that it was from his former assistant, Long Jim. The old man wrote in a dismal strain. Everything had gone against him. His wife had died. He was out of work and penniless and racked with rheumatism. Oh, it was a cruel climate!' Did he stop in England, only the house remained to him, he'd end in a pauper's grave. 
but he believed if he could get back to a scrap of warmth and the sun he'd be good for some years yet. Now he'd always known Dr. Mahony for the kindest, most liberal of gentlemen, the happiest days of his life had been spent under him on the flat, and if he'd only give him a lift now there was nothing he wouldn't do to show his gratitude. Doctor knew a bit about him, too. Here he couldn't seem to get on with folk at all. They looked crooked at him, and just because he'd once been spunky enough to try his luck overseas. Mahony shored and smiled, then wondered what Polly would say to this letter. She it was who had been responsible for packing the old man off. Unfolding the star, he ran his eyes over its columns. He had gone at the chief local news and was skimming the mining intelligence, when he suddenly stopped short with an exclamation of surprise, and his grip on the paper tightened. There it stood, black on white. Poor Punkers had jumped to three pounds per share. What the dickens did that mean? He turned back to the front sheet to find if any clue to the claims or renewed activity had escaped him, but sought in vain. So bolting the rest of his breakfast, he hurried down to the town to see if on the spot he could pick up information with regard to the mysterious rise. The next few days kept him in a twitter of excitement. Porapunkas went on advancing, not by leaps and bounds as before, but slowly and steadily, and threw off a dividend. He got into bed at night with a hot head from wondering whether he ought to hold on or sell out, and inside a week he was off to consult the one person who was in a position to advise him. Henry Ocock's greeting resembled an embrace. It evidently means a fortune for him, and all trifling personal differences were forgotten in the wider common bond. The lawyer virtually ordered Mahony to sit in until he gave the word. By this time poor Punkers had passed their previous limit and even paid a bonus— it was now an open secret that a drive undertaken in an opposite direction to the first had proved successful. The lead was scored and seamed with gold. Ocock spoke of the stone, specimens of which he'd held in his hand, declared he'd never seen its equal. But when the shares stood at fifty-three pounds each, Mahony could restrain himself no longer, and in spite of Ocock's belief that another ten days would see a coup, he parted with forty-five of the half-hundred he held— Leaving the odd money with the lawyer for reinvestment, he walked out of the office the possessor of two thousand pounds. It was only a very ordinary late spring day, the season brought its light by the score. A pale azure sky, against which the distant hills looked purple, above these a narrow belt of cloud, touched in its curves to the same hue. But to Mahony it seemed as if such a perfect day had never dawned since he first set foot in Australia. His back was eased of its burden, and like Christian on having passed the walls known as salvation, he could have wept tears of joy. After all these years of pinching and sparing, he was out of poverty's grip. The suddenness of the thing was what staggered him. He might have drudged until his hair was grey. It was unlikely he would ever, at one stroke, have come into possession of a sum like this. And that whole day he went about feeling a little more than human, and seeing people, places, things— through a kind of beatific mist. Now, thank God, he could stand on his own legs again, could relieve John of his bond, pay off the mortgage on the house, insure his life before it was too late. And everything done, he would still have over a thousand pounds to his credit. A thousand pounds! No longer need he thankfully accept any and every call, or reckon sourly that if the leakage on the roof was to be mended, he must go without a new surtout. Best of all, he could now begin in earnest to save. First, though, he allowed himself two very special pleasures. He sent Polly a message on the electric telegraph to say that he would come down himself to fetch her home. In secret he planned a little trip to Snapper Point. At the time of John's wedding he had been unable to get free. This would be the first holiday he and Polly had ever had together. The second thing he did was to indulge the love of giving that was innate in him, and of giving in a somewhat lordly way. He enjoyed the broad grin that illumined Ellen's face at his unlooked-for generosity, Jerry's red stammered thanks for the gift of the cob the boy had long coveted. It did him good to put two ten-pound notes in an envelope and inscribe Ned's name on it. He'd never yet been able to do anything for these poor lads. He also, without waiting to consult Polly, fearing indeed that she might advise against it, sent off the money to Long Jim for the outward voyage, and a few pounds over. For there were superstitious depths in him, and at this turn in his fortunes it would surely be of ill omen to refuse the first appeal for help that reached him. 
Polly was so much a part of himself that he thought of her last of all. But then it was with moist eyes. She, who had never complained, should of a surety not come short. And he dropped asleep that night to the happy refrain, "'Now she shall have her piano, God bless her, the best that money can buy.'" End of Part 3 Chapter 11《パート4 Chapter 1 of Australia Felix》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson《パート4 Chapter 1 》The new house stood in Webster Street. It was twice as large as the old one, had a garden back and front, a veranda round three sides. When Mahony bought it, and the piece of ground it stood on, it was an unpretentious weatherboard in a rather dilapidated condition. The situation was good, though, without being too far from his former address, and there was stabling for a pair of horses. And by the time he had finished with it, it was one of those characteristically Australian houses, which, added to wherever feasible, without a thought for symmetry or design, a room built on here, a covered passage there, a bathroom thrown out in an unexpected corner, with odd steps up and down, have yet a spacious straggling comfort all their own. How glad he was to leave the tiny sun-baked box that until now had been his home! It had had neither blind nor shutter, and on his entering it of a summer midday it had sometimes struck hotter than outside. The windows of his new room were fitted with green venetians. Round the veranda posts twined respectively a banksia and a Japanese honeysuckle, which further damped the glare, while on the patch of buffalo grass in front stood a spreading fig tree that leafed well and threw a fine shade. He had also added a sofa to his equipment. Now, when he came in tired or with a headache, he could stretch himself at full length. He was lying on it at this moment. Polly, too, had reason to feel satisfied with the change. A handsome little broadwood with a ruby silk and carved wood front stood against the wall of her drawing-room. Gilt cornices surmounted the windows, and from the centre of the ceiling hung a lustre chandelier that was the envy of every one who saw it. Mrs. Henry Ocock's was not a patch on it, and yet it cost more. This time Mahony had virtually been able to give his wife a free hand in her furnishing, and in her new spare room she could put up no less than three guests. Of course these luxuries had not all rained on them at once. Several months passed before Polly, on the threshold of her parlour, could exclaim with an artlessness that touched her husband deeply, "'Never in my life did I think I should have such a beautiful room!' Still, as regarded money, the whole year had been a steady ascent. The nest egg he had left with the lawyer had served its purpose of chaining that old hen fortune to the spot. Ocock had invested and reinvested on his behalf. Now it was twenty kuinors, now thirty consolidated beehives, and Mahony was continually being agreeably surprised by the margins it threw off in its metamorphoses. That came of his having placed the matter in such competent hands. The lawyer had, for instance, got him finally out of Porapunkas in the nick of time. The reef had not proved as open to the day as was expected, and pulled him off in the process another three hundred odd. Compared with Ocock's own takings, of course, his was a modest spoil. The lawyer had made a fortune, and was now one of the wealthiest men in Ballarat. He had built not only new and handsome offices on the crest of the hill, but also, prior to his marriage, a fine dwelling-house standing in extensive grounds on the further side of Ewell's Swamp. Altogether it had been a year of great and sweeping changes. People had gone up, gone down, had changed places like children at a game of general post. More than one of Mahony's acquaintances had burnt his fingers. On the other hand, old Devine, Polly's one-time market-gardener, had made his thousands. There was actually talk of his standing for Parliament, in which case his wife bid fair to be received at Government House, and the pair of them with hardly an H between them. From the sofa where he lay, Mahony could hear the murmur of his wife's even voice. Polly sat at the further end of the veranda talking to Jinny, who dandled her babe in a rocking-chair that made a light tip-tap as it went to and fro. Jinny said nothing. She was no doubt sunk in adoration of her, or rather John's, infant, and Mahony all but dozed off under the full round tones he knew so well. In his case the saying had once more been verified, to him that hath should be given. Whether it was due to the better position of the new house, or to the fact that easier circumstances gave people more leisure to think of their ailments, or merely that money attracted money, whatever the cause, his practice had of late made giant strides. 
he was in demand for consultations, sat on several committees, while a couple of lodges had come his way as good as unsought. Against this he had one piece of ill-luck to set. At the close of the summer, when the hot winds were in blast, he had gone down under the worst attack of dysentery he had had since the early days. He really thought this time all was over with him. For six weeks, in spite of the tenderest nursing, he had lain prostrate, and as soon as he could bear the journey had to prescribe himself a change to the seaside. The bracing air of Queenscliff soon picked him up. He had, thank God, a marvellous faculty of recuperation. While others were still not done pitying him, he was himself again, and well enough to take the daily plunge in the sea that was one of his dearest pleasures. To feel the warm, stinging fluid lap him round after all those drowsy years of dust and heat— he could not have enough of it, and stayed so long in the water that his wife, sitting at a decent distance from the bathing enclosure, grew anxious and agitated her little white parasol. "'There's nothing to equal it, Mary, this side heaven,' he declared as he rejoined her, his towel about his neck. "'I wish I could persuade you to take a dip, my dear.' But Mary preferred to sit quietly on the beach. "'The dressing and undressing is such a trouble,' said she. As it was, one of her elastic sides was full of sand. Yes, Polly was merry now, and had been since the day Ned turned up again on Ballarat, accompanied by a wife and child. Mary was in Melbourne at the time, at John's nuptials. Mahony had opened the door himself to Ned's knock, and there, in a spring-cart, sat the frowsy red-haired woman who was come to steal his wife's name from her. This invasion was the direct result of his impulsive generosity— had he only kept his money in his pocket. He had been forced to take the trio in and give them house-room, but he bore the storming of his hard-won privacy with a bad grace, and Mary had much to gloss over on her return. She had been greatly distressed by her favourite brother's ill-considered marriage, for if they had not held Jinny to be John's equal, what was to be said of Ned's choice? Mrs. Ned had lived among the mining population of Castlemaine, where her father kept a public-house, and, said Richard, her manners were accordingly loud, slapdash, familiar. Before she had been twenty-four hours under his roof, she was bluntly addressing him as Marnie. There was also a peculiar streak of touchiness in her nature, goes with hair of that colour, my dear, which rendered her extremely hard to deal with. She had, it seemed, opposed the idea of moving to Ballarat. That was all in her favour, said Mary, and came primed to detect a snub or a slight at every turn. This morbid suspiciousness it was that led Mary to yield her rights in the matter of the name. The confusion between them was never-ending, and at the first hint that the change would come gracefully from her, Mrs. Ned had flown into a passion. "'It's all the same to me, Richard, what I'm called,' Mary soothed him. "'And don't you think Polly was beginning to sound rather childish, now I'm nearly twenty four? "'But, oh, what could Ned have seen in her?' she sighed to herself, dismayed for Mrs. Ned was at least ten years older than her husband, and whatever affection might originally have existed between them was now a thing of the past. She tyrannised mercilessly over him, nagging at him till Ned, who was nothing if not good-natured, turned sullen and left off tossing his child in the air. "'We must just make the best of it, Richard,' said Mary. "'After all, she's really fond of the baby. And when the second comes, you'll attend her yourself, won't you, dear?' I think somehow her temper may improve when that's over. For this was another thing. Mrs. Ned had arrived there in a condition that raised distressing doubts in Mary as to the dates of Ned's marriage and the birth of his first child. She did not read them to Richard, for it seemed to her only to make matters of this kind worse openly to speak of them. She devoted herself to getting the little family under a roof of its own. Through Richard's influence, Ned obtained a clerkship in a carrying agency, which would just keep his head above water, and she found a tiny three-roomed house that was near enough to let her be daily with her sister-in-law when the latter's time came. Meanwhile, she cut out and helped to sew a complete little outfit. What she had before was no better than rags. And Mrs. Ned soon learned to know on whom she could lean, and to whom she might turn, not only for practical aid— but also for a never-failing sympathy in what she called her troubles. "'I vow your Mary's the kindest-hearted little soul it's ever been me luck to run across,' she averred one day to Marnie, who was visiting her professionally. "'So common sense, too, no nonsense about her. I shouldn't have thought a gabby like Ned could have sported such a trump of a sister.' 
"'Another pensioner for your carrot, dear,' said Mahony, in passing on the verdict. What he did not grieve his wife by repeating were certain bad reports of Ned lately brought him by Jerry. According to Jerry, and the boy's word was to be relied on, Ned had kept loose company in Castlemaine, and had acquired the habit of taking more than was good for him. Did he not speedily amend his ways, there would be small chance of his remaining in his present post. Here Mahony was effectively roused by a stir on the veranda. Jinny had entered the house to lay down her sleeping babe, and a third voice, Purdy's, became audible. The wife had evidently brought out a bottle of her famous home-brewed ginger beer. He heard the cork pop, the drip of the overflow on the boards, the clink of the empty glass, and Purdy's warm words of appreciation. Then there was silence. Rising from the sofa, Mahony inserted himself between blind and window, and peeped out. His first thought was, what a picture! Mary wore a pale pink cotton gown which, over the light swellings of her crinoline, bulged and billowed around her, and generously swept the ground. Collar and cuffs of spotless lawn outlined neck and wrists. She bent low over her stitching, and the straight white parting of her hair intensified the ebony of the glossy bands. Her broad, pure forehead had neither line nor stain. On the trellis behind her a vine hung laden with massy branches of muscatels. Purdy sat on the edge of the veranda with his back to Mahony. Between thumb and forefinger he idly swung a pair of scissors. Urged by some occult sympathy, Mary at once glanced up and discovered her husband. Her face was lightly flushed from stooping, and the least touch of colour was enough to give its delicate ivory an appearance of vivid health. She had grown fuller of late, quite fat, said Richard, when he wished to tease her. A luxuriant young womanliness lay over and about her. Now, above the pale wild rose of her cheeks, her black eyes danced with a mischievous glee, for she believed her husband intended swinging his leg noiselessly over the sill, and creeping up to startle Purdy, and this appealed to her sense of humour. But as he remained standing at the window, she just smiled slyly, satisfied to be in communion with him over their unsuspecting friend's head. Here, however, Purdy brought his eyes back from the garden, and she abruptly dropped hers to her needlework. The scissors were shut with a snap, and thrown rather than laid to the other implements in the workbox. "'One would think you were paid to finish the wretched sewing in a fixed time, Polly,' said Purdy cantankerously. "'Haven't you got a word to say?' "'It's for the Dorcas Society. They're having a sale of work.' "'Oh, damn Dorcases! You're always slaving for somebody. You'll ruin your eyes. I wonder Dick allows it. I shouldn't. I know that.' The peal of laughter that greeted these words came equally from husband and wife, then. "'What the dickens does it matter to you, sir, how much sewing my wife chooses to do?' cried Mahony, and, still laughing, stepped out of the window. "'Hello, you there,' said Purdy, and rose to his feet. "'What a beastly fright to give one!' He looked red and sulky. "'I scored that time, a boy,' and, linking his arm in Mary's, Mahony confronted his friend. "'Afraid I'm neglecting my duties, are you? Letting this young woman spoil her eyes? Turn em on him, my love, in all their splendour, that he may judge for himself.' "'Nonsense, Richard,' said Mary softly, but with an affectionate squeeze of his arm. "'Well, ta-ta, I'm off,' said Purdy. And as Mahony still continued to quiz him, he added in a downright surly tone, "'Just the same old dick as ever, blinder than any bat to all that doesn't concern yourself.' I'll eat my hat if it's ever entered your noddle that Polly's quite the prettiest woman on Ballarat. Don't listen to him, Richard, please, and don't let your head be turned by such fulsome flattery, my dear, were husband and wife's simultaneous exclamations. I shouldn't think so, said Mary sturdily, and would have added more, but just at this minute Jinny came out of the house with the peculiar noiseless tread she had acquired in moving around an infant's crib, and Purdy vanished. Jinny gazed at her sister-in-law with such meaning that Mary could not but respond. "'Did you get her safely laid down, dear?' "'Perfectly, Mary, without even the quiver of an eyelash. You recollect I told you yesterday, when her little head touched the pillow, she opened her eyes and looked at me. Today there was nothing of that sort. It was quite perfect.' And Jinny's voice thrilled at the remembrance. It was as if, in continuing to sleep during the transit, her, or rather John's tiny daughter, had proved herself a marvellous sagacity. Mahony gave an impatient shrug in Jinny's direction, but he too had to stand fire. 
She had been waiting all day for a word with him. The babe, who was teething, was plagued by various disorders, and Jinny knew each fresh pin's head of a spot that joined the rash. Mahony made light of her fears, then turning to his wife asked her to hurry on the six o'clock dinner. He had to see a patient between that meal and tea. Mary went to make arrangements. Richard always forgot to mention such things until the last moment, and also to please Jinny by paying a visit to the baby. "'Ah, the angels can't look very different when they sleep, I think,' murmured its mother, hanging over the couch. When Mary returned, she found her husband picking caterpillars off the vine. Long Jim, odd man now about house and garden, was not industrious enough to keep the pests under. In this brief spell of leisure, such moments grew ever rarer in Richard's life, husband and wife locked their arms and paced slowly up and down the veranda. It was late afternoon in a breathless, pale-skied February day, and the boards of the flooring gritted with sandy dust beneath their feet. "'He was grumpy this afternoon, wasn't he?' said Mary, without preamble. "'But I've noticed once or twice lately that he can't take a joke any more. He's grown queer altogether. Do you know he's the only person who still persists in calling me by my old name? He was quite rude about it when I asked him why. Perhaps he's liverish from the heat. It might be a good thing, dear, if you went around and overhauled him. Somehow it seems unnatural for Purdy to be bad-tempered.' "'It's true he may be a bit out of sorts, but I fear the evil's deeper-seated. It's my opinion the boy is tiring of regular work. Now that he hasn't even the excitement of the gold escort to look forward to, and has been a rolling stone from the beginning, you know. If only he would marry and settle down, I do wish I could find a wife for him. The right woman could make anything of Purdy. And yet once more Mary fruitlessly scanned in thought the lists of her acquaintance. What if it's a case of sour grapes, love, since the prettiest woman on Ballarat is no longer free? Oh, Richard, hush, such foolish talk! But is it? Let me look at her. "'Well, if not the prettiest, at least a very pretty person indeed. "'It certainly becomes you to be stouter, wife.' "'But Mary had not an atom of vanity in her. "'Speaking of prettiness reminds me of something that happened at the races last week. "'I forgot to tell you at the time. "'There were two gentlemen there from Melbourne, "'and as Agnes Ocock went past, one of them said out loud, "'Gad, that's a lovely woman!' "'Agnes heard it herself and was most distressed.' and the whole day, wherever she went, they kept their field-glasses on her. Mr. Henry was furious. "'If you'll allow me to say so, my dear, Mrs. Henry cannot hold a candle to someone I know, to my mind at least. "'If I suit you, Richard, that's all I care about. "'Well, to come back to what we were saying, my advice is give Master Purdy a taste of the cold shoulder the next time he comes hanging about the house. "'Let him see his ill-temper didn't pass unnoticed.' "'There's no excuse for it. "'God bless me, doesn't he sleep the whole night through in his bed?' "'And Mahony's tone took on an edge. "'The broken nights that were nowadays the rule with himself "'were the main drawbacks to his prosperity. "'He'd never been a really good sleeper, "'and in consequence was one of those people "'who feel an intense need for sleep "'and suffer under its curtailment. "'As things stood at present, "'his rest was wholly at the mercy of the night-bell.' a remorseless instrument, given chiefly to peeling just as it managed to drop off. Its gentlest tinkle was enough to rouse him, long before it had succeeded in penetrating the ears of the groom who was supposed to open, and when it remained silent for a night, some trifling noise in the road would simulate its jangle in his dreams. "'It's a wonder I have any nerves left,' he grumbled, as the hot red dawns crept in at the sides of the bedroom window." for the shortening of his sleep at one end did not mean that he could make it up at the other. All that summer he'd fallen into the habit of waking at five o'clock and not being able to doze off again. The narrowest bar of light on the ceiling, the earliest twitter of the sparrows, was enough to strike him into full consciousness, and Mary was hard put to it to darken the room and ensure silence, and would be till the day came when he could knock off work and take a thorough holiday. This he promised himself to do before he was very much older. End of Part 4, Chapter 1《Part 4, Chapter 2 of Australia Felix • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson • Part 4, Chapter 2 • Mary sat with pencil and paper and wrinkled her brows. 
she was composing a list, and every now and then, after an inward calculation, she lowered the pencil to note such items as three tipsy cakes, four trifles, eight jam sandwiches. John Turnham had run up from Melbourne to fetch home wife and child, and his relatives were giving a musical card party in his honour. By the window Jinny sat on a low ottoman suckling her babe, and paying but scant heed to her sister-in-law's deliberations. To her it seemed a much more important matter that the milk should flow smoothly down the precious little throat, than that Mary's supper should be a complete success. With her free hand she imprisoned the two little feet, working one against the other in slow enjoyment, or followed the warm little limbs up inside the swaddling after the fashion of nursing mothers. The two women were in the spare bedroom, which was dusk and cool and dimity white, and they exchanged remarks in a whisper, for the lids had come down more than once on the big black eyes, and now only lifted automatically from time to time to send a last look of utter satiation at the mother-face. Mary always said, "'She'll drop off sooner indoors, dear,' but this was not the whole truth. Richard had hinted that he considered the seclusion of the house better suited to the business of nursing than the comparative publicity of the veranda, for Jinny was too absorbed in her task to take thought of the proprieties. Here now she sat, she had grown very big and full since her marriage, in the generous wide-lapped pose of some old Madonna. Mary, thrown entirely on her own judgment, was just saying with decision, "'Well, better to err on the right side and have too much than too little,' and altering a four into a five, when steps came down the passage and John entered the room. Jinny made him a sign, and John, now Commissioner of Trade and Customs, advanced as lightly as could be expected of a heavy, well-grown man. "'Does she sleep?' he asked. His eyes had flown to the child. Only in the second place did they rest on his wife. At the sight of her free and easy bearing his face changed, and he said stiffly, "'I think, Jane, a little less exposure of your person, my dear.' Flushing to her hair-roots, Jinny began as hastily as she dared to rearrange her dress. Mary broke a lance on her behalf. "'We were quite alone, John,' she reminded her brother, "'not expecting a visit from you,' and added, "'Richard says it's high time baby was weaned. Jinny is feeling the strain.' "'As long as this rash continues, I shall not permit it,' answered John, riding roughshod over even Richard's opinion. "'I shouldn't agree to it either, John, dear,' murmured Jinny. "'And now, Mary, a word with you about the elder children. I understand that you're prepared to take Emma back. Is that so?' Yes, Mary was pleased to say Richard had consented to Trotty's return, but he would not hear of her undertaking Johnny. At eleven years of age the proper place for a boy, he said, was a grammar school— with Trotty, of course, it was different. I always found her easy to manage, and should be more than glad to have her. And Mary meant what she said. Her heart ached for John's motherless children. Jinny's interest in them had lasted only so long as she had none of her own, and Mary, who being childless, had kept a large heart for all little ones, marvelled at the firm determination to get rid of her stepchildren, which her sister-in-law, otherwise so pliable, displayed. Brother and sister talked things over, intuitively meeting half-way, understanding each other with a word as only blood relations can. Jinny, the chief person concerned, sat meekly by, or chimed in merely to echo her husband's views. "'By the way, I ran into Richard on Specimen Hill,' said John, as he turned to leave the room, "'and he asked me to let you know that he would not be home to lunch.' "'There, if that isn't always the way,' exclaimed Mary. "'As sure as I cook something he specially likes, he doesn't come in. "'Tilly sent me over the loveliest little sucking-pig this morning. "'Richard would have enjoyed it.' "'You should be proud, my dear Mary, that his services are in such demand.' "'I am, John. No one could be prouder. "'But all the same, I wish he would manage to be a little more regular with his meals. "'It makes cooking so difficult. "'Tomorrow, because I shan't have a minute to spare, "'he'll be home punctually, demanding something nice.' "'But I warn you, to-morrow you'll all have to picnic.' However, when the day came, she was better than her word, and looked to it that neither guests nor husband went short. Since a couple of tables on trestles took up the dining-room, John and Marnie lunched together in the surgery, while Jinny's meal was spread on a tray and sent to her in the bedroom. Mary herself had time only to snatch a bite standing. From early morning on, tied up in a voluminous apron, she was cooking in the kitchen, very hot and flowery and preoccupied, 
drawing grating shelves out of the oven, greasing tins and patty-pans, dredging flour. The click-clack of egg-beating resounded continuously, and mountains of sponge-cakes of all shapes and sizes rose under her hands. This would be the largest, most ambitious party she had ever given. The guests expected numbered between twenty and thirty, and had, besides, carte blanche to bring with them anyone who happened to be staying with them, and it would be a disgrace under which Mary, reared in Mrs. Beamish's school, could never again have held up her head, had a single article on her supper-table run short. In all this she had only such help as her one maid servant could give her. John had expressly forbidden Jinny the kitchen. True, during the morning Miss Amelia Ocock, a gentle little elderly body with a harmless smile and a prominent jaw, who was now an inmate of her father's house, together with Zara returned from England and a visitor at the Ocock's, these two walked over to offer their aid in setting the tables. But Miss Amelia, fluttery and undecided as a bird, was far too timid to do herself justice, and Zara spent so long arranging the flowers in the central aperns that before she had finished with one of them it was lunch-time. "'I could have done it myself while she was cutting the stalks,' Mary told her husband. "'But Zara hasn't really been any good at flowers since her mixed bouquet took first prize at the flower-show. Of course, though, it looks lovely now it's done.' Purdy dropped in during the afternoon and was more useful. He sliced the crusts off low fi mounds of sandwiches, and tested the strength and flavour of the claret-cup. Mary could not make up her mind, when it came to the point, to follow Richard's advice and treat him coldly. She did, however, tell him that his help would be worth a great deal more to her, if he talked less and did not always look for an answer to what he said. But Purdy was not to be quashed. He had taken it into his head that she was badly treated, in being left to slave alone within the oven's radius, and he was very hard on Jinny, whom he espied comfortably dandling her child on the front veranda. "'I'd like to wring the bloomin' kid's neck!' "'Purdy, for shame!' cried Mary, outraged. "'It's easy to see you're still a bachelor.' "'Just wait, sir, till you have children of your own.' Under her guidance he bore stacks of plates across the yard to the dining-room, where the blinds were lowered to keep the room cool, and strewed these and corresponding knives and forks up and down the tables. He also carried over the heavy soup tureen in which was the claret-cup. But he had a man's slippery fingers, and between these and his limp Mary trembled for the fate of her crockery. He made her laugh, too, and distracted her attention, and she was glad when it was time for him to return to barracks. "'Now come early to-night,' she admonished him, "'and mind you bring your music. Miss Amelia's been practising up that duet all the week. She'll be most disappointed if you don't ask her to sing with you.' On the threshold of the kitchen Purdy set his fingers to his nose in the probable direction of Miss Amelia, then performed some skittish female twists and turns about the yard. "'So harsh, love, a bad cold, not in voice!' Mary laughed afresh, and ordered him off. But when he had gone she looked grave, and out of an oddly disquieting feeling said to herself, "'I do hope he'll be on his best behaviour to-night, and not tread on Richard's toes.' As it was, she had to inform her husband of something that she knew would displease him. John had come back in the course of the afternoon, and announced, without ceremony, that he had extended an invitation to the Divines for the evening. "'It's quite true what's being said, dear.' Mary strove to soothe Richard as she helped him make a hasty toilet in the bathroom. "'Mr. Devine is going to stand for Parliament, and he's promised his support, if he gets in, to some measure John has at heart. John wants to have a long talk with him to-night.' But Richard was exceedingly put out. "'Well, I hope, my dear, that as it's your brother who has taken such a liberty, you'll explain the situation to your guests. I certainly shall not.' but I do know there was no need to exclude Ned and Polly from such an omnium gatherum as this party of yours will be. Even while he spoke there came a rat-a-tat at the front door, and Mary had to hurry off. And now knock succeeded knock with the briefest of intervals, the noise carrying far in the quiet street. Mysteriously bunched-up figures, their heads veiled in the fleeciest of clouds, were piloted along the passage, and, "'I hope we're not the first was murmured by each newcomer in turn. The gentlemen went to change their boots on the back veranda, the ladies to lay off their wraps in Mary's bedroom. And soon this room was filled to overflowing with the large, soft abundance of crinoline, hoops swaying from this side to that, as the guests gave place to one another before the looking-glass, where bands of hair were smoothed and the catches of bracelets snapped. Music-cases lay strewn over the counterpane. 
the husbands who lined up in the passage to wait for their wives also bearing rolls of music. Mary, in black silk with a large cameo brooch at her throat, and only a delicate pink on her cheeks to tell of all her labours, moved helpfully to and fro, offering a shoehorn, a hand-mirror, pins and hairpins. She was caught as she passed Mrs. Henry Ocock, a modishly late arrival, by that lady's plump white hand, and a whispered request to be allowed to retain her mantle. "'Henry was really against my coming, dearest. So anxious, so absurdly anxious.' "'And pray, where's the Honourable Mrs. T. to-night?' inquired old Mrs. Ocock, rustling up to them. Tilly was the biggest and most handsomely dressed woman in the room. "'On her knees worshipping, I bet you, up to the last minute, or else not allowed to show her nose till the Honourable John's got his studs in. Now then, girls, how much longer are you going to stand preening and prinkin'? The girls were Zara, at this present a trifle passé, and Miss Amelia, who was still further from her prime, and gathering the two into her train as a hen does its chickens, Tilly swept them off to face the ordeal of the gentlemen in the drawing-room. Mary and Agnes brought up the rear. Mr. Henry was on the watch, and directly his wife appeared, wheeled forward the best armchair, and placed her in it, with her footstool under her feet. Mary planted Jinny next her, and left them to their talk of nurseries. For Richard's sake she wished to screen Agnes from the vulgarities of Mrs. Devine. Herself she saw with dismay on entering that Richard had already been pounced on by the husband. There he stood, listening to his ex-greengrocer's words. They were interlarded with many an awkward and familiar gesture. On his face an expression his wife knew well, while one small impatient hand tugged at his whiskers. But old Mrs. Ocock came to his rescue, bearing down upon him with an outstretched hand, and a howdy-do that could be heard all over the room. Tilly had long forgotten that she had ever borne him a grudge. She, it was, who could now afford to patronise. "'I hope I see you well, doctor. Oh, not a bit of it. I left him at home. Mr. O has something wrong, if you please, with his leg or his big toe, gout or rheumatiz or something of that sort, and he's been so crabby with it for the last day or so that to-night I said to him, "'No, my dear, you'll just take a glass of hot toddy and go early and comfortable to your bed.' Musical parties aren't in his line, anyhow. A lively clatter of tongues filled the room, the space of which was taxed to its utmost. There were present, beside the friends and intimates of the house, several of Marnie's colleagues, a couple of bank managers, the police magistrate, the postmaster, the town clerk, all with their ladies. Before long, however, ominous pauses began to break up the conversation, and Mary was accomplished hostess enough to know what these meant. At a sign from her, Jerry lighted the candles on the piano, and thereupon a fugue-like chorus went up. "'Mrs. Marney, won't you play something? Oh, do! Yes, please do! I should enjoy it so much!' Mary did not wait to be pressed. It was her business to set the ball rolling, and she stood up and went to the piano as unconcernedly as she would have gone to sweep a room or make a bed. Placing a piece of music on the rack, she turned down the corners of the leaves. But here Archdeacon Long's handsome, weather-beaten face looked over her shoulder. "'I hope you're going to give us the cannons, Mrs. Marnie,' he said genially. And so Mary obliged him by laying aside the morceau she had chosen, and setting up instead a battle-piece that was a general favourite. "'Aha! That's the ticket,' said Henry Ocock, and rubbed his hands as Mary struck up pianissimo the march that told of the enemy's approach. "'And bumpity bump 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 Archdeacon Long could not refrain from underlining each fresh salvo of artillery, while, "'There's a breach in their walls for em was Chinnery of the London Chartered's contribution to the stock of fun. Mahony stood on the hearthrug and surveyed the assembly. His eyes fled Mrs. Devine, most unfortunately perched on an ottoman in the middle of the room, where she sat purple, shiny, and beaming, two hot, fat red hands clasped over her stomach. "'Like a heathen idol! Confound the woman! I shall have to go and do the polite to her!' And sought Mary at the piano, hanging with pleasure on the slim form in the rich silk dress. This caught numberless lights from the candles, as did also the wings of her glossy hair. He watched, with a kind of amused tenderness, how at each forte passage head and shoulders took their share of lending force to the tones. He never greatly enjoyed Mary's playing. She did well enough at it, God bless her. It would not have been Mary if she hadn't. But he came of a musical family. His mother had sung Handel faultlessly in her day, besides having a mastery of several instruments, and he was apt to be critical. 
Mary's firm, capable hands looked out of place on a piano, seemed to stand in a sheerly business relation to the keys. Nor was it otherwise with her singing. She had a fair contralto, but her ear was at fault, and he sometimes found himself swallowing nervously when she attacked high notes. "'Oh, doctor, your wife do play the piano lovely,' said Mrs. Devine, and her fat front rose and fell in an ecstatic sigh. "'Richard, dear, will you come?' Mary laid her hands on his shoulder. Their guests were clamouring for a duo. Her touch was a caress. Here he was, making himself as pleasant as he knew how to this old woman. When it came to doing a kindness, you could rely on Richard. He was all bark and no bite. Husband and wife blended their voices. Mary had been at considerable pains to get up her part, and then Richard went on to a solo. He had a clear, true tenor that was very agreeable to hear, and Mary felt quite proud of his attainments. Later in the evening he might be persuaded to give them a reading from Boz or a recitation. At that kind of thing he had not his equal. But first there was a cry for his flute, and in vain did Mahony protest that weeks had elapsed since he last screwed the instrument together. He got no quarter, even from Mary, but then Mary was one of those inconvenient people to whom it mattered not a jot what a fool you made of yourself, as long as you did what was asked of you. And so, from memory, and unaccompanied, he played from the old familiar air of the minstrel boy. The theme in his rendering was overlaid by florid variations, and cumbered with senseless repetitions, but none the less the wild, wistful melody went home, touching even those who were not musical to thoughtfulness and retrospect. The most obstinate chatterers, whom neither sham battles nor Balf and Brockley had silenced, held their tongues, and Mrs. Devine openly wiped her eyes. Oh, the minstrel boy to the wars has gone, in the ranks of death you'll find him. While it was proceeding, Mary found herself seated next John. John tapped his foot in time to the tune, and under the cover of the applause at its close remarked abruptly, You should fatten Richard up a bit, Mary. He could stand it. From where they sat they had Richard in profile, and Mary studied her husband critically, her head a little on one side. "'Yes, he is rather thin, but I don't think he was ever meant to be fat.' "'Ah, well, we are none of us as young as we used to be,' was John's tribute to the power of music, and throwing out his stomach he leaned back in his chair and plugged the armholes of his vest with his thumbs. And now, after due pressing on the part of host and hostess, the other members of the company advanced upon the piano, either singly or in couples, to bear a hand in the burden of entertainment. Their seeming reluctance had no basis in fact, for it was an unwritten law that every one who could must add his might, and only those who literally had not a note of music in them were exempt. Tilly took a mischievous pleasure in announcing bluntly, "'So sorry, my dear, not to be able to do you a tool de rule. But when the Honourable Mrs. T. and I were nippers, we'd no time to loll around pianos, nor any pianos to loll around. This, just to see her brother-in-law's dark skull, for no love, not even a liking, was lost between her and John. But with this handful of exceptions, all nobly towed the line. Ladies with the tiniest reeds of voices, which shook like reeds, warbled of last roses and prairie flowers. Others, with more force but due decorum, cried to Willie that they had missed him, or coyly confessed to the presence of silver threads among the gold. And Mrs. Chinnery, an old young woman with a long lean neck, which she twisted this way and that in the exertion of producing her notes, declared her love for an old armchair. The gentleman, in baritones and profundos, told the amorous adventures of Ben Bolt, or desired to know what home would be without a mother. Purdy spiced the hour with a comic song, and in the character of an outraged wife tickled the risibility of the ladies. "'Well, well, sir, so you've come at last. I thought you'd come no more. I've waited with my bonnet on from one till half-past four. Zara and Mrs. Long both produced home they brought her warrior dead from their portfolios, so Zara good-naturedly gave way, and struck up Robert Trois Cagem, which she had added to her repertory while in England. No one could understand a word of what she sang, but the mere fitting of the foreign syllables to the appropriate notes was considered a feat in itself, and corroborative of the high gifts Zara possessed. Strenuous efforts were needed to get Miss Amelia to her feet. She was dying, as Mary knew, to perform her duet with Purdy, but when the moment came she put forward so many reasons for not complying that most people retired in despair. 
it took Mary to persevere. And finally the little woman was persuaded to the piano, where, red with gratification, she sat down, spread her skirts, and unclasped her bracelets. "'Poor little Amelia,' said Mary to herself, as she listened to a romantic ballad in which Purdy, in the character of a high-minded nobleman, sought the hand of a virtuous gypsy-maid. "'And he doesn't give her a second thought, if one could just tell her not to be so silly.' Not only had Purdy never once looked near Amelia, for the most part he had sat rather mum-chance halfway in and out of a French window, even Zara's attempts to enliven him falling flat, but during an extra-loud performance Tilly had confided to Mary the family's plans for their spinster relative. And the poor little woman, thought Mary again as she listened for after having been tied for years to the sick-bed of a querulous mother, after braving the long sea-voyage which for such a timid soul was full of ambushes and terrors, Miss Amelia had reached her journey's end, only to find both father and brother comfortably wived and with no use for her. Neither of them wanted her. She had been given house-room first by her father, then by the Henrys, and once more had to go back to the paternal roof. "'It was nothing for Monsieur Henry in the long run,' was his stepmother's comment, but she laughed good-humouredly as she said it, for, his first wrath at her intrusion over, Henry had more or less become her friend, and now maintained that it was not a bad thing for his old father to have a sensible managing woman behind him. Tilly had developed in many ways since her marriage, and Henry and she mutually respected each other's practical qualities. The upshot of the affair was, she now told Mary, that Miss Amelia's male relatives had subscribed a dowry for her. It was me that insisted Henry should pay his share, him get in all the money he did with Agnes. And Amelia was to be married off to, Well, if you turn your head, my dear, you'll see who, back there, helping to hold up the doorpost. Under cover of Zara's roulades, Mary cautiously looked around. It was Henry's partner, young Grindle, now on the threshold of the thirties. His side whiskers a shade less flamboyant than of old, a heavy watch chain draped across his front. Grindle stood and lounged with his hands in his pockets. Mary made round eyes. "'Oh, but Tilly, isn't it very risky? He's so much younger than she is. Suppose she shouldn't be happy?' "'That'll be all right, Mary, trust me. Only give her a handle to her name, and Amelia would be happy with any one. She hasn't that much backbone in her. Besides, my dear, you think she's over forty. Let her take her chance and be thankful. Tisn't every old maid would get such an offer.' "'And is—is is he agreeable?' asked Mary, still unconvinced. Tilly half-closed her right eye and protruded the tip of her tongue. "'You could stake your last fiver on it. He is.' But now that portion of the entertainment devoted to art was at an end, and the serious business of the evening began. Card-tables had been set out, for Lou as for less hazardous games. In principle, Mahony objected to the high play that was the order of the day, but if you invited people to your house, you could not ask them to screw their points down from crowns to halfpence. They would have thanked you kindly, and have stayed at home. Here at the loo tables, places were eagerly snapped up, Henry Ocock and his stepmother being among the first to secure seats. Both were keen, hard players, who invariably relined their well-filled pockets. It would not have been the thing for either Mahony or his wife to take a hand. Several of the guests held aloof. John had buttonholed old Divine. Ginny and Agnes were still lost in domesticities. Dear little Agnes had grown so retiring of late, thought Mary, she quite avoided the society of gentlemen, in which she had formerly taken such pleasure. Richard and Archdeacon Long sat on the veranda, and in moving to and fro Mary caught a fragment of their talk. They were at the debatable question of table-turning, and her mental comment was a motherly and amused— that Richard, who is so clever, can interest himself in such nonsense. Further on, Zara was giving Grindle an account of her voyage home, and ticking off the reasons that had led her to return. She sat across a hammock, and daintily exposed a very neat ankle. "'It was much too sleepy and dull for me. Now I've quite decided to spend the rest of my days in the colony.' Mrs. Devine was still perched on her ottoman. She beamed at her hostess. "'No, I don't know one card from another, dearie, and don't want to. "'Oh, my dear, what a lovely party it has been, and how oh, well you've carried it off!' Mary nodded and smiled, but with an air of abstraction. The climax of her evening was fast approaching. 
Excusing herself, she slipped away, and went to cast a last eye over her supper-tables, up and down which benches were ranged, borrowed from the Sunday school. To her surprise, she found herself followed by Mrs. Devine. "'Do let me help you, my dear, do now. I feel that stiff and silly sitting stuck up there with me hands before me, and just send that young feller about his business.' So Purdy and his offers of assistance were returned with thanks to the card-room, and Mrs. Devine pinned up her black silk front. But not until she had freely vented her astonishment at the profusion of Mary's good things. "'How do you get them to rise so?' "'No, I never did. Fit for Buckingham Palace and Queen Victoria, and all by your little self, too, my dear. I must give you a good hug.' Hence, when at twelve o'clock the company began to stream in, they found Mrs. Devine installed behind the barricade of cups, saucers, and glasses, and it was she who dispensed tea and coffee and ladled out the claret-cup, thus leaving Mary free to keep an argus eye on her visitors' plates. At his entry, Richard had raised expostulating eyebrows, but his tongue, of course, was tied, and Mary made a lifelong friend. And now, for the best part of an hour, Mary's sandwiches, sausage rolls and meat pies, her jam rolls, pastries and lemon sponges, her jellies, custards and creams, her blanc and jaune marges and whipped syllabubs, her trifles, tipsy cakes and charlotte russes, formed the theme of talk and objects of attention and though the ladies picked with becoming daintiness, the gentlemen made up for their partner's deficiencies, and there was none present who did not, in the shape of a hearty and well-turned compliment, add yet another laurel to Mary's crown. End of Part 4 Chapter 2Part four, chapter three. It had struck two before the party began to break up. The first move made, however, the guests left in batches, escorting one another to their respective house doors. The Henry Ocock's buggy had been in waiting for some time, and Mrs. Henry's pretty head was drooping with fatigue before Henry, who was in the vein, could tear himself from the card table. Mahony went to the front gate with them, then strolled with the longs to the corner of the road. He was in no hurry to retrace his steps. The air was balmy after that of the overcrowded rooms, and it was a fabulously beautiful night. The earth lay steeped in moonshine, as in the light of a silver sun. Trees and shrubs were patterned to their last leaf on the ground before them. What odd mental twist made mortals choose rather to huddle indoors by puny candlelight than to be abroad laving themselves in a splendour such as this? Leaning his arms on the top rail of a fence, he looked across the slope at the flat, now hushed and still as the encampment of a sleeping army. Beyond, the bush shimmered palely grey. In his younger years he had been used, on a night like this, when the moon sailed full and free, to take his gun and go opossuming. Those two old woody gods, Warren Heap and Buninyong, stood out more imposingly than by day, but the rangers seemed to have retreated. The light lay upon them like a visible burden, flattening their contours, filling up clefts and fissures with a milky haze. "'Good evening, doctor.' Spoken in his very ear, the words made him jump. He had been lost in contemplation, and the address had a ghostly suddenness. But it was no ghost that stood beside him, nor indeed was it a night for those presences to be abroad, whose element is the dark. Ill-pleased at the intrusion, he returned but a stiff nod— then, since he could not in decency greet and leave taken a breath, feigned to go on for a minute with his study of the landscape, after which he said, "'Well, I must be moving. Good night to you.' "'So you're off your sleep, too, are you?' As often happens, the impulse to speak was a joint one. The words collided. Instinctively, Mahony shrank into himself. This familiar bracketing of his person with another's was distasteful to him. Besides, the man who had sprung up at his elbow bore a reputation that was none of the best. The owner of a small chemist's shop on the flat, he contrived to give offence in sundry ways. He was irreligious, an infidel, his neighbours had it, and of a Sabbath would scour his premises or hoe potatoes rather than attend church or chapel. Though not a confirmed drunkard, he had been seen to stagger in the street and be unable to answer when spoken to. Also, the woman with whom he lived was not generally believed to be his lawful wife. Hence the public fought shy of his nostrums, and it was a standing riddle how he managed to avoid putting up his shutters. More nefarious practices, no doubt, said the relentless vox populi. 
Seen near at hand, he was a tall, haggard-looking fellow of some forty years of age, the muscles on his neck standing out like those of a skinny old horse. Here his gratuitous assumption of a common bond drew a cold, "'Pray, what reason have you to think that?' from Mahony, and without waiting for a reply he again said good-night and turned to go. The man accepted the rebuff with a meekness that was painful to see. "'Thought coming on you like this you were a case like my own. No offence, I'm sure.' he said humbly. It was evident he was well used to getting the cold shoulder. Mahony stayed his steps. "'What's the matter with you?' he asked. "'Aren't you well? There's a remedy to be found for most ills under the sun.' "'Not for mine. The doctor isn't born, or the drug discovered that would cure me.' The tone of bragging bitterness grated anew. Himself given to the vice of overstatement, Mahony had small mercy on it in others. "'Tut-tut!' he deprecated. There was a brief silence before the speaker went on more quietly. "'You're a young man, doctor. I'm an old one.' And he looked old as he spoke. Mahony saw that he had erred in putting him down as merely elderly. He was old and grey and down at hill, fifty of a day, and his clothes hung loose on his bony frame. "'You'll excuse me if I say I know better than you. When a man's done, he's done, and that's me. Yes?' He grew inflated again in reciting his woes. "'I'm one of your hopeless cases, just as surely as if I was being eaten up by a cancer or a consumption. To mend me, you doctors would need to start me afresh from the mother egg.' "'You exaggerate, I'm sure.' "'It's that. Knowing one's played out, with by right still a good third of one's life to run. That's what puts the sleep away. In the daylight it's none so hard to keep the black thoughts under. Themselves they're not so daresome. And there's one's pipe and the haver of the young fry. But night's the time. Then they come trampling along, a whole army of them, carrying banners with letters a dozen feet high, so's you shan't miss remembering what you'd give your soul to forget. And so it'll go on, etc., ad lib, till it pleases the old joker who sits grinning up aloft to put his heel down, as you or me would squash a bull ant or a scorpion. You speak bitterly, Mr. Tangy. "'Does a night like this not bring you calmer, clearer thoughts?' And Mahony waved his arm in a large, loose gesture at the sky. His words passed unheeded. The man he addressed spun round and faced him with a rusty laugh. "'Ark at that!' he cried. "'Just ark at it! Why, in all the years I've been in this godforsaken place, long as I've been here, I've never yet heard my own name properly spoken. You're the first, Doctor. You shall have the medal.' "'But, man alive, you surely don't let that worry you. "'Why, I've the same thing to put up with every day of my life. "'I smile at it.' "'And Mahony believed what he said, "'forgetting in the antagonism such spleen aroused in him "'the annoyance the false stressing of his own name could sometimes cause him. "'So did I once,' said Tangy, and wagged his head. "'But the day came when it seemed the last straw, "'a bit of mean spite on the part of this hell of a country itself. "'You dislike the colony, it appears, intensely.' "'You like it?' The counter-question came tip for tap. "'I can be fair to it, I hope, and appreciate its good sides.' As always, the mere hint of an injustice made Mahony passionately just. "'Came here of your own free will, did you? Weren't crowded out at home, or bamboozled by a pack of lying tales?' Tangy's voice was husky with eagerness. "'That I won't say either, but it is entirely my own choice that I remain here.' "'Well, I say to you, think twice of it. "'If you have the chance of getting away, take it. "'It's no place, this doctor, for the likes of you and me. "'Haven't you never turned and asked yourself "'what the devil you were doing here? "'And that reminds me. "'There was a line we used to have drummed into us at school. "'It's often come back to me since. "'Coelum non animum mutant qui trans mare current. "'In our green days we gabbled that off by rote.' Then it seemed just one more of the eel-slick phrases the classics are full of. Now I take off my hat to the man who wrote it. He knew what he was talking about. By the Lord Harry, he did. The Latin had come out tentatively, with an odd, unused intonation. Mahony's retort, "'How on earth do you know what suits me and what doesn't?' died on his lips. He was surprised into silence. There had been nothing in the other's speech to show that he was a man of any education, rather the reverse.' Meanwhile, Tangy went on. "'I grant you it's an antiquated point of view, but doesn't that go to prove what I've been saying? That you and me are old-fashioned, too, out of place here, out of date. The modern sort, the sort that gets on in this country, is a prime man at cutting his coat to suit his cloth. 
for all that the stop at homes, like the writer of that line and other ancients, prate about the Ethiopian's eyed or the leopard in his spots, they didn't buy their experience dear like we did. Didn't guess that if a man don't learn to fit himself in, when he gets set down in a land such as this, he's a goner. Any more than they knew that most of those who hold out here, all of them at any rate who've climbed the ladder, nabbed the plunder, have found no more difficulty in changing their spots than they have their trousers. Yes, doctor, there's only one breed that flourishes, and you don't need me to tell you which it is. Here they lie, and he nodded to right and left of him, dreaming of their money-bags and their dividends and their profits, and how they'll diddle and swindle one another afresh soon as the sun gets up to-morrow. Harder and nails they are, and sharp as needles. You ask me why I do my walking out in the night-time, it's so's to avoid the sight of their mean little eyes and their greedy, grasping faces. Mahony's murmured disclaimer fell on deaf ears. Like one who had been bottled up for months, Tangy flowed on. What a life! What a set! What a place to end one's days in! Remember, if you can, the yarns that were spun around it for our benefit from twenty thousand safe miles away? It was the land of promise and plenty, top full of gold, strewn over with nuggets that only waited for hands to pick em up. Lies, lies from beginning to end. I say to you, this is the hardest and cruelest country ever created, and a man like me is no more good here than the muck, the parents and stale fish guts and other leavens that knocks about a harbour and washes against the walls. I'll tell you, the only use I'll have been here, doctor, when my end comes, I'll dung some bit of land for em with my moulder and rot, that's all. They'll do better with my sort if they knocked us on the head betimes, and boiled us down for our fat and marrow. Not much in that line to be got from your carcass, my friend, thought Mahony, with an inward smile. But Tangy had paused merely to draw breath. "'What I say is, instead of laying snares for us, it ought to be forbid by law to give men of my make ship-room. At home in the old country we'd find our little nook and jog along decently to the end of our days. But just the staid, respectable, orderly sort I belong to's neither needed nor wanted here. I fall to thinking sometimes on the fates of the hundreds of honest, steady-going lads, who at one time or another have chucked up their jobs over there for this.' The drink, no doubt, took most. They never knew before that one could sweat as you sweat here. And the rest? Well, just accident, or the sun, or dysentery, or the bloody toil that goes by the name of work in these parts. You know the list, doctor, better than me. They say the waste of life in a new country can't be helped. Doesn't matter. Has to be. But that's cold comfort to the wasted. Now, I say to you, there ought to be an act of Parliament to prevent young fellows squandering themselves, throwing away their lives, as I did mine. For when we're young, we're not sane. Youth's a fever of the brain. And I was young once, though you mightn't believe it. I had straight joints and no pouch under my chin, and my full share of windy hopes. A oh, senseless truck, these, to be spilled overboard, bit by bit, like on a hundred-mile tramp, a new chum finishes by pitching from his swag all the needless rubbish he started with. What's wanted to get on here is something quite else. Horny palms and costive bowels, more in a dash of the sharper, and no sickly squeamishness about knocking out other men and stepping into their shoes. And I was only an ordinary young chap, not over-strong or over-shrewd, but honest. Honest by God I was. That didn't count. It even stood in my way for I was too good for this, and too mealy-mouthed for that, and while I stuck considering the fairness of a job, someone who didn't care a damn whether it was fair or not walked in over my head and took it from me. There isn't anything I haven't tried my luck at, and with everything it's been the same. Nothing's prospered, the money wouldn't come, or stick if it did. And so here I am, all that's left of me, it isn't much, and by and by a few rank weeds'll spring from it. And old Joey there, who's paid to grub around the graves, old Joey'll curse and say, A weedy fellow that, a rotten weedy blackguard, and spit on his hands and hoe till the weeds lie bleeding their juices. The last heirs of me, the last issue of my loins. Pray, does it never occur to you, you fool, that flowers may spring from you? He had listened to Tangy's diatribe in a white heat of impatience, but when he spoke he struck an easy tone. Nor was he in any hesitation how to reply, for that he had played devil's advocate all too often with himself in private. An unlovely country, yes, as Englishmen understood beauty, 
and yet not without a charm of its own. An arduous life, certainly, and one full of pitfalls for the weak or the unwary. Yet he believed it was no more impossible to win through here, and with clean hands, than anywhere else. To generalise, as his companion had done, was absurd. Preposterous, too, the notion that those of their fellow-townsmen, who had carried off the prizes, owed their success to some superiority in bodily strength, or sharp dealing, or thickness of skin. With Mr. Tangy's permission he would cite himself as an example. He was neither a very robust man, nor, he ventured to say, one of any marked ability in the other two directions. Yet he had managed to succeed, without, in the process, sacrificing jot or tittle of his principles, and to-day he held a position that any member of his profession across the seas might envy him. "'Yes, but till you got there,' cried Tangy, "'hasn't every superfluous bit of you, every thought of interest that wasn't essential to the daily grind, been pared off?' "'If,' said Mahony, stiffening, "'if what you mean by that is, have I allowed my mind to grow narrow and sluggish, I can honestly answer no.' In his heart he denied the charge even more warmly, for, as he spoke, he saw the great cork-slabs on which hundreds of moths and butterflies made dazzling spots of colour saw the sheets of pink blotting-paper between which his collection of native plants lay pressed, the glass case filled with geological specimens, his Bible, the margins of which round Genesis were black with his handwriting, a pile of books on the new marvel spiritualism, Colenso's Pentateuch, the big black volumes of the Arcana Coelestia, Locke on Miracles. He saw all these things and more. No, I'm glad to say I've retained many interests outside my work. Tangy had taken off his spectacles, and was polishing them on a crumpled handkerchief. He seemed about to reply, even made a quick half-turn towards Mahony, then thought better of it, and went on rubbing. A smile played around his lips. "'And in conclusion, let me say this,' went on Mahony, not unnettled by his companion's expression. "'It's sheer folly to talk about what life makes of us. Life is not an active force. It's we who make what we will of life.' And in order to shape it to the best of our powers, Mr. Tangy, to put our brief span to the best possible use, we must never lose faith in God or our fellow men, never forget that whatever happens there is a sky with stars in it above us. "'Ah, there's a lot of bunkum talked about life,' returned Tangy dryly, and settled his glasses on his nose. "'And as man gets near the end of it, he sees just what bunkum it is.' "'Life's only got one meaning, Doctor, seen plain. "'There's only one object in everything we do, "'and that's to keep a sound roof over our heads "'and a bite in our mouths, "'and in those of the helpless creatures who depend on us. "'The rest has no more sense or significance "'than a nigger's hammering on the tam-tam. "'The lucky ones of this world don't grasp it, "'but we others do, "'and after all, perhaps it's worth while having gone through it "'to have got at one bit of the truth, however small. "'Good night.' He turned on his heel, and before his words were cold in the air, had vanished, leaving Mahony blankly staring. The moonshine still bathed the earth, gloriously untroubled by the bitterness of human words and thoughts. But the night seemed to have grown chilly, and Mahony gave an involuntary shiver. "'Someone walking over my—now, what would that specimen have called it? Over the four by eight my remains will one day manure.' "'An odd, abusive, wrong-headed fellow,' he mused, as he made his way home. Who would ever have thought, though, that the queer little chemist had so much in him? A failure? Yes, he was right there, and as unlovely as failures always are at close quarters. But as he laid his hands on the gate, he jerked up his head and exclaimed half aloud, "'God bless my soul! What he wanted was not argument or reason, but a little human sympathy.' As usual, however, the flash of intuition came too late. For such a touchy nature, I am certainly extraordinarily obtuse where the feelings of others are concerned, he told himself as he hooked on the latch. "'Why, Richard, where have you been?' came Mary's clear voice, muted so as not to disturb John and Jinny, who had retired to rest. Purdy and she sat waiting on the veranda. "'Were you called out? We've had time to clear everything away. Here, dear, I saved you some sandwiches and a glass of claret. I'm sure you didn't get any supper yourself with looking after other people.' Long after Mary had fallen asleep, he lay wakeful. His foolish blunder in response to Tangy's appeal rankled in his mind. He could not get over his insensitiveness. How he had boasted of his prosperity, his moral nicety, his saving pursuits! He to boast! When all that was asked of him was a kindly, "'My poor fellow-soul! 
You have indeed fought a hard fight, but there is a God above us who will recompense you at his own time. Take the word of one who has also been through the slough of despond. And then just these, these hobbies of his, of which he had made so much. Now that he was alone with himself, he saw them in a very different light. Lepidoptera, collected years since, were still unregistered, plants and stones unclassified. His poor efforts at elucidating the Bible waited to be brought into line with the higher criticism. Holmes' levitations and fire-tests called for investigation, while the leaves of some of the books he had cited had never even been cut. The mere thought of these things was provocative, rest-destroying. To induce drowsiness he went methodically through the list of his acquaintances, and sought to range them under one or other of Tangy's headings. And over this there came moments when he lapsed into depths, fetched himself up again but with an effort, only to fall back. But he seemed barely to have closed his eyes when the night-bell rang. In an instant he was on his feet in the middle of the room, applying force to his sleep-clogged wits. He threw open the sash. "'Who's there? What is it?' "'Henry Ocock's groom. "'I was to fetch you to our place at once, Governor. "'But is Mrs. Henry taken ill?' "'Not as I know of,' said the man dryly. "'But her and the boss had a bit of a tiff on the way home, "'and Madam's excited like.' "'And am I to pay for their tiffs?' muttered Marney hotly. "'Hush, Richard, he'll hear you,' warned Mary, and sat up. "'I shall decline to go. Henry's a regular old woman.' Mary shook her head. "'You can't afford to offend the Henrys. And you know he's so hasty. He'll call in someone else on the spot, and you'd never get back. If only you hadn't stayed out so long, dear, looking at the moon.' "'Good God, Mary, is one never to have a moment to oneself? Never a particle of pleasure or relaxation?' "'Why, Richard!' expostulated his wife, and even felt a trifle ashamed of his petulance. "'What would you call to-night, I wonder? Wasn't the whole evening one of pleasure and relaxation?' And Mahony, struggling into shirt and trousers, had to admit that he would be hard put to it to give it another name. End of Part 4 Chapter 3Part 4, Chapter 4 of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part 4, Chapter 4. Hush, Dolly, mustn't cry and make a noise. Uncle Richard's cross. Trotty sat on a hassock and rocked a china babe, with all the appurtenant mother fuss she had picked up from the tending of her tiny stepsister. The present Trotty was a demure little maid of some seven summers, who gave the impression of having been rather rudely elongated. Her flaxen hair was stiffly imprisoned behind a round black comb, and her big blue eyes alone remained to her from a lovely infancy. "'Poor Emma's eyes,' said Mary. Imitative as a monkey, she went on, with a child's perfect knowledge that it is all make-believe, yet with an entire credence in the power of make-believe. "'Naughty child, will you be quiet? There, you've thrown your counterpane off now. Wonder what next you'll do. I declare I'll slap you soon. You make me so cross.' Through the surgery window the words floated out, "'For goodness' sake, don't bother me now with such trifles, Mary. It's not the moment, with a whole string of people waiting in the other room. Well, if only you'll be satisfied with what I do, dear, and not blame me afterwards. Get Purdy to give you a hand with Ned's affair. He has time and to spare.' And wetting his fingertip, Marney nervously flipped over a dozen pages of the book that lay open before him. "'Well, if you think I should,' said Mary, with a spice of doubt. "'I do. And now go, wife, and remember to shut the door after you. Oh, and tell that woman in the kitchen to stop singing. Her false notes drive me crazy. How many are there this morning?' Eight, no, nine, if that's another,' replied Mary, with an ear to the front door. "'I'll have to stop, then,' and Marnie clapped to the work he had been consulting. "'Never a minute to keep abreast of the times. But that's a good helpful wife, as Mary stooped to kiss him. "'Do the best you can, Mavornin, and never mind me.' "'Take me with you, Auntie. Trotty sprung up from her stool, overturning babe and cradle. "'Not to-day, darling. Besides, why are you here? You know I've forbidden you to be on the front veranda when the patients come. Run away to the back and play there.' Mary donned hat and shawl, opened her parasol, and went out into the sun. With the years she had developed into a rather stately young woman. She held her head high, and walked with a firm, free step. 
Her first visit was to the stable to find Long Jim, or Old Jim, as they now called him, for he was nearing the sixties. The notice to leave, which he had given the day before, was one of the trifles it fell to her to consider. Personally, Mary thought his going would be no great loss. He knew nothing about a garden, yet resented instruction, and it had always been necessary to get outside help in for the horses. If he went, they could engage someone who would combine the posts. But Richard had taken umbrage at the old man's tone, had even been nervously upset over it. It behoved her to find out what the matter was. "'I want a change,' said old Jim, dourly, in response to her inquiry, and went on polishing wheel-spokes and making the wheel fly. "'I've been here too long, and now I've got a bit of brass together, and I'm thinking I'd like to be my own master for a spell.' "'But at your age, Jim, is it wise, to throw up a comfortable home just because you've laid a little past?' "'It's enough to keep me. I turned over between four and five hundred last week in pie-crusts.' "'Oh!' said Mary, taken by surprise. "'Then that—that's your only reason for wishing to leave?' And as he did not reply, but went on swishing, "'Come, Jim, if you've anything on your mind, say it out. The doctor didn't like the way you spoke to him last night.' At this the old man straightened his back, took a straw from between his teeth, spat, and said, "'Well, if you must know, Mrs. Marney, the doctor's not the boss it pleases me to be under any more, and that's the truth. I'm tired of it, dog-tired.' You can slave your head off for him, and he never notices the thing you do, or if he does, it's only to find fault. It ain't human, I say, and I'll be danged if I stand it any longer. But people who came to Mary with criticism of Richard got no mercy. You're far too touchy, Jim. You know, if any one does, how rushed and busy the doctor is, and you ought to be the first to make allowance for him. After all, he's done for you. You wouldn't be here now if it hadn't been for him and then to expect him to notice and praise you for every little job you do. But Jim was stubborn. He didn't want to deny anything, but he'd rather go, and this day a week, if it suited her. "'It's really dreadful how uppish the lower classes get as soon as they have a little money in their pocket,' she said to herself as she walked the shadeless sandy road. But this thought was like a shadow cast by her husband's mind on hers, and was ousted by the more indigenous— but after all, who can blame him, poor old fellow, for wanting to take life easy if he has the chance? She even added, he might have gone off, as most of them do, without a word. Then her mind reverted to what he had said of Richard, and she pondered the antagonism that had shown through his words. It was not the first time she had run up against this spirit, but, as usual, she was at a loss to explain it. Why should people of old Jim's class dislike Richard as they did, find him so hard to get on with? He was invariably considerate of them, and treated them very generously with regard to money. And yet, for some reason or other, they felt injured by him, and thought and spoke of him with a kind of churlish resentment. She was not clever enough to find the key to the riddle. It was no such simple explanation as that he felt himself too good for them. That was not the case. He was proud, certainly, but she had never known any one who, under it was true a rather sarcastic manner, was more broadly tolerant of his fellow-men. And she wound up her soliloquy with the lame admission, "'Yes, in spite of all his kindness, I suppose he is queer, decidedly queer.' And then she heaved a sigh. "'What a pity it was, when you knew him to be at heart such a dear, good, well-meaning man!' A short walk brought her to the four-roomed cottage where Ned lived with wife and children, or had lived till lately. He had been missing from his home now for over a week. On the last occasion of his being in Melbourne with the carrying van, he had decamped, leaving the boy who was with him to make the return journey alone. Since then nothing could be heard of him, and his billet in the agency had been snapped up. "'Oh, so they say,' said his wife, with an angry sniff. "'I don't believe a word of it, Mary. Since the railway's come, Biz has gone to the dogs, and they're only too glad to get the chance of sacking another man.' Polly looked untidier than ever. She wore a slatternly wrapper, and her hair was thrust unbrushed into its net. But she suffered, no doubt, in her own way. She was red-eyed and very hasty-handed with her nest full of babes. Sitting in the cheerless parlour, Ned's dark-eyed eldest on her knee, Mary strove to soothe and encourage. But it has never been much of a home for the poor boy, was her private opinion, and she pressed her cheek affectionately against the little black curly head that was a replica of Ned's own. "'What's going to become of us all the Lord only knows,' said Polly, 
after having had the good cry the sympathetic presence of her sister-in-law justified. "'I'm not a brown cent troubled about Ned, only boiling with him. He's off on the booze, sure enough, and he'll turn up again safe and sound like loose fish always do. Wait till I catch him, though. He'll get it hot.' "'We never ought to have come here,' she went on, drying her eyes. "'Drat the place and all that's in it, that's what I say. "'He did better in this in Castle Main, and I'd pa behind me there.' "'But once Richard had sent him that twenty quid, he'd no rest till he got away. "'And I thought, when he was so set on it, maybe it'd have a good effect on him to be near you both. "'But that was just another shot into the brown. "'You've been A1, Mary, you've done your level best. "'But Richard's never treated Ned fair.' I don't want to take Ned's part. He's nothing in the world but a pretty-faced noodle. But Richard treated him as if he was the dirt under his feet, and Ned's felt it. Oh, I know whose doing it was we were never asked up to the house when you'd company. It wasn't yours, my dear. But we can't all have hyphens to our names and go driving around with kid gloves on our hands and our noses in the air. Mary felt quite depressed by this fresh attack on her husband. Reminding herself, however, that Polly was excited and overwrought, she did not speak out the defence that leapt to her tongue. She said staunchly, "'As you put it, Polly, it does seem as if we haven't acted rightly towards Ned. But it wasn't Richard's doing alone. I've been just as much to blame as he has.' She sat on, petting the fractious children and giving kindly assurances. As long as she and Richard had anything themselves, Ned's wife and Ned's children should not want.' and as she spoke she slipped a substantial proof of her words into Polly's unproud hand. Besides, she believed there was every chance now of Ned soon being restored to them, and she told how they were going that very morning to invoke Mr. Smith's aid. Mr. Smith was in the police, as Polly knew, and had influential friends among the force in Melbourne. By to-morrow there might be good news to bring her. Almost an hour had passed when she rose to leave. Mrs. Ned was so grateful for the visit and the help that out in the narrow little passage she threw her arms around Mary's neck and drew her to her bosom. Holding her thus, after several hearty kisses, she said in a mysterious whisper, with her lips close to Mary's ear, "'Mary, love, may I say something to you?' And the permission granted went on, "'That is, give you a bit of an int, dearie.' "'Why, of course you may, Polly.' "'Sure you won't feel hurt, dear?' "'Quite sure. What is it?' and Mary disengaged herself that she might look the speaker in the face. "'Well, it's just this. You mentioned the name yourself, or I wouldn't have dared. It's young Mr. Smith, Mary. My dear, in future don't you have him quite so much about the house as you do at present? It ain't the thing. People will talk, you know, if you give em a handle.' "'Oh, but Polly!' in a blank voice from Mary. "'Now, now, I'm not blaming you, not the least tiddlywink. "'But there's no harm in being careful, is there, love, "'if you don't want your name in people's mouths? "'I'm that fond of you, Mary. "'You don't mind me speaking, dearie?' "'No, Polly, I don't. "'But it's the greatest nonsense. "'I never heard such a thing,' said Mary hotly. "'Why, Purdy's Richard's oldest friend. "'They were schoolboys together.' "'Maybe they were. "'But I hear he's mostly up at your place when Richard's out. "'And you're a young and pretty woman, my dear.' "'It's Richard who ought to think of it, and he's so much older than you. "'Well, just take the int, love. "'It comes best, don't it, from one of the family?' "'But Mary left the house in a sad flurry, "'and even forgot for street lengths to open her parasol. "'Her first impulse was to go straight to Richard, "'but she had not covered half a dozen yards "'before she saw that this would never do. "'At the best of times Richard abominated gossip, and the fact of it having, in the present case, dared to fasten its fangs in someone belonging to him, would make him doubly wroth. He might even try to find out who had started the talk, and get himself into hot water over it. Or he might want to lay all the blame on his own shoulders, make himself the reproaches Ned's Polly had not spared him. Worse still, he would perhaps accuse Purdy of inconsiderateness towards her, and fly into a rage with him, and then the two of them would quarrel, which would be a thousand pities. For though he often railed at Purdy, yet that was only Richard's way, he was genuinely fond of him, and unbent to him as to nobody else. But these were just so many pretexts put forward to herself by Mary for keeping silence. The real reason lay deeper. Eight years of married life had left her, where certain subjects were concerned, with all the modesty of her girlhood intact. There were things, indelicate things, which could not be spoken out, even between a husband and wife. For her to have to step before Richard and say, 
"'Someone else feels for me in the same way as you, my husband, do, "'would make her ever after unable, frankly, to meet his eyes, "'besides giving the vague, cobwebby stuff a body it did not deserve. "'But yet again this was not the whole truth. "'She had another, more uncomfortable side of it to face, "'and the flies buzzed unheeded around her head. "'The astonishment she had shown at her sister-in-law's warning "'had not been altogether sincere.' Far down in her heart, Mary found a faint, faint trace of complicity. For months past, she could admit it now, she had not felt easy about Purdy. Something disagreeable, disturbing, had crept into their relations. The jolly, brotherly manner she liked so well had deserted him. Besides, short-timbered, he had grown deadly serious, and not the stupidest woman could fail altogether to see what the matter was. But she had wilfully bandaged her eyes— and if, now and then, some word or look had pierced her guard, and disquieted her in spite of herself, she had left it at an incredulous, "'Oh, but then! But even if! In that case!' She now saw her fervent hope had been that the affair would blow over without coming to anything, proved to be just another passing fancy on the part of the unstable Purdy. How many had she not assisted at? This very summer, for instance, a charming young lady from Sydney had stayed with the Urquhart's, and as long as her visit lasted they had seen little or nothing of Purdy. Whenever he got off duty he was at Yurangabilly. As it happened, however, Mr. Urquhart himself had been so assiduous in taking his guest about that Purdy had had small chance of making an impression. And in looking back on the incident, what now rose most clearly before Mary's mind was the way in which Mrs. Urquhart— poor thing, she was never able to go anywhere with her husband. Either she had a child in arms, or another coming, the row of toddlers mounted up in steps. The way in which she had said with her pathetic smile, "'Ah, my dear, will he need someone gayer and stronger than I am for company?' Mary's heart had been full of pity at the time for her friend's lot, and it swelled again now at the remembrance. But, oh, dear, this was straying from the point— Impatiently she jerked her thoughts back to herself and her own dilemma. What ought she to do? She was not a person who could sit still with folded hands and await events. How would it be if she spoke to Purdy herself, talked seriously to him about his work, tried to persuade him to leave Ballarat? Did he mean to hang on here for ever, she would say, never intend to seek promotion? But then again the mere questioning would cause a certain awkwardness— while at the slightest trip or blunder on her part, what was unsaid might suddenly find itself said, and the whole thing cease to be the vague, cloudy affair it was at present. And though she would actually rather this happened with regard to Purdy than Richard, yet, yet— Worried and perplexed, unable to see before her the straight, plain path she loved, Mary once more sighed from the bottom of her heart. "'Oh, if only men wouldn't be so foolish!' Left to himself, Mahony put away his books, washed his hands, and summoned one by one to his presence the people who waited in the adjoining room. He drew a tooth, dressed a wounded wrist, prescribed for divers internal disorders, all told a baker's dozen of odd jobs. When the last patient had gone, he propped open the door, wiped his forehead, and read the thermometer that hung on the wall. It marked a hundred and two degrees. Dejectedly he drove in fancy along the glaring treeless roads, inches deep in cinnamon-coloured dust. How one learned to hate the sun out here! What he wouldn't give for a cool, grey-green Irish day, with a wet wind blowing in from the sea! A day such as he had heedlessly squandered hundreds of in his youth! Now it made his mouth water only to think of them! It still wanted ten minutes to ten o'clock, and the buggy had not yet come round. He would lie down and have five minutes' rest before starting. He'd been up most of the night, and on getting home had been kept awake by neuralgia. When an hour later Mary reached home, she was amazed to find groom and buggy still drawn up in front of the house. "'Why, Molina, what's the matter? Where's the doctor?' "'I'm sure I don't know, Mrs. Marney. I've hollered to Biddy half a dozen times, but she doesn't take any notice. And the mare's that restless. There, there, steady, old girl, steady now.' "'It's these damn flies!' Mary hurried indoors. "'Why, Biddy!' "'Sure, and it's yourself,' said the big Irish woman, who now filled the kitchen billet. "'Faith, and though you scold me, Mrs. Marney, I couldn't bring it over me heart to wake him, the poor man sleeping like a saint.' 
"'Biddy, you ought to know better,' cried Mary, peeling off her gloves. "'It's pale as the daddy is. "'Rubbish, it's only the reflection of the green blind. "'Richard, do you know what the time is?' "'But the first syllable of his name was enough. "'Oh, good Lord, Mary, I must have dropped off. "'What the dickens! Come, help me, wife. "'Why on earth didn't those fools wake me?' "'Mary held his driving coat, fetched hat and gloves, "'while he flung the necessaries into his bag. "'Have you much to do this morning?' "'Oh, that post-mortem's at twelve, isn't it?' "'Yes, and a consultation with months at eleven. "'I'll just manage it and no more,' muttered Mahony, with an eye on his watch. "'I can't let the mare take it easy this morning. "'Yes, a full day. "'And Henry Ocock's fidgeting for second opinion "'thinks his wife's not making enough progress. "'Well, ta-ta, sweetheart. "'Don't expect me back to lunch.' "'And taking a short cut across the lawn, "'he jumped into the buggy, and off they flew.' Mary's thoughts were all for him at this moment. "'How proud we ought to feel,' she said to herself. "'That makes the second time in a week old months has sent for him. "'But how like Henry Ocock,' she went on with puckered brow. "'It's quite insulting after the trouble Richard has put himself to. "'If Agnes' case puzzles him, I should like to know who will understand it better. "'I think I'll go and see her myself this afternoon. "'It can't be her wish to call in a stranger.' Not till some time after did she remember her own private embarrassment, and by then the incident had taken its proper place in her mind, had sunk to the level of insignificance to which it belonged. Such a piece of nonsense was her final verdict, as if I could worry Richard with it, when he has so many really important things to occupy him. End of Part 4 Chapter 4《パート4チャプター5 of Australia Felix》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson《パート4チャプター5 Yes, those were palmy days. The rate at which the practice spread astonished even himself. No slack seasons for him now. Winter saw him as busy as summer, and his chief ground for complaint was that he was unable to devote the meticulous attention he would have wished to each individual case. It would need the strength of an elephant to do that but it was impossible not to feel gratified by the many marks of confidence he received, and if his work had but left him some leisure for study and an occasional holiday, he would have been content. But in these years he was never able to get his neck out of the yoke, and Mary took her annual jaunts to Melbourne and Sea Breezes alone. In a long talk they had with each other, it was agreed that, except in an emergency, he was to be chary of entering into fresh engagements. This referred in the first place to confinements, of which his book was always full, and secondly to outlying bush-cases, the journey to and from which wasted many a precious hour. And where it would have been impolitic to refuse a new and influential patient, someone on his list, a doubtful payer or a valetudinarian, was gently to be let drop. And it was Mary who arranged who this should be. Some umbrage was bound to be given in the process, but with her help it was reduced to a minimum for Mary knew by heart all the links and ramifications of the houses at which he visited, knew precisely who was related to whom, by blood or marriage or business, knew where offence might with safety be risked and where it would do him harm. She had also a woman's tact in smoothing things over. A born doctor's wife, declared Mahony in grateful acknowledgment. For himself he could not keep such fiddling details in his head for two minutes on end. But though he thus succeeded in setting bounds to his activity, he still had a great deal too much to do, and in tired moments, or when Tick plagued him, thought the sole way out of the impasse would be to associate someone with him as partner or assistant. And once he was within an ace of doing so, chance throwing what he considered a likely person across his path. In attending a coroner's inquest, he made the acquaintance of a member of the profession who was on his way from the Ovens district, a coach journey of well over two hundred miles, to a place called Walwalla, a day's ride to the west of Ballarat. And since this was a pleasant-spoken man and intelligent, though with a somewhat down-at-heel look, besides being a stranger to the town, Mahony impulsively took him home to dinner. In the evening they sat and talked. The visitor, whose name was Wakefield, was considerably Mahony's senior. By his own account he had had but a rough time of it for the past couple of years. A good practice which he had worked up in the seaport of Warrnambool had come to an untimely end. He did not enter into the reasons for this. "'I was unfortunate. Had a piece of ill luck,' was how he referred to it. 
and knowing how fatally easy was a trip in diagnosis, a slip of the scalpel, Mahony tactfully helped him over the illusion. From Warrnambool, Wakefield had gone to the extreme north of the colony, but the eighteen months spent there had nearly been his undoing. Money had not come in badly, but his wife and family had suffered from the great heat, and the scattered nature of the work had worn him to skin and bone. He was now casting about him for a more suitable place. He could not afford to buy a practice, must just creep in where he found a vacancy. And Walwalla, where he understood there had never been a resident practitioner, seemed to offer an opening. Mahony felt genuinely sorry for the man, and after he had gone sat and revolved the idea, in the event of Walwalla proving unsuitable, of taking Wakefield on as his assistant. He went to bed full of the scheme and broached it to Mary before they slept. Mary made big eyes to herself as she listened. Like a wise wife, however, she didn't press her own views that night while the idea bubbled hot in him, for at such times, when some new project seemed to promise the millennium, he stood opposition badly. But she lay awake, telling off the reasons she would put before him in the morning, and in the dark allowed herself a tender, tickled little smile at his expense. "'What a man he is for loading himself up with the wrong sort of people,' she reflected, and then afterwards he gets tired of them and impatient with them, as is only natural. At breakfast she came back on the subject herself. In her opinion he ought to think the matter over very carefully. Not another doctor on Ballarat had an assistant, and his patients would be sure to resent the novelty. Those who sent for Dr. Mahony would not thank you to be handed over to goodness knows who. Besides, Richard, as things are now, the money wouldn't really be enough, would it? And just as we have begun to be a little easy ourselves, I'm afraid you'd miss many comforts you've got used to again, dear, she wound up, with a mental glance at the fine linen and smooth service Richard loved. Yes, that was true, admitted Mahony with a sigh, and being this morning in a stale mood, he forthwith knocked flat the card-house it had amused him to build. Himself he had only half believed in it, or believed so long as he refrained from going into prosaic details. There was work for two, and money for one. That was the crux of the matter. Successful as the practice was, it still did not throw off a thousand a year. Bad debts ran into a couple of hundred annually, and their improved style of living, the expenses of house and garden, of horses and vehicles, the men-servants, the open house they had to keep, swallowed every penny of the rest. Saving was actually harder than when his income had been but a third of what it was at present. New obligations beset him. For one thing, he had to keep pace with his colleagues, make a show of being just as well to do as they. Retrenching was out of the question. His patients would at once imagine that something was wrong, the practice on the downgrade, his skill deserting him, and take their ailments and their fees elsewhere. No, the more one had, the more one was forced to spend, and the few odd hundreds for which Henry Ocock could yearly be counted on came in very handy. As a rule, he laid these by for Mary's benefit, for her visits to Melbourne, her bonnets and gowns. It also let her satisfy the needs of her generous little heart in matters of hospitality. Well, it was perhaps not fair to lay the whole blame of their incessant and lavish entertaining at her door. He himself knew that it would not do for them to lag a foot behind other people. Hence the day on which he would be free to dismiss the subject of money from his mind seemed as far off as ever. He might indulge wild schemes of taking assistant or partner. The plain truth was he could not afford even the sum needed to settle on a locum tenens for three months while he recuperated. Another, and equally valid, reason was that the right man for a locum was far to seek. As time went on, he found himself pushed more and more into a single branch of medicine— one, too, he had never meant to let grow over his head in this fashion. For it was common medical knowledge out here, that given the distances and the general lack of conveniences, thirty to forty maternity cases per year were as much as a practitioner could with comfort take in hand. His books for the past year stood at over a hundred. The night-work this meant was unbearable, infants showing a perverse disinclination to enter the world except under cover of the dark. His popularity, if such it could be called, with the other sex was something of a mystery to him, for he had not one manner for the bedside and another for daily life. He never sought to ingratiate himself with people or to wheedle them, still less would he stoop to bully or intimidate. It was always by preference the adviser rather than the dictator. And men did not greatly care for this arm's-length attitude. They wrote him down haughty and indifferent, and pinned their faith to a blunter, homelier manner. 
but with women it was otherwise, and these also appreciated the fact that no matter what their rank in life, their age, or their looks, he met them with the deference he believed due to their sex. Exceptions there were, of course. Affectation or insincerity angered him. With the Zaras of this world he had scant patience, while among the women themselves, some few, Ned's wife, for example, felt resentment at his very appearance, his gestures, his tricks of speech. But the majority were his staunch partisans, and it was becoming more and more the custom to engage Dr. Mahony months ahead, thus binding him fast. And though he would sometimes give Mary a fright by vowing that he was going to throw up mid and be done with it, Yet her ambition, and what an ambitious wife she was, no one but himself knew, that he should some day become one of the leading specialists on Ballarat, seemed not unlikely of fulfilment, if his health kept good, and if he could possibly hold out. For there still came times when he believed that to turn his back for ever on place and people would make him the happiest of mortals. For a time this idea had left him in peace, now it haunted him again perhaps because he had at last grasped the unpalatable truth that it would never be his luck to save. If saving were the only key to freedom, he would still be there, still chained fast, and though he lived to be a hundred. Certain it was he did not become a better colonist as the years went on. He had learned to hate the famous climate, the dust and drought and brazen skies, the drenching rains and bottomless mud, to rebel against the interminable hours he was doomed to spend in his buggy. By nature he was a recluse, not an outdoor man at all. He was tired, too, of the general rampage, the promiscuous connection and slapdash familiarity of colonial life, sick to death of the all-absorbing struggle to grow richer than his neighbours. He didn't give a straw for money in itself, only for what it brought him. And what was the good of that if he had no leisure to enjoy it? Or was it the truth that he feared being dragged into the vortex, of learning to care, he too, whether or no his name topped subscription lists, whether his entertainments were the most sumptuous, his wife the best-dressed woman in her set? Perish the thought! He did not disquiet Mary by speaking of these things. Still less did he try to explain to her another, more elusive side of the matter. It was this— did he dig into himself, he saw that his uncongenial surroundings were not alone to blame for his restless state of mind. There was in him a gnawing desire for change as change, a distinct fear of being pinned for too long in the same spot, or, to put it another way, a conviction that to live on without change meant decay, for him at least. Of course it was absurd to yield to feelings of this kind, at his age, in his position, with a wife dependent on him. And so he fought them even while he indulged them. For this was the year in which, casting the question of expense to the winds, he pulled down and rebuilt his house. It came over him one morning on waking that he could not go on in the old one for another day, so cramped was he, so tortured by its lath and plaster thinness. He had difficulty in winning Mary over, she was against the outlay, the trouble and confusion involved, and was only reconciled by the more solid comforts and greater conveniences offered her for the new house was of brick, the first brick house to be built on Ballarat, and, oh, the joy, said Richard, of walls so thick that you couldn't hear through them, had an extra wide veranda which might be curtained in for parties and dancers, and a side entrance for patients, such as Mary had often sighed for. As a result of the new grandeur, more and more flocked to his door. The present promised to be a record year, even in the annals of the Golden City. The completion of the railway line to Melbourne was the outstanding event. Virtually halving the distance to the metropolis in count of time, it brought a host of fresh people, capitalists, speculators, politicians, about the town, and money grew perceptibly easier. Letters came more quickly, too. Melbourne newspapers could be handled almost moist from the press. One no longer had the sense of lying shut off from the world behind the wall of a tedious coach journey and the merry Ballaratians, who had never feared or shrunk from the discomforts of this journey, now travelled constantly up and down, attending the Melbourne race-meetings, the Government House balls and lawn parties, bringing back the gossip of Melbourne, together with its fashions in dress, music, and social life. Mary in particular profited by the change, for in one of those general posts so frequently played by the Colonial Cabinet, John Turnham had come out Minister of Railways, and she could have a free pass for the asking. 
John paid numerous visits to his constituency, but he was now such an important personage that his relatives hardly saw him. As likely as not, he was the guest of the Henry Ococks in their new mansion, or of the mayor of the borough. In the past two years, Mahony had only twice exchanged a word with his brother-in-law. And then they met again. In Melbourne, at six o'clock one January morning, the Honourable John, about to enter a saloon compartment of the Ballarat train, paused with one foot on the step, and, disregarding the polite remarks of the station-master at his heels, screwed up his prominent black eyes against the sun. At the farther end of the train a tall, thin, fair-whiskered man was peering disconsolately along a row of crowded carriages. "'God bless me! Isn't that? Why, so it is!' And, leaving the official standing, John walked smartly down the platform. "'My dear Marnie, this is indeed a surprise. I had no idea you were in town.' "'Why not have let me know you proposed coming?' he inquired as they made their way, the train meanwhile held up on their account, towards John's spacious reserved saloon. "'What he means is, why didn't I beg a pass of him?' And Mahony, who detested asking favours, laid exaggerated emphasis on his want of knowledge. He had not contemplated the journey until an hour beforehand. Then, the proposed delegate having been suddenly taken ill, he had been urgently requested to represent the Masonic Lodge to which he belonged, at the installation of a new Grand Master. "'Ah, so you found it possible to get out of harness for once,' said John affably, as they took their seats." "'Yes, by a lucky chance I had no case on hand that could not do without me for twenty-four hours, and my engagement-book I can leave with perfect confidence to my wife.' "'Mary is no doubt a very capable woman. I noticed that afresh when last she was with us,' returned John, and went on to tick off Mary's qualities like a connoisseur appraising the points of a horse. "'A misfortune that she's not blessed with any family,' he added. Mahony stiffened and responded dryly. "'I'm not sure that I agree with you. With all her energy and spirit, Mary is none too strong.' "'Well, well, these things are in the hands of Providence. We must take what is sent us.' And caressing his bare chin, John gave a hearty yawn. The words flicked Mahony's memory. John had had an addition to his family that winter, in the shape, to the disappointment of all concerned, of a second daughter. He offered belated congratulations. "'A regular turnum this time, according to Mary,' but I'm sorry to hear Jane has not recovered her strength. Oh, Jane is doing very well, but it has been a real disadvantage that she could not nurse. The infant is, well, ah, uh, perfectly formed, of course, but small, small. You must send them both to Mary to be looked after. The talk then passed to John's son, now a schoolboy in Geelong, and John admitted that the reports he received of the lad continued as unsatisfactory as ever. The young rascal has ability, they tell me, but no application. John propounded various theories to account for the boy having turned out poorly, chief among which was that he had been left too long in the hands of women. They had overindulged him. "'Mary, no more than the rest, my dear fellow,' he hastened to smooth Mahony's rising plumes. "'It began with his mother in the first place. Yes, poor Emma was weak with the boy, lamentably weak.' Here, with a disconcerting abruptness, he drew to him a blue linen bag that lay on the seat, and, loosening its string, took out a sheaf of official papers, in which he was soon engrossed. He had had enough of Mahony's conversation in the meantime, or so it seemed, had thought of something better to do, and did it. His brother-in-law eyed him as he read. "'He's a bad collar. Been living too high, no doubt.' A couple of new books were on the seat by Mahony, but he did not open them. He had a tiring day behind him, and the briefest of nights. Besides attending the Masonic ceremony, which had lasted into the small hours, he had undertaken to make various purchases, not the least difficult of which was the buying of a present for Mary, all the little fallals that went to finish a lady's ball-dress. Railway travelling was, too, something of a novelty to him nowadays, and he sat idly watching the landscape unroll, and thinking of nothing in particular. The train was running through mile after mile of flat treeless country, liberally sprinkled with trapstones and clumps of tussock grass, which at a distance could be mistaken for couched sheep. Here and there stood a solitary she-oak, most doleful of trees, its scraggy pine-needle foliage bleached to grey. From the several little stations along the line, mere three-sided sheds, which bore a printed invitation to intending passengers to wave a flag or light a lamp, did they wish to board the train, from these shelters long, bare, red roads, straight as ruled lines, ran back into the heart of the burnt-up, faded country. 
now and then a moving ruddy cloud on one of them told of some vehicle crawling its laborious way. When John, his memoranda digested, looked up ready to resume their talk, he found that Mahony was fast asleep. And since his first words, loudly uttered, did not rouse him, he took out his case, chose a cigar, beheaded it, and puffed it alight. While he smoked, he studied his insensible relative. Mahony was sitting uncomfortably hunched up, his head had fallen forward and to the side, his mouth was open, his gloved hands lay limp on his knee. Hm, said John to himself as he gazed, and hm, he repeated after an interval. Then pulling down his waistcoat and generally giving himself a shake to rights, he reflected that for his own two and forty years he was a very well preserved man indeed. End of part four, chapter five. Part four, chapter six of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson, Part Four, Chapter Six. Oh, Richard, and my dress is blue," said Mary distractedly, and sitting back on her heels, let her arms fall to her sides. She was on her knees, and before her lay a cardboard box from which she had withdrawn a pink fan, pink satin boots with stockings to match, and a pink headdress. Well, why the dickens didn't you say so? Burst out the giver. I did, dear, as plainly as I could speak. "'Never heard a word.' "'Because you weren't listening. I told you so at the time. Now what am I to do?' And in her worry over the contretemps, Mary quite forgot to thank her husband for the trouble he had been to on her behalf. "'Get another gown to go with them.' "'Oh, Richard, how like a man! After all the time and money this one has cost me. No, I couldn't do that. Besides, Agnes Ocock is wearing pink and wouldn't like it.' and with a forehead full of wrinkles she slowly began to replace the articles in their sheaths. "'Of course they're very nice,' she added, as her fingers touched the delicate textures. "'They would need to be, considering what I paid for them. I wish now I'd kept my money in my pocket.' "'Well, your mistake is hardly my fault, is it, dear?' But Richard had gone off in a mood midway between self-annoyance and the huff. Mary's first thought was to send the articles to Jinny, with a request to exchange them for their counterparts in the proper colour. Then she dismissed the idea. Blind slave to her nursery that Jinny was, she would hardly be likely to give the matter her personal supervision. The box would just be returned to the shop, and the transfer left to the shop-people's discretion. They might even want to charge more. No, another plan now occurred to Mary. Agnes Ocock might not yet have secured the various small extras to go with her ball-dress, and if not, how nice it would be to make her a present of these. They were finer, in better taste, than anything to be had on Ballarat, and she had long owed Agnes some return for her many kindnesses. Herself she would just make do with the simpler things she could buy in town. And so, without saying anything to Richard, who would probably have objected that Henry Ocock was well able to afford to pay for his own wife's finery, Mary tied up the box and drove to Plevna House on the outer edge of Ewell's Swamp. "'Oh, no, I could never have got myself such beautiful things as these, Mary!' And Mrs. Henry let her hands play lovingly with the silk stockings, her pretty face aglow with pleasure. "'Henry has no understanding, dear, for the etc. of a costume. He thinks, if he pays for a dress or a mantle, that that is enough, and when the little bills come in, he grumbles at what he calls my extravagance. I sometimes wish, Mary, I'd kept back just a teeny-weeny bit of my own money. Henry would never have missed it, and I should have been able to settle a small bill for myself now and then. But you know how it is at first, love. Our one idea is to hand over all we possess to our Lord and Master.' She tried on the satin boots. They were a little long, but she would stuff the toes with wadding. "'If I'm really not robbing you, Mary—' Mary reassured her, and thereupon a visit was paid to the nursery, where Mr. Henry's son and heir lay sprawling in his cradle. Afterwards they sat and chatted on the veranda, while a basket was being filled with peaches for Mary to take home. Not even the kindly drapery of a morning wrapper could conceal the fact that Agnes was growing stout— quite losing her fine figure. That came of her having given up riding exercise, and all to please Mr. Henry. He did not ride himself, and felt nervous, or perhaps a little jealous, when his wife was on horseback. She was still very pretty, of course, though by daylight the fine bloom of her cheeks began to break up into a network of tiny veins, and her fair smooth brow bore no trace of the tragedy she had gone through. The double tragedy— 
for soon after the master of Dandaloo's death in a Melbourne lunatic asylum, the little son of the house had died, not yet fourteen years of age, in an inebriate's home. Far was it from Mary to wish her friend to brood or repine, but to have ceased to remember as utterly as Agnes had done, had something callous about it, and in her own heart Mary devoted a fresh regret to the memory of the poor little stepchild of fate. The ball for which all these silken niceties were destined had been organised to raise funds for a public monument to the two explorers, Burke and Wills, and was to be one of the grandest ever given in Ballarat. His Excellency the Governor would, it was hoped, be present in person. The ladies had taken extraordinary pains with their toilettes, and there had been the usual grumblings at expense on the part of the husbands, though not a man but wished and privately expected his wife to take the shine out of all the rest. Mary had besought Richard to keep that evening free. It was her lot always to go out to entertainments under someone else's wing, and he had promised to do his utmost. But a burnt child in this respect, Mary said she would believe it when she saw it, and the trend of events justified her scepticism. The night arrived. She was on the point of adjusting her wreath of forget-me-nots before her candlelit mirror when the dreaded summons came. Mahony had to change and hurry off without the moment's delay. "'Send for Purdy. He'll see you across,' he said as he banged the front door. But Mary dispatched the gardener at a run with a note to Tilly Ocock, who she knew would make room for her in her double-seated buggy. Grindle got out, and Mary, her bunchy skirts held to her, took his place at the back beside Mrs. Amelia. Tilly sat next the driver, and talked to them over her shoulder, a great big jolly rattle of a woman who ruled her surroundings autocratically. "'Law, no, we left him counting eggs,' she answered in an inquiry on Mary's part. "'Pa's got a brood of cochin chinas that's the pride and glory of his art, and he's built himself the neatest little place for him you could meet on a summer's day. You must come over and admire it, my dear. That'll please him no end. It was a condition I made for his going on keeping fowls. They were a perfect nuisance all over the garden and round the kitchen and the back, until it wasn't safe to put your foot down anywhere.' Fowls are such messy things. At last I up and said I wouldn't have it any longer. So then he and Tom set to work and built themselves a fowl house and a run, and there they spend their days thinking out improvements. Here Tilly gave the driver a cautionary dig with her elbow. As she did this, an under-pocket chinked ominously. "'Look out now, Davy, what you doing with us?' "'Yeah, that's splosh, Mary. I always bring a bag of change with me, my dear, so that those who lose shan't have an excuse for not paying up.' Tilly was going to pass her evening as usual at the card-table. "'Well, I hope you two will enjoy yourselves. Remember now, Mrs. Grindle, if you please, that you're a married woman, and must behave yourself and not go in for any eye-jinks.' She teased her prim little stepdaughter as they dismounted from the conveyance and stood straightening their petticoats at the entrance to the hall. "'You know, Matilda, I do not intend to dance to-night,' said Mrs. Amelia, in her sedate fashion. It was as if she sampled each word before parting with it. "'Oh, I know, bless you, and I know why, too. If only it's not another false alarm. Poor old Pa's so like to have a grandchild he was allowed to carry around. He mustn't go near Henry's, of course, for fear the kid'd swallow one of his dropped H's and choke over it. And Tilly threw back her head and laughed.' "'But you must hurry up, Mealy, you know, if you want to oblige him.' "'Really, Tilly,' expostulated Mary. "'She sometimes does go too far,' she thought to herself. "'The poor little woman!' "'Let us two keep together,' she said as she took Amelia's arm. "'I don't intend to dance much either, as my husband isn't here.' But once inside the gaily decorated hall she found it impossible to keep her word. Even on her way to a seat beside Agnes Ocock she was repeatedly stopped, and when she sat down up came first one, then another, to request the pleasure. She could not go on refusing everybody. If she did, it would look as if she deliberately set out to be peculiar, a horrible thought to Mary. Besides, many of those who made their bow were important influential gentlemen. For Richard's sake she must treat them politely. For his sake again she felt pleased. Rightly or wrongly, she put the many attentions shown her down to the fact of her being his wife. So she turned and offered apologies to Agnes and Amelia, feeling at the same time thankful that Richard had not Mr. Henry's jealous disposition. There sat Agnes, looking as pretty as a picture, and was afraid to dance with anyone but her own husband. And he preferred to play at cards. 
"'I think, dear, you might have ventured to accept the archdeacon for a quadrille,' she whispered behind her fan, as Agnes regretfully declined Mr. Long. But Agnes shook her head. "'It's better not, Mary. It saves trouble afterwards. Henry doesn't care to see it.' Perhaps Agnes herself, once a passionate dancer, was growing a little too comfortable, thought Mary, as her own programme wandered from hand to hand. Among the last to arrive was Purdy, red with haste, and making a great thump with his lame leg as he crossed the floor. "'I'm beastly late, Polly. What have you got left for me?' "'Why, really, nothing, Purdy. I thought you weren't coming. But you may put your name down here, if you like.' And Mary handed him her programme, with her thumb on an empty space. She generally made a point of sitting out a dance with Purdy, that he might not feel neglected, and of late she had been especially careful not to let him notice any difference in her treatment of him. But when he gave back the card, she found that he had scribbled his initials in all three blank lines. "'Oh, you mustn't do that. I'm saving those for Richard.' "'Our dance, I believe, Mrs. Marnie,' said a deep voice, as the band struck up the rat quadrilles. And swaying this way and that in her flounced blue tarletan, Mary rose, put her hand within the proffered crook, and went off with the police magistrate, an elderly greybeard, went to walk or beat teetotum through the figures of the dance, with the supremely sane unconcern that she displayed towards all the arts. "'What odd behaviour! murmured Mrs. Henry, following Purdy's retreating form with her eyes. "'He took no notice of us, whatever. And did you see, Amelia, how he stood and stared after Mary?' "'Quite rudely, I thought.' Here Mrs. Grindle was forced to express an opinion of her own, always a trial for the nervous little woman. "'I think it's because dear Mary looks so charming to-night, Agnes,' she ventured in her mouse-like way, then moved up to make room for Archdeacon Long, who laid himself out to entertain the ladies. It was after midnight when Mahony reached home. He would rather have gone to bed, but having promised Mary to put in an appearance, he changed and walked down to the town. The ball was at its height. He skirted the rotating couples, seeking Mary. Friends hailed him. "'Ah, well done, doctor. Still in time for a spin, sir. Have you seen my wife?' "'Indeed, and I have. Mrs. Marnie's the belle of the ball.' "'Pleased to hear it. Where is she now?' "'Look here, Marnie, we've had a regular dispute,' cried Willie Urquhart, pressing up. He was flushed and decidedly garrulous. "'Almost came to blows, we did, over whose was the finest pair of shoulders. Your wife saw Henry O's. I plumped for Mrs. M, and I believe she topped the pole. By Jove, that blue gown makes em look like—what shall I say—like marble!' "'Does fortune smile?' asked Mahony of Henry Ocock, as he passed the card-players. He had cut Urquhart short with a nod. "'So His Excellency didn't turn up after all.' "'Sent a telegraphic communication at the last moment. No, I haven't seen her. But stay, there's Matilda wanting to speak to you, I believe.' Tilly was making all manner of signs to attract his attention. "'Good evening, doctor. Yes, I've a message. You'll find her in the cloak-room. She's been in there for the last half-hour or so. I think she's got the headache or something of that sort, and is waiting for you to take her home.' "'Oh, thank goodness, there you are, Richard,' cried Mary, as he opened the door of the cloak-room, and she rose from the bench on which she had been sitting with her shawl wrapped around her. "'I thought you'd never come.' She was pale and looked distressed. "'Why, what's wrong, my dear, feeling faint?' asked Mahony incredulously. "'If so, you'd better wait for the buggy. It won't be long now. You ordered it for two o'clock.' "'Oh, no, I'm not ill. I'd rather walk,' said Mary breathlessly. "'Only please let us get away, and without making a fuss.' "'But what's the matter?' "'I'll tell you as we go. No, these boots won't hurt, and I can walk in them quite well. Fetch your own things, Richard.' Her one wish was to get her husband out of the building. They stepped into the street. It was a hot night and very dark. In her thin satin dancing boots Mary leaned heavily on Richard's arm as they turned off the street pavements onto the unpaved roads. Mahony let the lights of the main street go past, then said— "'And now, Madam Wife, you'll perhaps be good enough to enlighten me as to what all this means.' "'Yes, dear, I will,' answered Mary obediently, but her voice trembled, and Mahony was sharp of hearing. "'Why, Polly, sweetheart, surely nothing serious?' "'Yes, it is. I've had a very unpleasant experience this evening. Richard, very unpleasant indeed. I hardly know how to tell you. I feel so upset.' "'Come, out with it.' In a low voice, with downcast eyes, Mary told her story. 
All had gone well up till about twelve o'clock. She had danced with this partner and that, and thoroughly enjoyed herself. Then came Purdy's turn. She was with Mrs. Long when he claimed her, and she at once suggested that they should sit out the dance on one of the settees placed around the hall, where they could amuse themselves by watching the dancers. But Purdy took no notice. He was strange in his manner from the very beginning, and led her into one of the little rooms that opened off the main body of the hall. And I didn't like to object. We were conspicuous enough as it was. His foot made such a bumping noise. It was worse than ever to-night, I thought. For the same reason, though she had felt uncomfortable at being hidden away in there, she had not cared to refuse to stay. It seemed to make too much of the thing. Besides, she hoped some other couple would join them. But— But, Mary, broke from Marney, he was blank and bewildered. Purdy, however, had got up after a moment or two and shut the door. And then— "'Oh, it's no use, Richard. I can't tell you,' said poor Mary. "'I don't know how to get the words over my lips. I think I've never felt so ashamed in all my life.' And worn out by the worry and excitement she had gone through, and afraid in advance of what she still had to face, Mary began to cry. Mahony stood still, let her arm drop. "'Do you mean me to understand?' he demanded, as if unable to believe his ears. "'To understand that Purdy dared to—' that he dared to behave to you in any but a—' And since Mary was using her pocket-handkerchief and could not reply, "'Good God! Has the fellow taken leave of his senses? Is he mad? Was he drunk? Answer me! What does it all mean?' And Mary, still continuing silent, he threw off the hand she had replaced on his arm. "'Then you must walk home alone. I am going back to get the truth of this.' But Mary clung to him. "'No, no, you must hear the whole story first anything rather than let him return to the hall. Yes, at first she thought he really had gone mad. I can't tell you what I felt, Richard, knowing it was Purdy, just Purdy, to see him like that, looking so horrible, and to have to listen to the dreadful things he said. Yes, I'm sure he'd had too much to drink. His breath smelt so. She had tried to pull away her hands, but he had held her, had put his arms around her. At the anger she felt racing through her husband, she tightened her grip, stringing meanwhile phrase to phrase with the sole idea of getting him safely indoors. Not until they were shut in the bedroom did she give the most humiliating detail of any, how while she was still struggling to free herself from Purdy's embrace, the door had opened and Mr. Grindle looked in. He drew back at once, of course, but it was awful, Richard. I turned cold. It seemed to give me more strength, though. I pulled myself away and got out of the room. I don't know how. My wreath was falling off. My dress was crumpled. Nothing would have made me go back to the ballroom. I couldn't have faced Amelia's husband. I think I shall never be able to face him again. And Mary's tears flowed anew. Richard was stamping about the room, aimlessly moving things from their places. God Almighty! He shall answer to me for this. I'll go back and take a horsewhip with me. "'For my sake, don't have a scene with him. It would only make matters worse,' she pleaded. But Richard strode up and down, treading heedlessly on the flouncings of her dress. "'What, and let him believe such behaviour can go unpunished? That whenever it pleases him he can insult my wife, insult my wife, make her the talk of the place, brand her before the whole town as a light woman?' "'Oh, not the whole town, Richard. I shall have to explain to Amelia and Tilly and, and Agnes, that's all.' sobbed Mary in parenthesis. "'Yes, and I ask if it's a dignified or decent thing for you to have to do, to go running around assuring your friends of your virtue,' cried Richard furiously. "'Let me tell you this, my dear, at whatever door you knock you'll be met by disbelief. Fate played you a shabby trick when it allowed just that low cat to put his head in. What do you think would be left of any woman's reputation after Grindle Esquire had poured it over?' "'No, Mary, you've been rendered impossible, and you'll be made to feel it for the rest of your days. People will point to you as the wife who takes advantage of her husband's absence to throw herself into another man's arms, and to me as the convenient husband who provides the opportunity.' And Marnie groaned. In an impetuous flight of fancy he saw his good name smirched, his practice laid waste. Mary lifted her head at this and wiped her eyes. "'Oh, you always paint everything so black. People know me. No, I would never, ever do such a thing.' "'Unfortunately, we live among human beings, my dear, not in a community of saints. But what does a good woman know of how a slander of this kind clings?' 
"'But if I have a perfectly clear conscience?' Mary's tone was incredulous, even a trifle aggrieved. "'It spells ruin all the same in a hole like this, if it once gets about. "'But it shan't. I'll put my pride in my pocket and go to Amelia the first thing in the morning. "'I'll make it right somehow. "'But I must say, Richard, in the whole affair, I don't think you feel a bit sorry for me, "'or at least only for me as your wife.' "'The horridest part of what happened was mine, not yours, and I think you might show a little sympathy.' "'I'm too furious to feel sorry,' replied Richard, with gaunt truthfulness, still marching up and down. "'Well, I do,' said Mary, with a spice of defiance. "'In spite of everything, I feel sorry that any one could so far forget himself as Purdy did to-night.' "'You'll be telling me next you have warmer feelings still for him.' burst out Mahony. "'Sorry for the crazy lunatic who, after all these years, after all I've done for him and the trust I've put in him, suddenly falls to making love to the woman who bears my name. Why, a madhouse is the only place he's fit for. There you're unjust and wrong, too. It—it it wasn't as sudden as you think. Purdy has been queer in his behaviour for quite a long time now.' "'What in heaven's name do you mean by that?' "'I mean what I say,' said Mary, staunchly, though she turned a still deeper red. "'Oh, you might just as well be angry with yourself for being so blind and stupid.' "'Do you mean to tell me you were aware of something?' Mahony stopped short in his perambulations, and fixed her open-mouthed. "'I couldn't help it. Not that there was much to know, Richard. And I thought of coming to you about it. Indeed I did. I tried to more than once, but you were always so busy. I hadn't the heart to worry you, for I knew very well how upset you would be. "'So it comes to this, does it?' said Mahony, with biting emphasis. "'My wife consents to another man paying her illicit intentions behind her husband's back.' "'Oh, no, no, no! But I knew how fond you were of Purdy, and I always hoped it would blow over without—without without coming to anything.' "'God forgive me!' cried Mahony passionately. "'It takes a woman's brain to house such a preposterous idea.' "'Oh, I'm not quite the fool you make me out to be, Richard. I've got some sense in me. But it's always the same. I think of you, and you think of no one but yourself. I only wanted to spare you, and this is the thanks I get for it.' And sitting down on the side of the bed, she wept bitterly. "'Will you assure me, madam, that until to-night nothing I could have objected to has ever passed between you?' "'No, Richard, I won't. I won't tell you anything else. You get so angry you don't know what you're saying. And if you can't trust me better than that, Purdy said to-night you didn't understand me, and never had.' "'Oh, he did, did he? There we have it. Now I'll know every word the scoundrel has ever said to you, and if I have to drag it from you by force.' But Mary set her lips with an obstinacy that was something quite new in her. It first amazed Mahony, then made him doubly angry. One word gave another. For the first time in their married lives they quarrelled, quarrelled hotly. And as always at such times many a covert criticism, a secret disapproval which neither had ever meant to breathe to the other, slipped out and added fuel to the fire. It was appalling to both to find out on how many points they stood at variance. Some half-hour later, leaving Mary still on the edge of the bed, still crying, Mahony stalked grimly into the surgery, and taking pen and paper, scrawled, without even sitting down to do it, "'You damned scoundrel! If ever you show your face here again, I'll thrash you to within an inch of your life!' Then he stepped on to the veranda and crossed the lawn, carrying the letter in his hand. But already his mood was on the turn. It seemed as if, in the physical effort of putting the words to paper, his rage had spent itself. He was conscious now of a certain limpness, both of mind and body. His fit of passion over, he felt dulled, almost indifferent to what had happened. Now, too, another feeling was taking possession of him, opening up vistas of a desert emptiness that he hardly dared to face. But stay! Was that not a movement in the patch of blackness under the fig-tree? Had not something stirred there? He stopped and strained his eyes. No, it was only a bough that swayed in the night air. He went out of the garden to the corner of the road, and came back empty-handed. But at the same spot he hesitated and peered. "'Who's there?' he asked sharply, and again, "'Is there anyone there?' But the silence remained unbroken, and once more he saw that the shifting of a branch had misled him. Mary was moving about the bedroom. He ought to go to her and ask pardon for his violence, but he was not yet come to a stage where he felt equal to a reconciliation. He would rest for a while, let his troubled balance right itself. 
and so he lay down on the surgery sofa and drew a rug over him. He closed his eyes, but could not sleep. His thoughts raced and flew. His brain hunted clues and connections. He found himself trying to piece things together, to fit them in, to recollect. And every now and then some sound outside would make him start up and listen, and listen. Was that not a footstep? The step of one who might come feeling his way, dim-eyed with regret? There were such things in life as momentary lapses, as ungovernable impulses, as fiery contrition, the anguish of remorse. And yet once more he sat up, and listened until his ears rang. Then, not the ghostly footsteps of a delusive hope, but a hard human crunching that made the boards of the veranda shake. Tossing off the opossum rug, which had grown unbearably heavy, he sprang to his feet, was wide awake and at the window, staring sleep-charged into the dawn, before a human hand had found the night-bell, and a distracted voice cried, "'Does a doctor live here? A doctor, I say!' End of Part 4, Chapter 6《Part Four, Chapter Seven of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part Four, Chapter Seven. The hot airless night had become the hot airless day. In the garden, the leaves on trees and shrubs drooped as under an invisible weight. All the stale smells of the day before persisted: that of the medicaments on the shelves, of the unwetted dust on the roads, the sickly odour of malt from a neighbouring brewery. The blowflies buzzed about the ceiling. On the table under the lamp a dozen or more moths lay singed and dead. Now it was nearing six o'clock. Clad in his thinnest driving coat, Mahony sat and watched the man who had come to fetch him beat his horse to a lather. "'Mercy! Have a little mercy on the poor brute!' he said more than once. He had stood out for some time against obeying the summons, which meant at lowest a ten-mile drive." Not if he were offered a hundred pounds down was his first impetuous refusal, for he had not seen the inside of a bed that night. But at this he trapped an odd look in the other's eyes, and suddenly became aware that he was still dressed as for the ball. Besides, an equally impetuous answer was flung back at him. He promised no hundred pounds, said the man, hadn't got it to offer. He appealed solely to the doctor's humanity. It was a question of saving a life, that of his only son. So here they were. "'We doctors have no business with troubles of our own,' thought Mahony, as he listened to the detailed account of an ugly accident. On the roof of a shed the boy had missed his footing, slipped and fallen some twenty feet, landing astride a piece of quartering. Picking himself up, he had managed to crawl home, and at first they thought he would be able to get through the night without medical aid. But towards two o'clock his sufferings had grown unbearable. God only knew if by this time he had not succumbed to them.' "'My good man, one does not die of pain alone.' They followed a flat treeless road, the grass on either side of which was burnt to hay. Buggy and harness, the latter eked out with bits of string and an old bootlace, were coated with the dust of months, and the gaunt long-backed horse shuffled through a reddish flower which accompanied them as a choking cloud. A swarm of small black flies kept pace with the vehicle, settling on nose, eyes, neck, and hands of its occupants, crawling over the horse's belly and in and out of its nostrils. The animal made no effort to shake itself free, seemed indifferent to the pests. They were only to be disturbed by the hail of blows which the driver occasionally stood up to deliver. At such moments Marney, too, started out of the light doze he was continually dropping into. Arrived at their destination, a miserable wooden shanty on a sheep-run at the foot of the ranges, he found his patient tossing on a dirty bed, with a small pulse of a hundred and twenty, while the right thigh was darkly bruised and swollen. The symptoms pointed to serious internal injuries. He performed the necessary operation. There was evidently no woman about the place. The coffee the father brought him was thick as mud. On leaving, he promised to return next day, and to bring someone with him to attend to the lad. For the home journey, he got a mount on a young and fidgety mare, whom he suspected of not long having worn the saddle. In the beginning, he had his hands full with her. Then, however, she ceased her antics, and consented to advance at an easy trot. How tired he felt! He would have liked to go to bed and sleep for a week on end. As it was, he could not reckon on even an hour's rest. By the time he reached home, the usual string of patients would await him, and these disposed of, and a bite of breakfast snatched, out he must set anew on his morning round. He did not feel well, either. 
The coffee seemed to have disagreed with him. He had a slight sense of nausea and was giddy. The road swam before his eyes. Possibly the weather had something to do with it. Though a dull and sunless morning, it was hot as he had never known it. He took out a stud, letting the ends of his collar fly. Poor little Mary, he thought inconsequentially. He had hurt and frightened her by his violence. He felt ashamed of himself now. By daylight he could see her point of view. Mary was so tactful and resourceful that she might safely be trusted to hush up the affair, to explain away the equivocal position in which she had been found. After all, both of them were known to be decent, God-fearing people. And one had only to look at Mary to see that here was no light woman. Nobody in his senses, not even Grindle, could think evil of that broad, transparent brow, of those straight, kind, merry eyes. No, this morning his hurt was a purely personal one. That it should just be Purdy who did him this wrong. Purdy, playmate and henchman, ally in how many a boyish enterprise, in the hardships and adventures of later life. Mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread— Never had he turned a deaf ear to Purdy's needs. He had fed him and clothed him, caring for him as for a well-loved brother. Surely few things were harder to bear than a blow in the dark from one who stood thus deeply in your debt, on whose gratitude you would have staked your head. It was, of course, conceivable that he had been swept off his feet by Mary's vivid young beauty, by overindulgence, by the glamour of the moment. But if a man could not restrain his impulses where the wife of his most intimate friend was concerned— Another thing. As long as Mary had remained an immature slip of a girl, Purdy had not given her a thought. When, however, under her husband's wing she had blossomed out into a lovely womanhood, of which any man might be proud, then she had found favour in his eyes. And the slight this put on Mary's sterling moral qualities, on all but her physical charms, left the worst taste of any in the mouth. Then, not content with trying to steal her love, Purdy had also sought to poison her mind against him. How that wrangled! For until now he had hugged the belief that Purdy's opinion of him was coloured by affection and respect, by the tradition of years. Whereas, from what Mary had let fall, he saw that the boy must have been sitting in judgment on him, regarding his peculiarities with an unloving eye, picking his motives to pieces. It was like seeing the child of your loins, of your hopes, your unsleeping care, turn and rend you with black ingratitude. Yes, everything went to prove Purdy's unworthiness. Only he had not seen it, only he had been blind to the truth. And wrapped in this smug blindness, he had given his false friend the run of his home, setting, after the custom of the country, no veto on his eternal presence. Disloyalty was certainly abetted by just the extravagant, exaggerated hospitality of colonial life. Never must the doors of your house be shut. All you had you were expected to share with any sundowner of fortune who chanced to stop at your gate. The mare shied with a suddenness that almost unseated him. The next moment she had the bit between her teeth and was galloping down the road. Clomp, clomp, clomp went her hooves on the baked clay— the dust smothered and stung, and he was holding for all he was worth to rein span stiff as iron. On they flew, his body hammered the saddle, his breath came sobbingly. But he kept his seat, and a couple of miles further on he was down, soothing the wild-eyed, quivering, sweating beast, whose nostrils worked like a pair of bellows. There he stood, glancing now back along the road, now up at the sky— his hat had gone flying at the first unexpected plunge. He ought to return and look for it. But he shrank from the additional fatigue, the delay in reaching home this would mean. The sky was still overcast. He decided to risk it. Knotting his handkerchief, he spread it capwise over his head, and got back into the saddle. "'Mine own familiar friend!' And more than that, he could add to David's plaint and say, "'My only friend!' In Purdy, the one person he had been intimate with, passed out of his life. There was nobody to take the vacant place. He had been far too busy of late years to form new friendships. What was left of him after the day's work was done was but a kind of shell. The work was the meaty contents. As you neared the forties, too, it grew ever harder to fit yourself to other people. Your outlook had become too set, your ideas too unfluid. Hence you clung the faster to ties formed in the old golden days, worn though these might be to the thinness of a hair. And then there was one's wife, of course, one's dear good wife. 
but just her very dearness and goodness served to hold possible intimates at arm's length. The knowledge that you had such a confidant, that all your thoughts were shared with her, struck disastrously at a free exchange of privacies. No, he was alone. He had not so much as a dog now to follow at heel and look up at him with the melancholy eyes of its race. Old Pompey had come at poison, and Mary had not wished to have a strange dog in the new house. She did not care for animals, and the main charge of it would have fallen on her. He had no time, no time even for a dog. Better it would assuredly be to have someone to fall back on. It was not good for a man to stand so alone. Did troubles come, they would strike doubly hard because of it. Then was the time to rejoice in a warm human handclasp and moodily pondering the reasons for his solitariness, he was once more inclined to lay a share of the blame on the conditions of the life. The population of the place was still in a state of flux. He and a mere handful of others would soon, he believed, be the oldest residents in Ballarat. People came and went, tried their luck, failed, and flitted off again, much as in the early days. What was the use of troubling to become better acquainted with a person, when just as you began really to know him, he was up and away? At home in the old country, a man as often as not died in the place where he was born, and the slow, eventless years spent shoulder to shoulder automatically brought about a kind of intimacy. But this was only a surface reason. There was another that went deeper. He had no talent for friendship, and he knew it. Indeed, he would even invert the thing and say bluntly that his nature had a twist in it which directly hindered friendship and this, though there came moments when he longed, as your popular mortal never did, for close companionship. Sometimes he felt like a hungry man looking on at a banquet, of which no one invited him to partake, because he had already given it to be understood that he would decline. But such lapses were few. On nine days out of ten he did not feel the need of either making or receiving confidences. He shrank, rather, with a peculiar shy dread from personal unbosomings. Some imp housed in him, some wayward, wilful, mocking Irish devil, bidding him hold back, remain cool, dry-eyed, in face of others' joys and pains. Hence the break with Purdy was a real calamity. The associations of some five-and-twenty years were bound up in it, measured by it. One's marriage seemed a thing of yesterday. And even more than the friend, he would miss the friendship and all it stood for the solid base of joint experience, the past of common memories into which one could dip as into a well, this handle of, do you remember, which opened the door to such a wealth of anecdote. From now on the better part of his life would be a closed book to any but himself. There were allusions, jests without number, homely turns of speech which not a soul but himself would understand. The thought of it made him feel old and empty, affected him like the news of a death. But must it be? Was there no other way out? Slow to take hold, he was a hundred times slower to let go. Before now he had seen himself sticking by a person through misunderstandings, ingratitude, deception, to the blank wonder of the onlookers. Would he not be ready here, too, to forgive, to forget? But he felt hot, hot to suffocation, and his heart was pounding in uncomfortable fashion. The idea of stripping and plunging into ice-cold water began to make a delicious appeal to him. Nothing surpassed such a plunge after a broken night. But of late he had to be wary of indulging. A bath of this kind, taken when he was overtired, was apt to set the accursed ticker going, and then he could pace the floor in agony. And yet—oh, good God, how hot it was! His head ached distractedly. An iron band of pain seemed to encircle it. With a sudden start of alarm he noticed that he had ceased to perspire. Now he came to think of it, not even the wild gallop had induced perspiration. Pulling up short, he fingered his pulse. It was abnormal, even for him, and feeble. Was it fancy, or did he really find a difficulty in breathing? He tore off his collar, threw open the neck of his shirt. He had a sensation as if all the blood in his body was flying to his head. His face must certainly be crimson. He put both hands to this top-heavy head, to support it, and in a blind fit of vertigo all but lost his balance in the saddle. The trees spun around, the distance went black. For a second still he kept upright, then he flopped to the ground, falling face downwards, his arms huddled under him. The mare, all her spirit gone, stood lamb-like and waited. As he did not stir, she turned and sniffed at him curiously. Still he lay prone 
and having stretched her tired jaw, she raised her head and uttered a whinny, an almost human cry of distress. This, too, failing in its effect, she nosed the ground for a few yards, then set out at a gentle mane-shaking trot for home. Found, a dark conspicuous heap on the long bare road, and carted back to town by a passing bullock-wagon, Marnie lay, once the death-like coma had yielded, and tossed in fever and delirium. By piecing his broken utterances together, Mary learned all she needed to know about the case he had gone out to attend, and his desperate ride home. But it was Purdy's name that was oftenest on his lips, it was Purdy he reviled and implored, and when he sprang up with the idea of calling his false friend to account, it was as much as she could do to restrain him. She had the best of advice. Old Dr. Munce himself came two and three times a day. Mary had always thought him a dear old man, and she felt surer than ever of it when he stood patting her hand and bidding her keep a good heart, for they would certainly pull her husband through. "'There aren't so many of his kind here, Mrs. Marney, that we can afford to lose him.' But altogether she had never known till now how many and how faithful their friends were. Hardly, for instance, had Richard been carried in, stiff as a log and grey as death, when good Mrs. Devine was fumbling with the latch of the gate, an old sunbonnet perched crooked on her head. She had run down just as she was, in the midst of shelling peas for dinner. She begged to be allowed to help with the nursing, but Mary felt bound to refuse. She knew how the thought of what he might have said in his delirium would worry Richard when he recovered his senses. Few men laid such weight as he on keeping their private thoughts private. Not to be done, Mrs. Devine installed herself in the kitchen to superintend the cooking. Less for the patient, into whom at first only liquid nourishment could be injected, than to see as your own strength is kept up, dearie. Tilly swooped down and bore off Trotty. Delicate fruits, new-laid eggs, jellies and wines came from Agnes Ocock, while Amelia Grindle, who had no such dainties to offer, arrived every day at three o'clock to mind the house while Mary slept. Archdeacon Long was also a frequent visitor, bringing not so much spiritual as physical aid. For, as the frenzy reached its height, and Richard was maddened by the idea that a plot was brewing against his life, a pair of strong arms was needed to hold him down. Over and above this, letters of sympathy flowed in. Grateful patients called to ask with tears in their eyes how the doctor did. Virtual strangers stopped the servant in the street with the same query. Mary was sometimes quite overwhelmed by the kindness people showed her. The days that preceded the crisis were days of keenest anxiety, but Mary never allowed her heart to fail her. For if, in the small things of life, she was given to building on a mortal's good sense— how much more could she rely at such a pass on the sense of the one above all others? What she said to herself as she moved tirelessly about the sick-room, damping cloths, filling the ice-bag, in filtering drops of nourishment, was, "'God is good,' and these words, far from breathing a pierced resignation, voiced a confidence so bold that it bordered on irreverence. Their real meaning was, "'Richard has still ever so much work to do in the world, curing sick people and saving their lives,' God must know this, and cannot now mean to be so foolish as to waste him by letting him die. And her reliance on the Almighty's far-sighted wisdom was justified. Richard weathered the crisis, slowly revived to life and health, and the day came when, laying a thin white hand on hers, he could whisper, "'My poor little wife, what a fright I must have given you!' and added, "'I think an illness of some kind was due, overdue with me.' When he was well enough to bear the journey, they left home for a watering-place on the bay. There, on an open beach facing the heads, Arnie lay with his hat pulled forward to shade his eyes, and with nothing to do but scoop up handfuls of the fine coral sand and let it flow again, like liquid silk, through his fingers. From beneath the brim he watched the water churn and froth on the brown reefs, followed the sailing-ships, which, beginning as mere dots on the horizon, swelled to stately white water-birds, and shrivelled again to dots. Drank in with greedy nostrils the mixed spice of warm sea, hot seaweed, and aromatic tea-scrub. And his strength came back as rapidly as usual. He soon felt well enough, leaning on Mary's arm, to stroll up and down the sandy roads of the township, to open book and newspaper, and finally to descend the cliffs for a dip in the transparent turquoise sea. At the end of a month he was at home again, sunburnt and hearty, eager to pick up the threads he had let fall and soon Mary was able to make the comfortable reflection that everything was going on just as before. 
In this, however, she was wrong. Never in their united lives would things be quite the same again. Outwardly the changes might pass unnoticed, though even here it was true a certain name had now to be avoided, with which they had formerly made free. But this was not exactly hard to do, Purdy having promptly disappeared. They heard at second hand that he had at last accepted promotion and gone to Melbourne. And since Mary had suffered no inconvenience from his thoughtless conduct, they tacitly agreed to let the matter rest. That was on the surface. Inwardly the differences were more marked. Even in the mental attitude they adopted towards what had happened, husband and wife were thoroughly dissimilar. Mary did not refer to it, because she thought it would be foolish to reopen so disagreeable a subject. In her own mind, however, she faced it frankly, dating back to it as the night when Purdy had been so odious and Richard so angry. Mahony, on the other hand, gave the affair a wide berth even in thought. For him it was a kind of Pandora's box, of which, having once caught a glimpse of the contents, he did not again dare to raise the lid. Things might escape from it that would alter his whole life. But he, too, dated from it in the sense of suddenly becoming aware, with a throb of regret, that he had left his youth behind him. And such phrases as, "'When I was young, in my younger days,' now fell instinctively from his lips. Nor was this all. Deep down in Mary's soul there slumbered a slight embarrassment, one she could not get the better of. It spread and grew. There was a faint, ever so faint a doubt of Richard's wisdom. Archie had long known him to be, different in many small and some great ways from those they lived amongst, but hitherto this very oddness of his had seemed to her an outgrowth on the side of superiority, fairer judgment, higher motives. Just as she had always looked up to him as rectitude in person, so she had thought him the embodiment of a fine though somewhat unworldly wisdom. Now her faith in his discernment was shaken. His treatment of her on the night of the ball had shocked, confused her. She was ready to make allowance for him. She had told her story clumsily, and had afterwards been both cross and obstinate, while part of his violence was certainly to be ascribed to his coming breakdown. But this did not cover everything, and the ungenerous spirit in which he had met her frankness, his doubt of her word, of her good faith, his utter unreasonableness, in short, had left a cold patch of astonishment in her, which would not yield. She lit on it at unexpected moments. Meanwhile she groped for an epithet that would fit his behaviour. Beginning with some rather vague and high-flown terms, she gradually came down, until with the sense of having found the right thing at last she fixed on the adjective silly, a word which for the rest was in common use with Mary, had she to describe anything that struck her as queer or extravagant. And sitting over her fancy-work, into which, being what Richard called safe as the grave, she sowed more thoughts than most women, Sitting thus, she would say to herself, with a half-smile and an incredulous shake of the head, "'So silly!' But hers was one of those inconvenient natures which trust blindly, or not at all. Once worked on by a doubt or a suspicion, they are never able to shake themselves free of it again. As time went on, she suffered strange uncertainties where some of Richard's decisions were concerned. In his good intentions she retained an implicit belief, but she was not always satisfied that he acted in the wisest way. Occasionally it struck her that he did not see as clearly as she did, at other times that he let a passing whim run away with him and override his common sense. And her eyes thus opened, it was not in Mary to stand dumbly by and watch him make what she held to be mistakes. Openly to interfere, however, would also have gone against the grain in her. She had bowed for too long to his greater age and experience. So seeing no other way out, she fell back on indirect methods. To her regret. For in watching other women manage their husbands, she had felt proud to think that nothing of this kind was necessary between Richard and her. Now she, too, began to lay little schemes by which, without his being aware of it, she might influence his judgment, divert or modify his plans. Her enforced use of such tactics did not lessen the admiring affection she bore him. That was framed to withstand harder tests. Indeed, she was even aware of an added tenderness towards him, now she saw that it behoved her to have forethought for them both. But into the wife's love for her husband there crept something of a mother's love for her child, for a wayward and impulsive yet gifted creature whose welfare and happiness depended on her alone and it is open to question whether the mother dormant in Mary did not fall with a kind of hungry joy on this late-found task. The work of her hands done, she had known empty hours. 
That was over now. With quickened faculties, all her senses on the alert, she watched, guided, hindered, foresaw. End of Part 4 Chapter 7Part four, chapter eight of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part four, chapter eight. Old Ocock failed in health that winter. He was really old now, was two or three and sixty, and with the oncoming of the rains and cold gusty winds, various infirmities began to plague him. He has done himself rather too well since his marriage, said Mahony in private. After being a worker for the greater part of his life, it would have been better for him to work on to the end. Yes, that Mary could understand and agree with. But Richard continued, All it means, of course, is that the poor fellow is beginning to prepare for his last long journey. These aches and pains of his represent the packing and the strapping, without which not even a short earthly journey can be undertaken, and his is into eternity. Mary, making lace over a pillow, looked up at this a trifle apprehensively. "'What things you do say! If any one heard you, they'd think you weren't very, very religious.' Her fear, lest Richard's outspokenness should be mistaken for impiety, never left her. Tilly was plain and to the point. "'Like a bear with a sore back, that's what he is, since he can't get down among his blessed birds. He leads Tom the life of the condemned over the feeding of those bantams. As if the boy could help em not laying when they ought.' At thirty-six Tilly was the image of her mother. Entirely gone was the slight crust of acerbity that had threatened her in her maiden days, when, thanks to her misplaced affections, it had seemed for a time as if the purple prizes of life—love, offers of marriage, a home of her own—were going to pass her by. She was now a stout, high-coloured woman, with a roar of a laugh, full yet firm lips, and the whitest of teeth. Mary thought her decidedly toned down and improved since her marriage but Mahony put it that the means Tilly now had at her disposal were such as to make people shut an eye to her want of refinement. However that might be, old Mrs. Ocock was welcomed everywhere, even by those on whom her bouncing manners grated. She was invariably clad in a thick and handsome black silk gown, over which she wore all the jewellery she could crowd on her person—huge cameo brooches, ear-drops, rings and bracelets, lockets and chains. Her name topped subscription lists, and having early weaned her old husband off his dissenting habits, she was a real prop to Archdeacon Long and his church, taking the chief and most expensive table at tea-meetings, the most thankless stall at bazaars. She kept open house, too, and gave delightful parties, where, while some sat at loo, others were free to turn the rooms upside down for a dance, or to ransack wardrobes and presses for costumes for charades. She drove herself and her friends about in various vehicles, briskly and well, and indulged, besides, in many secret charities. Her husband thought no such woman had ever trodden the earth, and publicly blessed the day on which he first set eyes on her. "'After the dose I'd had with me first was a bit of a risk, that I knew. And it put me off me sleep for a night or two beforehand. But my Tilly's the queen of women. I say the queen, sir.' I have never had a wrong word from her, and when I go she gets every penny I've got. Why, I'm jiggered if she didn't stop at home from the races t'other day, and all on my account. Now then, Pa, drop it, or the doctor'll think you've been mixing your liquors. Give your old pin here, and let me poultice it. He had another sound reason for gratitude. Somewhere in the background of his house dwelt his two ne'er-do-well sons. Tilly had accepted their presence uncomplainingly. Indeed, she sometimes stood up for Tom against his father. "'Now, Pa, stop nagging at the boy, will you? You'll never get anything out of him that way. Tom's right enough, if you know how to take him. He'll never set the Thames on fire, if that's what you mean. But I'm thankful I can tell you to have a handy chap like him at my back. If I had to depend on your silly old paws, I'd never get anything done at all.' And so Tom, a flaxen-haired, sheepish-looking man of something over thirty, led a kind of go-as-you-please existence about the place, a jack of all trades, in turn carpenter, whitewasher, paper-hanger, an expert fetcher and carrier, bullied by his father, sheltered under his stepmother's capacious wing. It isn't his fault he's never come to anything. He hadn't half a chance. The truth is, Mary, for all they say to the opposite, men are harder than women, so unforgiving-like. Just because Tom made a slip once, they've never let him forget it, but tied it to his coat-tails for him to drag with him through life. Little-minded, I call it. 
"'Besides, if you ask me, my dear, it must have been a case of six of one and half a dozen of the other. Tom a seducer? Can you picture it, Mary? It's enough to make one split.' And with a meaning glance at her friend, Tilly broke out in a contagious peal of laughter. "'As for Johnny, well,' and she shrugged her shoulders, "'a bad egg's bad, Mary, and no amount of cookin' and doctrine will sweeten it. But he didn't make himself, did he?' "'And my opinion is, parents should look to themselves a bit more than they do.' As she spoke, she threw open the door of the little room where Johnny housed. It was an odd place. The walls were plastered over with newspaper cuttings, with old prints from illustrated journals, with snippets torn off valentines and keepsakes. Stuck one on another, these formed a kind of loose wallpaper which stirred in the draught. Tilly went on. I see myself to it being kept cleanish. He hates the girl to come bothering around. Oh, just Johnny's rubbish. For Mary had stooped curiously to the table, which was littered with a queer collection of objects matchboxes on wheels, empty reels of cotton threaded on strings, bits of wood shaped in rounds and squares, boxes made of paper, dried seaweed glued in patterns on strips of cardboard. He's forever pottering around with them. What amusement he gets out of it only the Lord can tell. She did not mention the fact, known to Mary, that when Johnny had a drinking bout it was she who looked after him, got him comfortably to bed, and made shift to keep the noise from his father's ears. Yes, Tilly's charity seemed sheerly inexhaustible. Again there was the case of Jinny's children. For in this particular winter Tilly had exchanged her black silk for a stuff gown heavily trimmed with crepe. She was in mourning for poor Jinny, who had died not long after giving birth to a third daughter. "'Died off the daughter in more senses than one,' was Tilly's verdict. John had certainly been extremely put out at the advent of yet another girl, and the probability was that Jinny had taken his reproaches too much to heart. However it was, she could not rally, and one day Mary received a telegram saying that if she wished to see Jinny alive she must come at once. No mention was made of Tilly, but Mary ran to her with the news, and Tilly declared her intention of going too. "'I suppose I may be allowed to say good-bye to my own sister, even though I'm not an honourable. "'Not that Jin and I ever really drew together,' she continued as the train bore them over the ranges. "'She'd too much of poor Pa in her. And I was all Ma. "'Odd luck that it must be just her who managed to get such a domineering brute for her husband. "'You'll excuse me, Mary, won't you? A domineering brute!' "'And to think I once envied her the match,' she went on meditatively, removing her bonnet and substituting a kind of nightcap intended to keep her hair free from dust. "'Lorks, Mary, it's a good thing fate doesn't always take us at our word. We don't know which side our bread's buttered on, and that's the truth. Why, my dear, I wouldn't exchange my old boy for all the honourables in creation.' They were in time to take leave of Jinny lying white as her pillows behind the red rep hangings of the bed. The bony parts of her face had sprung into prominence, her large soft eyes fallen in. John, stalking solemnly and noiselessly in a long black coat, himself led the two women to the bedroom where he left them. They sat down, one on each side of the great four-poster. Jinny hardly glanced at her sister. It was Mary she wanted, Mary's hand she fumbled for, while she told her trouble. "'It's the children, Mary,' she whispered. "'I can't die happy because of the children.' John doesn't understand them. Jinny's whole existence was bound up in the three little ones she had brought into the world. "'Dearest Jinny, don't fret. I'll look after them for you and take care of them,' promised Mary, wiping away her tears. "'I thought so,' said the dying woman, relieved but without gratitude. It seemed but natural to her, who was called upon to give up everything, that those remaining should make sacrifices. Her fingers plucked at the sheet— "'John's been good to me,' she went on, with closed eyes. "'But if it hadn't have been for the children—yes, the children—I think I'd have done better.' Her speech lapsed oddly after her years of patient practice. "'To have taken—to have taken—' The name remained unspoken. Tilly raised astonished eyebrows at Mary. "'Wandering,' she telegraphed in lip language, forming the word very largely and distinctly— for neither knew of Jinny having had any but her one glorious chance. Tilly's big heart yearned over her sister's forlorn little ones. They could be heard bleating like lambs for the mother to whom till now they had never cried in vain. Her instant idea was to gather all three up in her arms, 
and carry them off to her own roomy, childless home, where she would have given them a delightful, though not maybe a particularly discriminating, upbringing. But the funeral over, the blinds raised, the two ladies and the elder babes, clad in the stiff, expensive mourning that befitted the widower's social position, John put his foot down, and to Mary was extremely explicit. "'Under no circumstances will I permit Matilda to have anything to do with the rearing of my children, excellent creature though she be.' On the other hand, he would not have been unwilling for Mary to mother them. This, of course, was out of the question. Richard had accustomed himself to Trotty, but would thank you, she knew, for any fresh encroachment on his privacy. Before leaving, however, she promised to sound him on the plan of placing Trotty as a weekly boarder at a young lady's seminary, and taking the infant in her place. For it came out that John intended to set Zara— Zara, but newly returned from a second voyage to England, and still sipping like a bee at the sweets of various situations, at the head of his house once more. And Mary could not imagine Zara rearing a baby. Equally hard was it to understand John not having learnt wisdom from his two previous failures to live with his sister. But in seeking tactfully to revive his memory, she ran up against such an ingrained belief in the superiority of his own kith and kin that she was baffled, and could only fold her hands and hope for the best. "'Besides, Jane's children are infinitely more tractable than poor Emma's,' was John's parting shot. Strange, thought Mary, how attached John was to his second family. He had still another request to make of her. The reports he received of the boy Johnny, now a pupil at the Geelong Grammar School, grew worse from term to term. It had become clear to him that he was unfortunate enough to possess an out-and-out -out dullard for a son. Regretfully giving up, therefore, the design he had cherished of educating Johnny for the law, he had resolved to waste no more good money on the boy, but to take him, once he had turned fifteen, into his own business. Young John, however, had proved refractory, expressing a violent antipathy to the idea of office life. "'It is here that I should be glad of another opinion, and I turn to you, Mary, my dear. Jane was of no use whatever in such matters, none whatever, being, and very properly so, entirely wrapped up in her own children.' So Mary arranged to break her homeward journey at Geelong, for the purpose of seeing and summing up her nephew. Johnny, he was Jack at school, but that, of course, his Tom fools of relations couldn't be expected to remember. Johnny was waiting on the platform when the train steamed in. "'Oh, what a bonny boy!' said Mary to herself. "'All poor Emma's good looks!' Johnny had been kicking his heels disconsolately. Another of these wretched old women coming down to jaw him. He wished every one of them at the bottom of the sea. However, he pulled himself together and went forward to greet his aunt. He was not in the least bashful. And as they left the station, he took stock of her out of the tail of his eye. With a growing approval. This one, at any rate, he needn't feel ashamed of, and she was not so dreadfully old, after all. Perhaps she mightn't turn out quite such a wet blanket as the rest, though from experience he couldn't connect any pleasure with relatives' visits. There were nasty pills that had to be swallowed. He feared and disliked his father. Aunt Zara had been sheerly ridiculous with her frills and simpers, the boys had imitated her for weeks after, and once, most shameful of all, his stepmother had come down and publicly wept over him. His cheeks still burnt at the remembrance, and he had been glad to hear that she was dead. Served her jolly well right. But this Aunt Mary seemed a horse of another colour, and he did not sneak her into town by a back way, as he had planned to do before seeing her. Greatly as Mary might admire the tall fair lad by her side, she found herself at a loss how to deal with him, the mind of a schoolboy of thirteen being a closed book to her. Johnny looked demure and answered, Yes, Aunt Mary, to everything she said, but this was of small assistance in getting at the real boy inside. Johnny had no intention in the beginning of taking her into his often betrayed and badly bruised confidence. However, a happy instinct led her to suggest a visit to a shop that sold brandy snaps and ginger beer, and this was too much for his strength of mind. Golly, didn't he have a tuck in, and a whole pound of bull's eyes to take back with him to school? It was over the snaps, with an earth brown moustache drawn around his fresh young mouth, the underlip of which swelled like a ripe cherry, that he blurted out, I say, Aunt Mary, don't let the pater stick me in that beastly old office of his. I—I I want to go to sea. Oh, but, Johnny, your father would never consent to that, I'm sure. 
"'I don't see why not,' returned the boy in an aggrieved voice. "'I hate figures, and father knows it. I tell you, I mean to go to sea.' And as he said it, his lip shot out, and suddenly, for all his limpid blue eyes and flaxen hair, it was his father's face that confronted Mary. "'He wouldn't think it respectable enough, dear. He wants you to rise higher in the world and to make money. You must remember who he is.' "'Bosh!' said Johnny. "'Look at Uncle Ned and Uncle Jerry and the Governor himself. He didn't have to sit in a beastly old hole of an office when he was my age.' "'That was quite different,' said Mary weakly. "'And as for your Uncle Jerry, Johnny, why, afterwards he was as glad as could be to get into an office at all.' "'Well, I'd sooner be hanged,' retorted young John. But the next minute, flinging away dull care, he inquired briskly, "'Can you play tip-cat, Aunt Mary?' and vanquished by her air of kindly interest, he gave her his supreme confidence. "'I say, don't peach, will you, but I've got a white rat. I keep it in a locker under my bed.' "'A nice, frank, handsome boy,' wrote Mary. "'Don't be too hard on him, John. His great wish is to travel and see the world, or, as he puts it, to go to sea. Mightn't it be a good thing to humour him in this? A taste of the hardships of life would soon cure him of any such fancies.' "'Stuff and nonsense,' said John the father, and threw the letter from him. "'I didn't send Mary there to let the young devil get around her like that.' And thereupon he wrote to the headmaster that the screw was to be applied to Johnny as never before. This was his last chance. If it failed, and his next report showed no improvement, he would be taken away without further ado, and planked down under his father's nose. No son of his should go to sea, he was damned if they should.' For like many another who has yielded to the wandering passion in his youth, John had small mercy on it when it reared its head in his descendants. End of Part 4 Chapter 8《Part 4 Chapter 9 of Australia Felix — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson — Part 4 Chapter 9 Henry Ocock was pressing for a second opinion. His wife had been in poor health since the birth of their last child. Mahony drove to Plevna House one morning between nine and ten o'clock. A thankless task lay before him. Mrs. Henry's case had been a fruitful source of worry to him, and he now saw nothing for it but a straight talk with Henry himself. He drove past what had once been the great swamp. From a bed of cattle-ploughed mud interspersed with reedy water-holes, in summer a dry and dust-swept hollow. From this the vast natural depression had been transformed into a graceful lake, some three hundred acres in extent. On its surface pleasure-boats lay at their moorings by jetties and boat-sheds. Groups of stiff-necked swans sailed or ducked and straddled, while shady walks followed the banks where the whip-like branches of the willows, showing shoots of tenderest green, trailed in the water, or swayed like loose harp-strings to the breeze. All the houses that had sprung up around Lake Wendery had well-stocked spreading grounds, but Ocock's outdid the rest. The groom opening a pair of decorative iron gates, which were the showpiece of the neighbourhood, Mahony turned in and drove past exotic firs, Morton Bay fig-trees, and arrow carriers, past cherished English hollies growing side by side with giant cacti. In one corner stood a rockery, where a fountain played and goldfish swam in a basin. The house itself, of brick and two-storied, with massive bay windows, had an ornamental veranda on one side. The drawing-room was a medley of gilt and lustres, mirrors and glass shades. The finest objects from Dandaloo had been brought here, only to be outdone by Henry's own additions. Yes, Ocock lived in grand style nowadays, as befitted one of the most important men in the town. His old father once gone, and Mahony alone knew why the latter's existence acted as a drag, he would no doubt stand for Parliament. Invited to walk into the breakfast-room, Mahony there found the family seated at table. It was a charming scene. Behind the urn Mrs. Henry, in beribboned cap and morning wrapper, dandled her infant, while Henry, in oriental gown and Turkish fez, had laid his newspaper by to ride his young son on his foot. Mahony refused tea or coffee, but could not avoid drawing up a chair, touching the peachy cheeks of the children held aloft for his inspection, and meeting a fire of playful sallies and kindly inquiries. As he did so, he was sensitively aware that it fell to him to break up the peace of this household. Only he knew the canker that had begun to eat at its roots. The children borne off, 
Mrs. Henry interrogated her husband's pleasure with a pretty may I or should I lift of the brows, and gathering that he wished her to retire, laid her small plump hand in Mahony's, sent a graceful message to dearest Mary, and swept the folds of her gown from the room. Henry followed her with a well-pleased eye. His opinion was no secret that in figure and bearing his wife bore a marked resemblance to Her Majesty the Queen, and admonished her not to fail to partake of some light refreshment during the morning in the shape of a glass of sherry and a biscuit. "'Unless, my love, you prefer me to order cook to whip you up an eggnog. "'Mrs. Ocock is, I regret to say, entirely without appetite again,' he went on, as the door closed behind his wife. "'What she eats is not enough to keep a sparrow going. "'You must prove your skill, doctor, and oblige us by prescribing a still more powerful tonic or appetizer. "'The last had no effect whatever.' "'He spoke from the hearth-rug, where he had gone to warm his skirts at the wood-fire, audibly fingering the while a nest of sovereigns in a waistcoat pocket. "'I feared as much,' said Mahony gravely, and therewith took the plunge. When some twenty minutes later he emerged from the house, he was unaccompanied, and himself pulled the front door to behind him. He stood frowning heavily as he snapped the catches of his gloves, and fell foul of the groom over a buckle of the harness, in a fashion that left the man open-mouthed. "'Blow me if I don't believe he's got the sack,' thought the man in driving townwards. The abrupt stoppage of Richard's visits to Plevna House staggered Mary, and since she could get nothing out of her husband, she tied on her bonnet and went off hot-foot to question her friend. But Mrs. Henry tearfully declared her ignorance. She had listened in fear and trembling to the sound of the two angry voices, and Henry was adamant. They had already called in another doctor. Mary came home greatly distressed, and Richard, still wearing his obstinate front, she ended by losing her temper. He knew well enough, said she, it was not her way to interfere or to be inquisitive about his patience, but this was different, this had to do with one of her dearest friends, she must know. In her ears rang Agnes's words, "'Henry told me, love, he wouldn't insult me by repeating what your husband said of me. Oh, Mary, isn't it dreadful, and when I liked him so as a doctor?' She now repeated them aloud. This was too much for Mahony. He blazed up. "'The confounded mischief-monger! The backbiter! Well, if you will have it, wife, here you are. Here's the truth. What I said to Ocock was, I said, My good man, if you want your wife to get over her next confinement more quickly, keep the sherry decanter out of her reach.' Mary gasped and sank on a chair, letting her arms flop to her side. "'Richard!' she ejaculated. "'Oh, Richard, you never did!' "'I did indeed, my dear. Oh, well, not in just those words, of course. We doctors must always wrap the truth up in silver paper. And I should feel it my duty to do the same again to-morrow, although there are pleasanter things in life, Mary, I can assure you, than informing a low mongrel like Ocock that his wife is drinking on the sly. You can have no notion, my dear, of the compliments one calls down on one's head by so doing.' The case is beyond my grasp, of course, and I am cloaking my own shortcomings by making scandalous insinuations against a delicate lady, who takes no more than her position entitles her to, his very words, Mary, for the purpose of keeping up her strength. And Mahony laughed hotly. "'Yes, but was it—I mean, was it really necessary to say it?' stammered Mary, still at sea, and as her husband only shrugged his shoulders— "'Then I can't pretend to be surprised at what has happened, Richard. Mr. Henry will never forgive you. He thinks so much of everything and every one belonging to him.' "'Pray, can I help that? Help his infernal pride? And, good God, Mary, can't you see that far more terrible than my having had to tell him the truth is the fact of there being such a truth to tell?' "'Oh, yes, indeed I can,' and the warm tears rushed to Mary's eyes. "'Poor, poor little Agnes!' "'Richard, it comes of her having once been married to that dreadful man. "'And though she doesn't say so, yet I don't believe she's really happy in her second marriage either. "'There are so many things she's not allowed to do, and she's afraid of Mr. Henry. I know she is. "'You see, he's displeased when she's dull or unwell. She must always be bright and look pretty. "'And I expect the truth is, since her illness, she has taken to taking things, just to keep her spirits up.' "'Here Mary saw a ray of light and snatched at it. "'But in that case, mightn't the need for them pass as she grows stronger?' "'I lay no claim to be a prophet, my dear.' 
"'For it does seem strange that I never noticed anything,' went on Mary, more to herself than to him. "'I've seen Agnes at all hours of the day, when she wasn't in the least expecting visitors. "'Yes, Richard, I do know people sometimes eat things to take the smell away. "'But the idea of Agnes doing anything so—so so low! "'Oh, isn't it just possible that there might be some mistake?' "'Oh, well, if you're going to imitate Ocock and try to teach me my business,' gave back Mahony with an angry gesture, and sitting down at the table he pulled books and papers to him. "'As if such a thing would ever occur to me. It's only that—that that somehow my brain won't take it in. Agnes has always been such a dear, good little soul, all kindness. She's never done anybody any harm, or said a hard word about anyone all the years I've known her. I simply can't believe it of her, and that's the truth.' "'As for what people will say when it gets about that you've been shown the door in a house like Mr. Henry's, why, I'm afraid even to think of it.' And powerless any longer to keep back her tears, Mary hastened from the room. But she also thought it wiser to get away before Richard had time to frame the request that she should break off all intercourse with Plevner House. This she could never promise to do, and the result might be a quarrel. Whereas if she avoided giving her word, she would be free to slip out now and then to see poor Agnes, when Richard was on his rounds and Mr. Henry at business. But this was the only point clear to her. In standing up for her friend she had been perfectly sincere. To think ill of a person she cared for cost Mary an inward struggle. Against this, however, she had an antipathy to set that was almost stronger than herself. Of all forms of vice, intemperance was the one she hated most. She lived in a country where it was, alas, only too common, but she had never learnt to tolerate it, or to look with a lenient eye on those who succumbed, and whether these were but the slaves of the nipping habit, or the eternal dram-drinkers who felt fit for nothing if they had not a peg inside them, or those seasoned topers who drank their companions under the table without themselves turning a hair or yet again those who, sober for three parts of the year, spent the fourth in secret debauches. Herself she had remained as rigidly abstemious as in the days of her girlhood, and she often mused, with a glow at her heart, on her great good fortune in having found in Richard one whose views on this subject were no less strict than her own. Hence her distress at his disclosure was caused not alone by the threatened loss of her friendship. She wept for the horror with which the knowledge filled her. Little by little, though, her mind worked around to what was, after all, the chief consideration, Richard's action and its probable consequences. And here, once more, she was divided against herself. For a moment she had hoped her husband would own the chance of him being in error, but she soon saw that this would never do. A mistake on his part would be a blow to his reputation, besides making enemies of people like the Henrys for nothing. If he had to lose them as patients, it might as well be for a good solid reason, she told herself with a dash of his own asperity. No, it was a case of either husband or friend. And though she pitied Agnes from the bottom of her heart, yet there were literally no lengths she would have shrunk from going to, to spare Richard pain or even anxiety. And this led her on to wonder whether, granted things were as he said, he had approached Mr. Henry in the most discreet way. Could he not have avoided a complete break? She sat and pondered this question until her head ached, finding herself up against the irreconcilability of the practical with the ideal, which complicates a man's working life. What she belatedly tried to think out for her husband was some little common-sense stratagem by means of which he could have salved his conscience without giving offence. He might have said that the drugs he was prescribing would be nullified by the use of wine or spirits, even better have warned Agnes in private. Somehow it might surely have been managed. Mr. Henry had no doubt been extremely rude and overbearing, but in earlier years Richard had known how to behave towards ill-breeding. She couldn't tell why, but he was finding it more and more difficult to get on with people nowadays. He certainly had a very great deal to do, and was often tired out. Again, he did not need to care so much as formerly whether he offended people or not. Ordinary patients, that was. The Henrys, of course, were of the utmost consequence. Still, once on a time, he had been noted for his tact. It was sad to see it leaving him in the lurch. Several times of late she had been forced to step in and smooth out awkwardnesses. But a week ago he had poor little Amelia Grindle up in arms— 
by telling her that her sickly firstborn would mentally never be quite like other children. To everyone else this had been plain from the outset, but Amelia had suspected nothing, having, poor thing, no idea when a babe ought to begin to take notice or cut its teeth. Richard said it was better for her to face the truth betimes than to spend her life vainly hoping and fretting. Indeed, it would not be right of him to allow it. Poor dear Richard! He set such store by truth and principle, and she, Mary, would not have had him otherwise. All the same, she thought that in both cases a small compromise would not have hurt him. But compromise he would not, or could not. And, as recalled to reality by the sight of the week's washing, which strained, ballooned, collapsed on its lines in the yard, Biddy was again letting the clothes get much too dry. As Mary rose to her feet, she manfully squared her shoulders to meet the weight of the new burden that was being laid on them. With regard to Mahony, it might be supposed that, having faithfully done what he believed to be his duty, he would enjoy the fruits of a quiet mind. This was not so. Before many hours had passed, he was wrestling with the incident anew, and a true son of that nation, which, for all its level-headedness, spends its best strength in fighting shadows, he felt a great deal angrier in retrospect than he had done at the moment. It was not alone the fact of him having got his congé, no medico was safe from that punch below the belt. His bitterness was aimed at himself. Once more he had let himself be hoodwinked, had written down the smooth civility it pleased Ocock to adopt towards him to respect and esteem. Now that the veil was torn, he saw how poor the lawyer's opinion of him actually was, and always had been. For memory was struggling to emerge in him, setting strings in vibration, and suddenly there rose before him a picture of Ocock that time had dimmed. He saw the latter standing in the dark crowded lobby of the courthouse, cursing at him for letting their witness escape. There it was. There, in these two scenes, far apart as they lay, you had the whole man. The unctuous blandness, the sleek courtesy, was but a mask, which he wore for you just so long as you did not hinder him by getting in his way. That was the unpardonable sin. For Ocock was out to succeed, to succeed at any price and by any means. In tracing his course, no goal but this had ever stood before him. The obligations that bore on your ordinary mortal— a sense of honesty, of responsibility to one's fellows, the soft pull of domestic ties, did not trouble Ocock. He laughed them down, or wrung their necks like so many pullets. And should the poor little woman who bore his name become a drag on him, she would be tossed onto the rubbish heap with the rest. In a way, so complete a freedom from altruistic motives had something grandiose about it. But those who ran up against it and could not fight it with its own weapons had not an earthly chance. Thus Mahony sat in judgment, giving rein for once to his ingrained dislike for the man of whom he had now made an enemy, in whose debt for the rest he stood deep, and had done, ever since the day he had been fool enough, like the fly in the nursery rhyme, to seek out Ocock and his familiars in their grimy little parlour in Chancery Lane. But his first heat spent he soon cooled down, and was able to laugh at the stagey explosiveness of his attitude. So much for the personal side of the matter— Looked at from a business angle, it was more serious. The fact of him having been shown the door by a patient of Ocock's standing was bound, as Mary saw, to react unfavourably on the rest of the practice. The news would run like wildfire through the place. Never were such hotbeds of gossip as these colonial towns. Besides, the colleague who had been called in to Mrs. Agnes in his stead was none too well disposed towards him. His fears were justified. It quickly got about that he had made a blunder. All Mrs. Henry needed, said the newcomer, was change of air and scene. And forthwith the lady was packed off on a trial trip to Sydney. Mahony held his head high and refused to notice looks and hints. But he knew all about what went on behind his back. He was morbidly sensitive to atmosphere, could tell how a house was charged as soon as he crossed the threshold. People were saying, "'A mistake there. Why not here, too?' Slow recoveries asked themselves if a fresh treatment might not benefit them. Lovers of blue pills hungered for more drastic remedies. The disaffection would blow over, of course, but it was painful while it lasted, and things were not bettered by one of his patients choosing just this inconvenient moment to die, an elderly man, down with the Russian influenza, who disobeyed orders, got up too early, and was carried off by double pneumonia inside a week. 
Worry over the mishap robbed his poor medical attendant of sleep for several nights on end. Not that this was surprising. He found it much harder than of old to keep his mind from running on his patients outside working hours. In his younger days he had laid down fixed rules on this score. Every brain-worker he held must, in his spare time, be able to detach his thoughts from his chief business, pin them to something of quite another kind, no matter how trivial, keep fowls or root around gardens, play the flute or go in for carpentry. Now he might have dug till his palms blistered, it would not help. Those he prescribed for teased him like a pack of spirit presences which clamour to be heard and if a serious case took a turn for the worse, he would find himself rising in a sweat of uncertainty, and going lamp in hand into the surgery, to con over a prescription he had written during the day. And one knew where that kind of thing led. Now, as if all this were not enough, there was added to it the old evergreen botheration about money. End of Part 4 Chapter 9《パート4》Chapter 10 of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part 4 》Chapter 10. Thus far, Ocock had nursed his mining investments for him with a fatherly care. He himself had been free as a bird from responsibility. Every now and again he would drop in at the office just to make sure the lawyer was on the alert, and each time he came home cheerful with confidence. That was over now. As a first result of the breach, he missed, or so he believed, clearing four hundred pounds. Among the shares he held was one lot which till now had proved a sorry bargain. Soon after purchase, something had gone wrong with the management of the claim. There had been a lawsuit, followed by calls unending, and never a dividend. Now, when these shares unexpectedly swung up to a high level, only to drop back the week after to their standing figure, Ocock failed to sell out in the nick of time call to account, he replied that it was customary in these matters for his clients to advise him, thus deepening Mahony's sense of obligation. Stabbed in his touchiness, he wrote for all his script to be handed over to him, and thereafter loss and gain depended on himself alone. It certainly brought a new element of variety into his life. The mischief was he could get to his study of the money-market only with a fagged brain, and the fear lest he should do something rash or let a lucky chance slip kept him on tenterhooks. It was about this time that Mary, seated one evening in face of her husband, found herself reflecting, "'When one comes to think of it, how seldom Richard ever smiles nowadays!' For a wonder they were at a soiree together, at the house of one of Marnie's colleagues. The company consisted of the inner circle of friends and acquaintances. "'Always the same people, the old job lot. One knows before they open their mouths what they'll say and how they'll say it. Richard had grumbled as he dressed. The Henry Ococks were not there, though, it being common knowledge that the two men declined to meet, and a dash of fresh blood was present in the shape of a lady and gentleman just out from home. Richard got in to talk with this couple, and Mary, watching him fondly, could not but be struck by his animation. His eyes lit up, he laughed and chatted, made Mary repartee. She was carried back to the time when she had known him first. In those days his natural gravity was often cut through by a mood of high spirits, of boyish jollity, which, if only by way of contrast, rendered him a delightful companion. She grew a little wistful as she sat comparing present with past, and loath though she was to dig deep for fear of stirring up uncomfortable things, she could not escape the discovery that in spite of all his success, and his career there had surpassed their dearest hopes, in spite of the natural gifts fortune had showered on him, Richard was not what you would call a happy man. No, nor even moderately happy. Why this should be, it went beyond her to say. He had everything he could wish for, yes, everything, except perhaps a little more time to himself, and better health. He was not as strong as she would have liked to see him. Nothing radically wrong, of course, but enough to fidget him. Might not this—this—he himself called it want of tone—be a reason for the scant pleasure he got out of life? and, I think I'll pop down and see Dr. Munce about him one morning, without a word to him, was how she eased her mind and wound up her reverie. But daylight and the most prosaic hours of the twenty-four made the plan look absurd. Once alive, though, to his condition, she felt deeply sorry for him and his patent inability ever to be content. It was a thousand pities. 
Things might have run so smoothly for him. He have got so much satisfaction out of them, if only he could have braced himself to regard life in cheerier fashion. But at this Mary stopped, and wondered, and wondered. Was that really true? Positively, her experiences of late led her to believe that Richard would be less happy still if he had nothing to be unhappy about. But, dear me, this was getting out of her depth altogether. She shook her head and rebuked herself for growing fanciful. All the same, her new glimpse of his inmost nature made her doubly tender of thwarting him. Hence she did not set her face as firmly as she might otherwise have done, against a wild plan he now formed of again altering, or indeed rebuilding the house, although she could scarcely think of it with patience. She liked her house so well as it stood, and it was amply big enough. There was only the pair of them, and John's child. It had the name, she knew, of being one of the most comfortable and best kept in Ballarat brick for solidity where wood prevailed, and a wide snowy veranda, up the posts of which rare creepers ran, twining their tendrils one with another to form a screen against the sun. Now, what must Richard do but uproot the creepers and pull down the veranda, thus bearing the walls to the fierce summer heat, plaster over the brick, and more outlandish still, add a top story? When she came back from Melbourne, where she had gone a-visiting to escape the upset, Richard, ordinarily so sensitive, had managed to endure it quite well, thus proving that he could put up with discomfort if he wanted to. When she saw it again, Mary hardly recognised her home. Personally, she thought it ugly for all its grandeur, changed wholly for the worse. Nor did time ever reconcile her to the upper story. Domestic worries bred from it. The staff went off in a huff because of the stairs. They were at once obliged to double their staff. To cap it all, with its flat front unbroken by bay or porch, the house looked like no other in the town. Now, instead of passing admiring remarks, people stood stock-still before the gate to laugh at its droll appearance. Yet she would gladly have made the best of this, had Richard been the happier for it. He was not, or only for the briefest of intervals. Then his restlessness broke out afresh. There came days when nothing suited him, not his fine consulting-room or the improved furnishings of the house, or even her cookery, of which he had once been so fond. He grew dainty to a degree. She searched her cookery-book for piquant recipes. Next he fell to imagining it was unhealthy to sleep on feathers, and went to the expense of having a hard horsehair mattress made to fit the bed. Accustomed to the softest down, he naturally tossed and turned all night long— and rose in the morning, declaring he felt as though he had been beaten with sticks. The mattress was stowed away in a lean-to behind the kitchen, and there it remained. It was not alone. Mary sometimes stood and considered, with a rueful eye, the many discarded objects that bore it company. Richard, oddly enough he was ever able to poke fun at himself, had christened this outhouse the Cemetery of Dead Fads. Here was a set of Indian clubs he had been going to harden his muscles with every morning, and had used for a week, together with an india-rubber gymnastic apparatus bought for the same purpose. Here stood a patent shower-bath that was to have dashed energy over him after a bad night, and had only succeeded in giving him acute neuralgia. A standing-desk he had broken his back at for a couple of days, a homeopathic medicine-chest and a phrenological head, both subjects he had meant to satisfy his curiosity by looking into, had time not failed him. Mary sighed when she thought of the waste of good money these and similar articles stood for. Some day he would just have them privately carted away to auction. But if Richard set his heart on a thing, he wanted it so badly, so much more than other people did, that he knew no peace until he had it. Mahony read in his wife's eyes the disapproval she was too wise to utter. At any other time her silent criticism would have galled him. In this case he took shelter behind it. Let her only go on setting him down for lax and spendthrift, incapable of knowing his own mind. He would be sorry indeed for her to guess how matters really stood with him. The truth was, he had fallen a prey to utter despondency, was become so spiritless that it puzzled even himself. He thought he could trace some of the mischief back to the professional knocks and jars Ocock's action had brought down on him. To hear one's opinion doubted, one's skill questioned, was the tyro's portion— he was too old to treat such insolence with the scorn it deserved. Of course he had lived the affair down, but the result of it would seem to be a bottomless ennui, a tedium vitae that had something pathological about it. Under its influence the homeliest trifle swelled defeats beyond his strength. 
There was, for instance, the putting off and on of one's clothing, this infinite boredom of straps and buttons, and all for what? For a day that would be an exact copy of the one that had gone before, a night as unrefreshing as the last. Did any one suspect that there were moments when he quailed before this job, suspect that more than once he had even reckoned the number of times he would be called on to perform it, day in, day out, till that garment was put on him that came off no more, or that he could understand and feel sympathy with those faint souls, and there were such, who laid hands on themselves rather than go on doing it, did this get abroad he would be considered ripe for bedlam. Physician, heal thyself. He swallowed doses of a tonic preparation, and put himself on a fatty diet. Thereafter he tried to take a philosophic view of his case. He had now, he told himself, reached an age when such a state of mind gave cause neither for astonishment nor alarm. How often had it not fallen to him, in his role of medical adviser, to reassure a patient on this score? The arrival of middle age brought about a certain lowness of spirits in even the most robust— Along with a more or less marked bodily languor went an uneasy sense of coming loss. The time was at hand to bid farewell to much that had hitherto made life agreeable, and for most this was a bitter pill. Meanwhile one held a kind of mental stock-taking, as often as not by the light of a complete disillusionment. Of the many glorious things one had hoped to do or to be, nothing was accomplished— the great realisation, in youth breathlessly chased but never grasped, was now seen to be a mist-wraith which could wear a thousand forms, but invariably turn to air as one came up with it. In nine instances out of ten there was nothing to put in its place, and you began to ask yourself in a kind of horrific amaze, "'Can this be all, this? For this, the pother of growth, the struggles and the sufferings?' the soul's climacteric, if you would, from which a mortal came forth dull to resignation, or greedy for the few physical pleasures left him, or prone to that tragic clinging to youth's skirts which made the later years of many women and not a few men ridiculous. In each case the motive power was the same, the haunting fear that one had squeezed life dry, worse still, that it had not been worth the squeezing. Thus his reason— but like a tongue of flame his instinct leapt up to give combat. By the gods this cap did not fit him. Squeezed life dry, found it not worth while. Why, he'd never got within measurable distance of what he called life at all. There could be no question of him resigning himself. Deep down in him he knew was an enormous residue of vitality, of untouched mental energy that only waited to be drawn on. It was like a buried treasure jealously kept for the event of his one day catching up with life, not the bare scramble for a living that here went by that name, but life with a capital L. The existence he had once confidently counted on as his, a tourney of spiritual adventuring, of intellectual excitement, in which the prize striven for was not money or anything to do with money. Far away, thousands of miles off, luckier men than he were in the thick of it. He, of his own free will, had cut himself adrift, and now it was too late. But was it? Had the time irretrievably gone by? The ancient idea of escape, long dormant, suddenly reawoke in him with a new force. And once stirring, it was not to be silenced, but went on sounding like a ground-tone through all he did. At first he shut his ears to it, to dally with side-issues. For example, he worried the question why the breaking-point should only now have been reached, and not six months a year ago. It was quibbling to lay the whole blame on Ocock's shoulders. The real cause went deeper, was of older growth, and driving his mind back over the past, he believed he could pin his present loss of grip to that fatal day on which he learnt that his best friend had betrayed him. Things like that give you a crack that would not mend. He had been rendered suspicious where he had once been credulous, prone to see evil where no evil was. For deceived by Purdy, in whom could he trust? of a surety not in the pushful set of jobbers and tricksters he was condemned to live amongst. No discoveries he might make about them would surprise him, and once more the old impotent anger with himself broke forth that he should ever have let himself take root in such detestable surroundings. Why not shake the dust of the country off his feet? From this direct attack he recoiled, casting up his hands as if against the evil eye. What next? But exclaim as he might— now that the idea had put on words, it was by no means so simple to fend it off as when it had been a mere vague humming at the back of his mind. It seized him, swept his brain bare of other thoughts. He began to look worn. 
and never more so than when he imagined himself taking the bull by the horns and asking Mary's approval of his wild-goose scheme. He could picture her face when she heard that he planned throwing up his fine position and decamping on nothing a year. The vision was a cold douche to his folly. No, no, it would not do. You could not accustom a woman to ease and luxury, and then, when you felt you had had enough and would welcome a return to Spartan simplicity, to an austere clarity of living, expect her to be prepared, at the word, to step back into poverty. One was bound, bound by just those silken threads which, in premarital days, had seemed sheerly desirable. He wondered now what it would be like to stand, free as the wind, answerable only to himself. The bare thought of it filled him as with the rushing of wings. Once he had been within an ace of cutting and running. That was in the early days, soon after his marriage. Trade had petered out, and there would have been as little to leave behind as to carry with him. But even so, circumstances had proved too strong for him. What with Mary's persuasions and John's intermeddling, his scheme had come to nothing. And if, with so much in his favour, he had not managed to carry it out, how in all the world could he hope to now, when everything conspired against him? It was, besides, excusable in youth to challenge fortune, a very different matter for one of his age. Of his age. The words gave him pause. By their light he saw why he had knuckled under so meekly at the time of his first attempt. It was because then a few years one way or another did not signify. He had them to spare. Now each individual year was precious to him. He parted with it lingeringly, unwillingly. Time had taken to flashing past, too. Christmas was hardly celebrated before it was again at the door. Another ten years or so, and he would be an old man, and it would, in very truth, be too late. The tempter voice, in this case also the voice of reason, said now or never. But when he came to look the facts in the face, his heart failed him anew, so heavily did the arguments against his taking such a step, and true to his race it was these he began by marshalling, weigh down the scales. He should have done it, if done it was to be, five, three, even a couple of years ago. Each day that dawned added to the tangle, made the idea seem more preposterous. Local dignities had been showered on him. He sat on the committees of the district hospital and the benevolent asylum, was honorary medical officer to this society and that, a trustee of the church, one of the original founders of the Mechanics Institute, vice-president of the Botanical Society, and so on, ad infinitum. His practice was second to none, his visiting-book rarely showed a blank space. People drove in from miles round to consult him. In addition, he had an extremely popular wife, a good house and garden, horses and traps, and a sure yearly income of some twelve or thirteen hundred. Of what stuff was he made that he could likely contemplate turning his back on prizes such as these? Even as he told them off, however, the old sense of hollowness was upon him again. His life there reminded him of a gaudy drop-scene let down before an empty stage, a painted sham with darkness and vacuity behind. At bottom none of these distinctions and successes meant anything to him. Not a scrap of mental pabulum could be got from them. Rather would he have chosen to be poor and a nobody among people whose thoughts flew to meet his half-way. And there was another side to it. Stingy though the years had been of intellectual grist, they had not scrupled to rob him of many an essential by which he set store. His old faculty, for good or evil, of swift decision, for instance, it was lost to him now— as witness his present miserable vacillation. It had gone off arm in arm with his health. Physically he was but a ghost of the man he had once been. But the bitterest grudge he bore the life was for the shipwreck it had made of his early ideals. He remembered the pure joy, the lofty sentiments with which he had returned to medicine. Bah! There had been no room for any sentimental nonsense of that kind here. He had long since ceased to follow his profession disinterestedly. The years had made a hack of him. A skilled hack, of course, but just a hack. He had had no time for study. All his strength had gone in keeping his income up to a certain figure, lest the wife should be less well-dressed and equipped than her neighbours, or patients fight shy of him, or his confrères wag their tongues. Oh, he had adapted himself supremely well to the standards of this Australia, so-called Felix. And he must not complain if, in so doing, he had been stripped not only of his rosy dreams— but also of that spiritual force on which he could once have drawn at will. 
Like a fool, he had believed it possible to serve Mammon with impunity, and for as long as it suited him. He knew better now. At this moment he was undergoing the sensations of one who, having taken shelter in what he thinks a light and flimsy structure, finds that it is built of the solidest stone. Worse still, that he has been walled up inside. And even suppose he could pull himself together for the effort required, how justify his action in the eyes of the world? His motives would be double Dutch to the hard-headed crew around him, nor would any go to the trouble of trying to understand. There was John. All John would see was an elderly and not over-robust man, deliberately throwing away the fruits of year-long toil. And for what? For the privilege of, in some remote spot, as a stranger and unknown, having his way to make all over again, of being free to shoulder once more the risks and hazards the undertaking involved. And little though he cared for John or any one else's opinion, Mahony could not help feeling a trifle sore, in advance, at the ridicule of which he might be the object, at the zanyish figure he was going to be obliged to cut. But a fig for what people thought of him. Once away from here, he would, he thanked God, never see any of them again. No, it was Mary who was the real stumbling-block, the opponent he most feared. Had he been less attached to her, the thing would have been easier. As it was, he shrank from hurting her. And hurt and confuse her he must. He knew Mary as well, nay, better than he knew his own unreckonable self. For Mary was not a creature of moods, did not change her mental envelope a dozen times a day and just his precise knowledge of her told him that he would never get her to see eye to eye with him. Her clear, serene outlook was attuned to the plain and the practical. She would discover a thousand drawbacks to his scheme, but nary a one of the incorporeal benefits he dreamed of reaping from it. There was his handling of money, for one thing. She had come, he was aware, to regard him as incurably extravagant, and it would be no easy task to convince her that he could learn again to fit his expenses to a light purse. She had a woman's instinctive distrust, too, of leaving the beaten track. Another point made him still more dubious. Mary's whole heart and happiness were bound up in this place where she had spent the flower years of her life. Who knew if she would thrive as well on other soil? He found it intolerable to think that she might have to pay for his want of stability. Yes, reduced to its essentials, it came to mean the pitting of one soul's welfare against that of another. It was a toss-up between his happiness and hers. One of them would have to yield. Who would suffer more by doing so, he or she? He believed that a sacrifice on his part would make the wreck of his life complete. On hers, well, thanks to her doughty habit of finding good everywhere, there was a chance of her coming out unscathed. Here was his case in a nutshell. Still he did not tackle Mary. For sometimes, after all, a disturbed doubt crept upon him whether it would not be possible to go on as he was, instead of, as she would drastically word it, cutting his throat with his own hand. And to be perfectly honest, he believed it would. He could now afford to pay for help in his work, to buy what books he needed or fancied, to take holidays while putting in a locum, even to keep on the locum at a good salary, while he journeyed overseas to visit the land of his birth. But at this another side of him, what he thought of as spirit, in contradistinction to soul, cried out in alarm, fearful lest it was again to be betrayed. Thus far, though by rights coequal in the house of the body, it had been rigidly kept down. Nevertheless it had persisted, like a bright cold little spark at dead of night. His restlessness, the spiritual malaise that encumbered him, had been its mute form of protest. Did he go on turning a deaf ear to its warning, he might do himself irreparable harm. For time was flying, the sum of his years mounting, shrinking that roomy future to which he had thus far always postponed what seemed too difficult for the moment. Now he saw that he dared delay no longer in setting free the imprisoned elements in him, was he ever to grow to that complete whole which each mortal aspires to be. That a change of environment would work this miracle he did not doubt, a congenial environment was meat and drink to him, was light and air. Here in this country he had remained as utterly alien as any Jew of old who wept by the rivers of Babylon. And, like a half-remembered tune, there came floating into his mind words he had lit on somewhere, or learnt on the school bench. Horace, he thought. But whatever their source, words that fitted his case to a nicety. Coelum non animum, mutant, qui trans mare carunt. 
non animum. Ah! Could he but have foreseen this, foreknown it? If not before he set sail on what was to have been but a swift adventure, then at least on that fateful day long past, when foiled by Mary's pleadings and his own inertia, he had let himself be bound anew. Thus the summer dragged by, a summer to try the toughest. Mahony thought he had never gone through its like for heat and discomfort. The drought would not break, and on the great squatting stations around Ballarat and to the north the sheep dropped like flies at an early frost. The forest reservoirs dried up, displaying the red mud of their bottoms, and a bath became a luxury, or a penance, the scanty water running thick and red. Then the bush caught fire and burnt for three days, painting the sky a rusty brown, and making the air hard to breathe. Of a morning his first act on going into the surgery was to pick up the thermometer that stood on the table. Sure as fate, though the clock had not long struck nine, the mercury marked something between a hundred and a hundred and five degrees. He let it fall with a nerveless gesture. Since his sunstroke he not only hated, he feared the sun. But out into it he must, to drive through dust clouds so opaque that one could only draw rain until they subsided, meanwhile hallowing off collisions. Under the close leather hood he sat and stifled, or, removing his green goggles for the fiftieth time, climbed down to enter yet another baked wooden house, where he handled prostrate bodies rank with sweat, or prescribed for pallid or fever-speckled children. Then home, to toy with the food set before him, his mind already running on the discomforts of the afternoon. Two bits of ill-luck came his way this summer. Old Ocock fell, in dismounting from a vehicle, and sustained a compound fracture of the femur. Owing to his advanced age, there was, for a time, fear of malunion of the parts, and this kept Mahony on the rack. Secondly, a near neighbour, a common little fellow who kept a jeweller's shop in Bridge Street, actually took the plunge, sold off one fine day, and sailed for home. And this seemed the unkindest cut of all. But the accident that gave the death-blow to his scruples was another. On the advice of a wealthy publican he was treating, whose judgment he trusted, Mahony had invested, heavily for him, selling off other stock to do it, in a company known as the Hodderburn Estate. This was a government affair, and ought to have been beyond reproach. One day, however, it was found that the official reports of the work done by the diamond drill-bore were cooked documents, and instantly every one connected with the mine, directors, managers, engineers, lay under the suspicion of fraudulent dealings. Shares had risen as high as ten pounds odd, but when the drive reached the bore, and in place of the deep gutter ground the public had been led to expect, hard rock was found overhead, there was a panic, shares dropped to twenty-five shillings, and did not rally. Mahony was a loser by six hundred pounds, and got, besides, a moral shaking from which he could not recover. He sat and bit his little fingernail to the quick. Was he, he savagely asked himself, going to linger on until the little he had managed to save was snatched from him? He dashed off a letter to John, asking his brother-in-law to recommend a reliable broker. And this done, he got up to look for Mary, determined to come to grips with her at last. End of Part 4 Chapter 10《パート4チャプター11 of Australia Felix。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson。パート4チャプター11 How to begin? How reduced to a few plain words the subtle tangle of thought and feeling was the problem. He did not find his wife on her usual seat in the arbour. In searching for her upstairs and down, he came to a rapid decision. He would lay chief stress on his poor state of health. I feel I'm killing myself. I can't go on. But Richard, dear, ejaculated Mary, and paused in her sewing, her needle uplifted, a bead balanced on its tip. Richard had run her to earth in the spare bedroom, to which at this time she often repaired. For he objected to the piece of work she had on hand, that of covering yards of black cashmere with minute jet beads, vowing that she would ruin her eyesight over it. So, having set her heart on a fashionable polonaise, she was careful to keep out of his way. "'I'm not a young man any longer, wife, when one's past forty. Poor mother used to say forty-five was a man's prime of life. Not for me, and not here in this God-forsaken hole. Oh, dear me, I do wonder why you have such a down on Ballarat. I'm sure there must be many worse places in the world to live in.' And lowering her needle, Mary brought the bead to its appointed spot. 
"'Of course you have a lot to do, I know, and being such a poor sleeper doesn't improve matters.' But she was considering her pattern sideways as she spoke, thinking more of it than of what she said. Everyone had to work hard out here. Compared with some she could name, Richard's job of driving around in a springy buggy seemed ease itself. "'Besides, I told you at the time you were wrong not to take a holiday in winter when you had the chance. You need a thorough change every year to set you up. You came back from the last as fresh as a daisy.' "'The only change that will benefit me is one for good and all,' said Mahony, with extreme gloom. He had thrown up the bed-curtain and stretched himself on the bed, where he lay with his hands clasped under his neck. Tutored by experience, Mary did not contradict him. "'And it's the kind I've finally made up my mind to take.' "'Richard, how you do run on,' said Mary, still gently incredulous, but a thought wider awake, let her work sink to her lap. "'What's the use of talking like that?' "'Believe it or not, my dear, as you choose. You'll see, that's all.' At her further exclamations of doubt and amazement, Mahony's patience slipped its leash. "'Surely to goodness my health comes first, before any confounded practice?' "'Hush, baby's asleep. And don't get cross, Richard. You can hardly expect me not to be surprised when you spring a thing of this sort on me. You've never even dropped a hint of it before.' "'Because I knew very well what it would be. You're dead against it, of course.' "'No, I call that unjust. You've barely let me get a word in edgeways.' "'Oh, I know by heart everything you're going to say. It's nonsense, folly, madness, and so on. All the phrases you women fish up from your vocabulary when you want to stave off a change, hinder any alteration of the status quo. But I'll tell you this, wife, you'll bury me here if I don't get away soon. I'm not much more than skin and bone as it is. And I confess, if I've got to be buried, I'd rather lie elsewhere.' have good English earth atop of me. Had Mary been a man, she might have retorted that this was a very woman's way of shifting ground. She bit her lip and did not answer immediately, then, "'You know, I can't bear to hear you talk like that, even in fun. Besides, you always say much more than you mean, dear.' "'Very well, then. If you prefer it, wait and see. You'll be sorry some day.' "'Do you mean to tell me, Richard, you're in earnest when you talk of selling off your practice and going to England?' "'I can buy another there, can't I?' With these words he leapt to his feet, afire with animation. And while Mary, now thoroughly uneasy, was folding up her work, he dilated upon the benefits that would accrue to them from the change. Good-bye to dust and sun and drought, to blistering hot winds and papier-mâché walls. They would make their new home in some substantial old stone house that had weathered half a century or more, tangled over with creepers, folded away in its own privacy, such as only an English house could be. In the flower-garden roses would trail over arch and pergola. There would be a lawn with shaped yews on it, while in the orchard old apple-trees would flaunt their red abundance above grey lichened walls. "'As if there weren't apples enough here,' thought Mary." He got a frog in his throat as he went on to paint in greater detail for her, who had left it so young, the intimate charm of the home country, the rich green dimpled countryside. And not until now did he grasp how sorely he had missed it. Oh, believe me, to talk of going home is no mere figure of speech, Mary. In fancy he trod winding lanes that ran between giant hedges, hedges in tender bud with dew on them, or snowed over with white mayflowers or behung with the fairy webs and gossamer of early autumn, thick as twine beneath their load of moisture. He followed white roads that were banked with primroses and ran headlong down to the sea. He climbed the shoulder of a down on a spring morning, when the air was alive with larks carolling. But chiefly it was the greenness that called to him, the greenness of the greenest country in the world. Viewed from this distance, the homeland looked to him like one vast meadow. Oh, to tread its grass again! Not what one knew as grass here, a poor annual that lasted for a few brief weeks, but lush meadow-grass a foot high, or shaven emerald lawns on which ancient trees spread their shade, or the rank growth in old orchards, starry with wild flowers on which fruit-blossoms fluttered down. He longed, too, for the exquisite finishedness of the mother country, the soft tints of cloud-veiled northern skies. His eyes ached, his brows had grown wrinkled from gazing on iron roofs set against the hard blue overhead, on dirty weatherboards innocent of paint, on higgledy-piggledy backyards and ramshackle fences, on the straggling landscape with its untidy trees. All the unrelieved ugliness, in short, of the colonial scene. He stopped only for want of breath. Mary was silent. 
He waited. Still she did not speak. He fell to earth with a bump and was angry. "'Come, out with it. I suppose all this seems to you just the ravings of a lunatic.' "'Oh, Richard, no. But a little, well, a little impractical. I never heard before of anyone throwing up a good income because he didn't like the scenery. It's a step that needs the greatest consideration.' "'Good God! Do you think I haven't considered it, and from every angle? There isn't an argument for or against that I haven't gone over a thousand and one times.' "'And with never a word to me, Richard?' Mary was hurt, and showed it. "'It really is hardly fair, for this is my home as well as yours. But now listen. You're tired out, run down with the heat, and that last attack of dysentery. Take a good holiday. Stay away for three months, if you like.' "'Sail over to Hobart Town or up to Sydney, you who are so fond of the water. "'And when you come back strong and well, we'll talk about all this again. "'I'm sure by then you'll see things with other eyes.' "'And who's to look after the practice, Bray? "'Why, a locum tenens, of course, or engage an assistant.' "'Aha! You'd agreed to that now, would you? "'I remember how opposed you were once to the idea. "'Well, if I have to choose between it and you giving up altogether— now, for your own sake, Richard, don't go and do anything rash. If once you sell off and leave Ballarat, you can never come back. And then, if you regret it, where will you be? That's why I say don't hurry to decide. Sleep over it. Or let us consult somebody. John, perhaps. Oh, no, you don't, madam. No, you don't, cried Richard, with a grim dash of humour. You had me once, crippled me, handcuffed me, you and your John between you. It shan't happen again. I crippled you? I, Richard? Oh, I never in my life have I done anything but what I thought was for your good. I've always put you first. And Mary's eyes filled with tears. Yes, where it's a question of one's material welfare, you haven't your equal, I admit that. But the other side of me needs coddling, too, yes, and sympathy. But it can whistle for such a thing as far as you're concerned. Mary sighed. I think you don't realise, dear, how difficult it sometimes is to understand you, or to make out what you really do want she said slowly. Her tone struck at his heart. "'Indeed, and I do,' he cried contritely. "'I'm a born old grumble, Mavornine, I know, contrariness in person. But in this case, come, love, do try to grasp what I'm after. It means so much to me.' And he held out his hand to her, to beseech her. Unhesitatingly, she laid hers in it. "'I am trying, Richard, though you mayn't believe it. I always do. And even if I sometimes can't manage it, "'Well, you know, dear, you generally get your own way in the end. "'Think of the house. "'I'm still not clear why you altered it. "'I liked it much better as it was. "'But I didn't make any fuss, did I? "'Though I should have, if I thought we were only to occupy it for a single year after. "'Still, that was a trifle compared with what you want to do now. "'Though I live to be a hundred, I should never be able to approve of this. "'And you don't know how hard it is to consent to a thing one disapproves of. "'You couldn't do it yourself.' "'Oh, what was the use, Richard, of toiling as you have, "'if now, just when you can afford to charge higher fees "'and the practice is beginning to bring in money?' "'Marney let her hand drop, even giving it a slight push from him, "'and turned to pace the floor anew. "'Oh, money, 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 I'm sick of the very sound of the word. "'But you talk as if nothing else mattered. "'Can't you, for once, wife, see through the letter of the thing "'to the spirit behind? "'I admit the practice has brought in a tidy income of late,' "'but as for the rest of the splendours, they exist, my dear, only in your imagination. "'If you ask me, I say I lead a dog's life. "'Why, even a navvy works only for a fixed number of hours per diem. "'My days have neither beginning nor end. "'Look at yesterday. "'Out in the blazing sun from morning till night, "'I didn't get back from the second round until nine. "'At ten, a confinement that keeps me up until three. "'From three until dawn I toss and turn, far too weary to sleep.' By the time six o'clock struck, you, of course, were slumbering sweetly, I was in hell with tick. At seven I could stand it no longer, and got up for the chloroform bottle, an hour's rest at any price, else how face the crowd in the waiting-room. And you call that splendour, luxurious ease? If so, my dear, words have not the same meaning any more for you and me. Mary did not point out that she had said nothing of the kind, or that he had set up an extreme case as typical— she tightened her lips. Her big eyes were very solemn. "'And it's not the work alone,' Richard was declaring. "'It's the place, wife, the people. I'm done with them, Mary, utterly done. Upon my word, if I thought I had to go on living among them even for another twelve months—' "'But people are the same all the world over. 
The protest broke from her in spite of herself. "'No, by God, they're not!' and here Richard launched into a diatribe against his fellow-colonists. This sordid riff-raff, these hard, mean, grasping money-grubbers! That made Mary stand aghast. What could be the matter with him? What was he thinking of, he who was ordinarily so generous? Had he forgotten the many kindnesses shown him, the warm gratitude of his patients, people's sympathy at the time of his illness? But he went on, my demands are most modest. All I ask is to live among human beings with whom I have half an idea in common, men who sometimes raise their noses from the ground, instead of eternally scheming how to line their pockets, reckoning human progress solely in terms of LSD. No, I've sacrificed enough of my life to this country. I mean to have the rest for myself. And there's another thing, my dear, another bad habit this precious place breeds in us. It begins by making us indifferent to those who belong to us, but are out of our sight, and ends by cutting our closest ties. I don't mean by distance alone. I have an old mother still living, Mary, whose chief prayer is that she may see me once again before she dies. I was her last born, the child her arms kept the shape of. What am I to her now? What does she know of me, of the hard, tired, middle-aged man I have become? And you are in much the same box, my dear, unless you've forgotten by now that you ever had a mother. Mary was scandalised. Forget one's mother? Richard, I think you're trying what dreadful things you can find to say, when I write home every three months. And provoked by this fresh piece of unreason, she opened fire in earnest, in defence of what she believed to be their true welfare. Richard listened to her without interrupting, even seeming to grant the truth of what she said. But none the less, even as she pleaded with him, a numbing sense of futility crept over her. She stuttered, halted, and finally fell silent. Her words were like so many lassoes thrown after his vagrant soul, and this was out of reach. It had sniffed freedom, it was free, ran wild already in the boundless plains of liberty. After he had gone from the room, she sat with idle hands. She was all in a daze. Richard was about to commit an out-and-out -out folly, and she was powerless to hinder it. If only she had had someone she could have talked things over with, taken advice of. But no, it went against the grain in her to discuss her husband's actions with a third person. Purdy had been the sole exception, and Purdy had become impossible. Looking back, she marvelled at her own dullness in not foreseeing that something like this might happen. What more natural than that the multitude of little whims and fads Richard had indulged should culminate in a big whim of this kind? But the acknowledgment caused her fresh anxiety. She had watched him tire, like a fickle child, of first one thing, then another. Was it likely that he would now suddenly prove more stable? She did not think so for she attributed his present mood of pettish aversion wholly to the fact of his being run down in health. It was quite true, he had not been himself of late. But here again he was so fanciful that you never knew how literally to take his ailments. Half the time she believed he just imagined their existence, and the long holiday she had urged on him would have been enough to sweep the cobwebs from his brain. Oh, if only he could have held on in patience! Four or five years hence, at most, he might have considered retiring from general practice. She almost wept as she remembered how they had once planned to live for that day. Now it was all to end in smoke. Then her mind reverted to herself and what the break would mean to her, and her little world rocked to its foundations. For no clear call went out to Mary from her native land. She docilely said home with the rest, and kept her family ties intact, but she had never expected to go back, except on a flying visit. She thought of England rather vaguely as a country where it was always raining, and where, according to John, an assemblage of old fogies, known as the House of Commons, persistently intermeddled in the affairs of the colony. For more than half her life, and the half that truly counted, Australia had been her home. Her home! In fancy she made a round of the house, viewing each cosy room, lingering fondly over the contents of cupboards and presses, recollecting how she had added this piece of furniture for convenience' sake, that for ornament, until the whole was as perfect as she knew how to make it. Now everything she loved and valued—the piano, the wax-candle chandelier, the gilt cornices, the dining-room horsehair—would fall under the auctioneer's hammer, go to deck out the houses of other people. Richard said she could buy better and handsomer things in England— but Mary allowed herself no illusions on this score. Where was the money to come from? 
She had learnt by personal experience what slow work building up a practice was. It would be years and years before they could hope for another such home. And sore and sorry as she might feel at having to relinquish her pretty things, in Richard's case it would mean a good deal more than that. To him the loss of them would be a real misfortune, so used had he grown to luxury and comfort, so strongly did the need of it run in his blood. Worse still was the prospect of parting from relatives and friends. The tears came at this freely. John's children! Who would watch over them when she was gone? How could she, from so far away, keep the promise she had made to poor Jinny on her deathbed? She would have to give up the baby of which she had grown so fond, give it back into Zara's unmotherly hands. And never again of a Saturday would she fetch poor little long-legged Trotty from school. She must say good-bye to one and all, to John and Zara and Jerry, and would know no more at close quarters how they fared. When Jerry married there would be no one to see to it that he chose the right girl. Then Ned and Polly, poor souls, poor souls! What with the rapid increase of their family and Ned's unsteadiness, he could not keep a job long because of it, they only just contrived to make ends meet. How they would do it when she was not there to lend a helping hand she could not imagine. And outside her brothers and sisters there was good Mrs. Devine. Mary had engaged to guide her friend's tottery steps on the slippery path of Melbourne society did Mr. Devine enter the ministry. And poor little Agnes with her terrible weakness! And Amelia and her sickly babes! And Tilly, dear, good, warm-hearted Tilly! Never again would the pair of them enjoy one of their jolly laughs, or cook for a picnic, or drive out to a mushroom-hunt. No, the children would grow up anyhow, her brothers forget her in carving out their own lives, her friends find other friends. For some time, however, she kept her own counsel. But when she had tried by hook and by crook to bring Richard to reason, and failed, when she saw that he was actually beginning on the quiet to make ready for departure, and that the day was coming on which every one would have to know, then she threw off her reserve. She was spending the afternoon with Tilly. They sat on the veranda together, John's child, black-eyed, fat, self-willed, playing after the manner of two short years at their feet. At the news that was broken to her, Tilly began by laughing immoderately, believing that Mary was taking a rise out of her. But having studied her friend's face, she let her work fall, slowly opened mouth and eyes, and was at first unequal to uttering a word. Thereafter she bombarded Mary with questions. "'Wants to leave Ballarat, to go home to England?' she echoed, with an emphasis such as Tilly alone could lay. "'Well, of all the—' "'What for? What on earth for? Has somebody gone and left him a fortune? Or has he been appointed pillmonger in ordinary to the Queen herself? What is it, Mary? What's up?' "'What, indeed? This was the question Mary dreaded, and one that would leap to every tongue. Why was he going?' She sat on the horns of a dilemma. It was not in her to wound people's feelings by blurting out the truth. This would also put Richard in a bad light, and, did she give no reason at all, many would think he had taken leave of his senses. Weakly, in a very unmaryish fashion, she mumbled that his health was not what it should be, and he had got it into his head that for this the climate of the colony was to blame. Nothing would do him but to return to England. "'I never, no, never in my born days did I hear tell of such a thing.' and Tilly, exploding, brought her closed fist heavily down on her knee. "'Mary, for a mere maggot like that, to chuck up a practice such as he's got! Upon my word, my dear, it looks as if he was touched here!' And she significantly tapped her forehead. "'Oh, now I understand. You know, I've seen quite well, love, you've been looking a bit down in the mouth of late, and so has Pa noticed it, too. After you'd gone the other day, he says to me— "'Looks reflexive like, does the little lady nowadays, as if she'd got something on her mind. And I to him, "'Pooh, isn't it enough that she's got to put up with the cranks and crotchets of one of your sex? Oh, Mary, my dear, there's many a true word said in jest. Oh, little did I think what the crotchet would be!' And slowly the rims of Tilly's eyes and the tip of her nose reddened and swelled. "'Now I can't picture it, Mary, what it'll be like here without you,' she said and pulling out her handkerchief blew snort after snort, which was Tilly's way nowadays of having a good cry. "'There, there, baby, Auntie's only got the snivels. For just think of it, Mary. Except that first year or so after you were married, we've been together, you and me, pretty much ever since you came to us that time at the hotel. 
a little black midget of a thing in short frocks. I can still remember how Jin and I laughed at the idea of you teaching us, and our poor Ma said to wait and make sure we weren't laughing on the wrong side of our mouths. And Ma was right, as usual. If ever a clever little kid trod the earth, it was you. Mary pooh-poohed the cleverness. I knew very little more than you yourselves. No, it was you who were all so kind to me. I'd been feeling so lonely, as if nobody wanted me, and I shall never forget how Mother put her arms around me and cuddled me, and how safe and comfortable I felt. It was always just like home there to me. And why not, I'd like to know. Look here, Mary, I'm going to ask you something plump and plain. Have you really been happy in your marriage, my dear, or have you not? You're such a loyal little soul, I know you'd never show it if you weren't, and sometimes I've had me doubts about you, Mary, for you and the doctor are just as different as chalk and cheese. Of course I have, as happy as the day's long, cried Mary, sensitive as ever to a reflection on her husband. You mustn't think anything like that, Tilly. I couldn't imagine myself married to any one but Richard. Then that only makes it harder for you now, poor thing, pulled two ways like as you are, said Tilly, and trumpeted afresh. "'All the same, there isn't anything I'd stick at, Mary, to keep you here. "'Don't be offended, my dear, but it doesn't matter half so much about the doctor going as you. "'There's none cleverer than him, of course, in his own line. "'But he's never fitted in properly here. "'I don't want to exactly say he thinks himself too good for us. "'But there is something, Mary, love, and I'm not the only one who's felt it. "'I've known people go on like anything about him behind his back.' "'Nothing would induce them to have him and his haughty airs inside their doors again, etc.' Mary flushed. "'Yes, I know people do sometimes judge Richard very unkindly, for at heart he's the most modest of men. It's only his manner, and he can't help that, can he?' "'There are those who say a doctor ought to be able to, my dear. But never mind him. Oh, it's you I feel for, Mary, being dragged off like this. Can't you do something, dear? Put your foot down?' Mary shook her head. "'It's no use. Richard is so, well, so queer in some ways, Tilly. Besides, you know, I don't think it would be right of me to really pit my will against his.' "'Poor little you. Oh, men are queer fish, Mary, aren't they? Not that I can complain. I drew a prize in the lucky bag when I took that old Jorkins in there. But when I look around me, or think back and see what we women put up with. There was poor old Ma. She had to be man for both.' "'And Jin, Mary, who doesn't dare call a soul her own. "'And me Lady Agnes is travelling the self-same road. "'Why, she has to cock her eye at Henry nowadays "'before she trusts herself to say whether it's beef or mutton she's eating. "'And now here's you, love, carted off with never with your leave or by your leave, "'just because the doctor's tired of it and thinks he'd like a change. "'There's no question of whether you're tired or not. Oh, my no! "'But he has to earn the money till he... "'It isn't quite fair to put it that way,' protested her friend. "'Well, I don't know, Mary, I'm sure,' and Tilly's plump person rose and sank in a prodigious sigh. "'But if I was his wife, he wouldn't get off so easy. I know that. It makes me just boil.' Mary answered with a rueful smile. She could never be angry with Richard in cold blood or for long together. As time went on, though, and the break-up of her home began— by the auctioneer's man appearing to pore over and appraise the furniture, a certain dull resentment did sometimes come uppermost. Under its sway she had forcibly to remind herself what a good husband Richard had always been, and to tell off his qualities one by one, instead of taking them as hitherto for granted. No, her quarrel, she began to see, was not so much with him as with the powers above. Why should her husband alone not be as robust and hardy as all the other husbands in the place? None of their healths threatened to fail, nor did any of them find the conditions of the life intolerable. That was another shabby trick fate had played Richard in not endowing him with worldly wisdom and a healthy itch to succeed. Instead of that, he had been blessed with ideas and impulses that stood directly in his way. And it was here that Mary bore more than one of her private ambitions for him to its grave. A new expression came into her eyes, too, an unsure, baffled look. Life was not, after all, going to be the simple, straightforward affair she had believed. Thus far, save for the one unhappy business with Purdy, wrongs and complications had passed her by. Now she saw that no more than any one else could she hope to escape them. Out of this frame of mind she wrote a long, confidential letter to John. 
John must not be left in ignorance of what hung over her, it was also a relief to unbosom herself to one of her own family. And John was good enough to travel up expressly to talk things over with her, and, as he put it, to call Richard to order. Like every one else, he showed the whites of his eyes at the latter's flimsy reasons for seeking a change. But when, in spite of her warning, he bearded his brother-in-law with a jocose and hearty, "'Come, come, my dear Marnie, what's all this? You're actually thinking of giving us the slip?' Richard took his interference so badly, became so agitated over the head of the harmless question, that John's airy remonstrance died in his throat. "'Mad as a March hare,' was his private verdict, as he shook down his ruffled plumes. To Mary he said ponderously, "'Well, upon my soul, my dear girl, I don't know. I am frankly at a loss what to say. Measured by every practical standard, the step he contemplates is little short of suicidal. I fear he will live to regret it.' And Mary, who had not expected anything from John's intervention, and also knew the grounds for Richard's heat, Mary now resigned herself, with the best grace she could muster, to the inevitable. End of Part 4 Chapter 11《》Chapter 12 of Australia Felix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Part 4 Chapter 12. House and practice sold for a good round sum. The brass plates were removed from gate and door, leaving dirty squares flanked by screw holes. Carpets came up and curtains down, and like rats from a doomed ship, men and women servants fled to other situations. One fine day the auctioneer's bell was rung through the main streets of the town, and both on this and the next, when the red flag flew in front of the house, a troop of intending purchasers, together with an even larger number of the merely curious, streamed in at the gate and overran the premises. At noon the auctioneer mounted his perch, gathered the crowd around him, and soon had the sale in full swing, catching head-bobs or wheedling and insisting, with, when persuasion could do no more, his monotonous parrot-cry of, "'Going!' "'Going! Gone!' It would have been in bad taste for either husband or wife to be visible while the auction was in progress, and the night before Mary and the child had moved to Tilly's, where they would stay for the rest of the time. But Marney was still hard at work. The job of winding up and getting in the money owed him was no light one, for the report had somehow got abroad that he was retiring from practice because he had made his fortune— and only too many people took this as a tacit permission to leave their bills unpaid. He had locked himself and his account-books into a small back room, where stood the few articles they had picked out to carry with them. Mary's sewing-table, his first gift to her after marriage, their modest stock of silver, his medical library. But he had been forced to lower the blind to hinder impertinent noses flattening themselves against the window, and thus could scarcely see to put pen to paper— while the auctioneer's grating voice was a constant source of distraction, not to mention the rude comments made by the crowd on house and furniture, the ceaseless trying of the handle of the locked door. When it came to the point, this tearing up of one's roots was a murderous business, nothing for a man of his temperament. Mary was a good deal better able to stand it than he. Violently as she had opposed the move in the beginning, she was now, dear soul, putting a cheery face on it, but then Mary belonged to that happy class of mortals who could set up their lares and panates inside any four walls, whereas he was a very slave to associations. Did she regret parting with a pretty table and a comfortable chair, it was solely because of the prettiness and convenience. As long as she could replace them by other articles of the same kind, she was content. But to him each familiar object was bound by a thousand memories, and it was the loss of these which could never be replaced that cut him to the quick. Meanwhile, this was the kind of thing he had to listen to. "'Ere now, ladies and gents, we have a very fine pier-glass, a very chaste and tasty pier-glass indeed, a real addition to any lady's drawing-room. Mrs. Rupp, do I understand you are right, Mrs. Rupp? Mrs. Rupp offers twelve bob for this very handsome article. Twelve bob, going twelve, fifteen, thank you, Mrs. Bromby, going fifteen, going, going, eighteen, right you are, my dear,' and so on. It had a history, had that pier-glass. Its purchase dated from a time in their lives when they had been forced to turn each shilling in the palm. Mary had espied it one day in Plaistow's stores, and had set her heart on buying it. How she had schemed to scrape the money together, saving so much on a new gown, so much on bonnet and mantle. 
he remembered, as if it were yesterday, the morning on which she had burst in, eyes and cheeks aglow, to tell him that she had managed it at last, and how they had gone off arm in arm to secure the prize. Yes, for all their poverty those had been happy days. Little extravagances such as this, or the trifling gifts they had contrived to make each other, had given far more pleasure than the costlier presents of later years. "'The next article I draw your attention to is a sofa,' went on the voice, sounding suddenly closer, and with a great trampling and shuffling the crowd trooped after it to the adjoining room. "'And a very easy and comfortable piece of furniture it is, too. A bit shabby and worn here and there, but not any the worse of that.' "'You don't need to worry if the kids play puff-puffs on it, and it fits the shape of the body all the better. Anyone like to try it? Just the very thing for a tired gent home from biz, or Andy to pop your lady on when she faints, as the best of ladies will. Any hoffers? Mr. De La A guinea? Thank you, mister. One guinea? Going a guinea. Now, come on, ladies and gentlemen, do you think I've got a notion to make you a present of it? What's that? Two and twenty. God, is this a tiddlin' match?' How proud he had been of that sofa! In his first surgery he had had nowhere to lay an aching head. Well-worn? Small wonder! He would like to know how many hundreds of times he had flung himself down on it, utterly played out. He had been used to lie there of an evening, too, when Mary came in to chat about household affairs, or to report on her day's doings. And he remembered another time, when he had spent the last hours of a distracted night on it, and how, between sleeping and waking, he had strained his ears for footsteps that never came. The sofa was knocked down to his butcher for a couple of pounds, and the crying or decrying of his bookcases began. He could stand no more of it. Sweeping his papers into a bag, he guiltily unlocked the door, and stole out by way of kitchen and back gate. But once outside, he did not know where to go or what to do. Leaving the town behind him, he made for the lake, and roved aimlessly and disconsolately about, choosing sheltered paths and remote roads where he would be unlikely to run the gauntlet of acquaintances, for he shrank from recognition on this particular day, when all his domestic privacies were being bared to the public view. But altogether of late he had fought shy of meeting people. Their hard, matter-of-fact faces showed him only too plainly what they thought of him. At first he had been fool enough to scan them eagerly, in the hope of finding one saving touch of sympathy or comprehension. But he might as well have looked for grief in the eyes of an undertaker's mute. And so he had shrunk back into himself, wearing his stiffest stare as a shield, and leaving it to Mary to parry colonial inquisitiveness. When he reckoned that he had allowed time enough for the disposal of the last pots and pans, he rose, and made his way—well, the word home was by now become a mere figure of speech— he entered a scene of the wildest confusion. The actual sale was over, but the work of stripping the house only begun, and successful bidders were dragging off their spoils. His glass-fronted bookcase had been got as far as the surgery door. There it had stuck fast, and an angry altercation was going on how best to set it free. A woman passed him bearing Mary's girandoles. Another had the dining-room clock under her arm. A third trailed a whatnot after her. To the palings of the fence several carts and buggies had been hitched, and the horses were eating down his neatly clipped hedge. It was all he could do not to rush out and call their owners to account. The level sun-rays flooded the room, showing up hitherto unnoticed smudges and scratches on the wallpapers, showing the prints of hundreds of dusty feet on the carpetless floors. Voices echoed in hollow fashion through the naked rooms. Men shouted and spat as they tugged heavy articles along the hall, or bumped them down the stairs. It was pandemonium. The death of a loved human being could not, he thought, have been more painful to witness. Thus a home went to pieces. This was a page of one's life turned. He hastened away to rejoin Mary. There followed a week of Mrs. Tilly's somewhat stifling hospitality, when one was forced three times a day to overeat oneself for fear of giving offence, followed formal presentations of silver and plate from Masonic Lodge and District Hospital, as well as a couple of public testimonials got up by his medical brethren. But at length all was over. The last visit had been paid and received, the last evening party in their honour sat through, and Mahony breathed again. He had felt stiff and unnatural under this overdose of demonstrativeness. Now, as always, on sighting relief from a state of things that irked him, he underwent a sudden change, turned hearty and spontaneous, thus innocently succeeding in leaving a good impression behind him. He kept his temper, too, in all the fuss and ado of departure, 
the running to and fro after missing articles, the sitting on the lids of overflowing trunks, the strapping of carpet-bags, a fixing of labels. Their luggage hoisted into a spring cart, they themselves took their seats in the buggy, and were driven to the railway station, and to himself Mahony murmured an all's well that ends well. On alighting, however, he found that his greatcoat had been forgotten. He had to reseat himself in the buggy and gallop back to the house, arriving at the station only just in time to leap into the train. "'A close shave, that,' he ejaculated, as he sank on the cushions and wiped his face. "'And in more senses than one, my dear. In tearing around a corner we nearly had a nasty spill. Had I pitched out and broken my neck, this hole would have got my bones after all. Not that I was sorry to miss that cock-and-hen show, Mary. It was really too much of a good thing altogether.' for a large and noisy crowd had gathered around the door of the carriage to wish the travellers Godspeed, among them people to whom Mahony could not even put a name, whose very existence he had forgotten. And it had fairly snowed last gifts and keepsakes. Drying her eyes, Mary now set to collecting and arranging these. "'Just fancy so many turning up, dear. The railway people must have wondered what was the matter. Oh, by the way, did you notice?' I don't think you did. You were in such a rush, who I was speaking to as you ran up. It was Jim. Old Jim, but so changed I hardly knew him. As spruce as could be, in a black coat and a bell-topper. He's married again, he told me, and has one of the best-paying hotels in Smithsdale. Yes, and he was at the sale, too. He came over specially for it, to buy the piano. He did confound him, cried Mahony hotly. Oh, you can't look at it that way, Richard, as long as he has the money to pay for it. Fancy, he told me he had always admired the tune of it so much when I played and sang. My dear little piano! "'You shall have another and a better one, I promise you, old girl. Don't fret. Well, that slice of our life's over and done with,' he added, and laid his hand on hers. "'But we'll hold together, won't we, wife, whatever happens?' They had passed Black Hill and its multicoloured clay and gravel heaps, and the train was puffing uphill. The last scattered huts and weatherboards fell behind, the worked-out holes grew fewer, wooded rises appeared. Gradually, too, the white roads around Mount Banignon came into view, and the trees became denser. And having climbed the shoulder, they began to fly smoothly and rapidly down the other side. Mahony bent forward in his seat. "'There goes the last of old Warren Heap, thank the Lord. I shall never set eyes on it again.' Upon my word, I believe I came to think that hill the most tiresome feature of the place. Whichever street one turned into, up it bobbed at the foot, like a peep-show, or a bad dream, or a prison wall. In Melbourne they were the guests of John. Mahony had reluctantly resigned himself to being beholden to Mary's relatives and Mary's friends to the end of the chapter. At best, living in other people's houses was for him more of a punishment than a pleasure— but for sheer discomfort this day capped the climax. Under Zara's incompetent rule, John's home had degenerated into a lawless and slovenly abode. The meals were unpalatable, the servants pert and lazy, while the children ran wild. You could hardly hear yourself speak for the racket. Whenever possible, Mahony fled the house. He lunched in town, looked up his handful of acquaintances, bought necessaries and unnecessaries for the voyage. He also hired a boat and had himself rowed out to the ship, where he clambered on board amid the mess of scouring and painting, and made himself known to the chief mate. Or he sat on the pier and gazed at the vessel lying straining at her anchor, while quick rain squalls swept up and blotted out the bay. Of Mary he caught but passing glimpses. Her family seemed determined to make unblushing use of her as long as she was within reach. A couple of days prior to their arrival, John and Zara had quarrelled violently, and for the dozenth time Zara had packed her trunks and departed for one of those miraculous situations, the doors of which always stood open to her. John was for Mary going after her and forcing her to admit the error of her ways. Mary held it wiser to let well alone. "'Do be guided by me this time, John,' she urged, when she had heard her brother out. "'You and Zara will never hit it off, however often you try.' But the belief was ingrained in John that the most suitable head for his establishment was one of his own blood. He answered indignantly, "'And why not, pray, may I ask? Who is to hit it off, as you put it, if not two of a family?' "'Oh, John,' Mary felt quite apologetic for her brother. "'Clever as Zara is, she's not at all fitted for a post of this kind. She's no hand with the servants, and children don't seem to take to her—young children, I mean.' 
"'Not fitted? Bah!' said John. "'Every woman is fitted by nature to rear children and manage a house.' "'They should be, I know,' yielded Mary, in conciliatory fashion. "'But with Zara it doesn't seem to be the case.' "'Then she ought to be ashamed of herself, my dear Mary, ashamed of herself, and that's all about it.' Zara wept into a dainty handkerchief, and was delivered of a rigmarole of complaints against her brother, the servants, the children. According to her, the last were naturally perverse, and John indulged them so shockingly that she had been powerless to carry out reforms. Did she punish them, he cancelled the punishments. If she left their naughtiness unchecked, he accused her of indifference. Then her housekeeping had not suited him. He reproached her with extravagance, with mismanagement, even with lining her own purse. "'Well, the truth is, John is mean as dirt. I literally had to drag each penny out of him.' "'But whatever induced you to undertake it again, Zara?' "'Yes, what indeed?' echoed Zara bitterly. "'However, once bitten Mary, twice shy, never again.' But remembering the bites Zara had already received, Mary was silent. Even Zara's amateurish hand thus finally withdrawn, it became Mary's task to find some worthy and capable person to act as mistress. Taking her obligations seriously, she devoted her last days in Australia to conning and penning advertisements and interviewing applicants. "'No one too attractive, if you please, Mrs. Marnie, if you don't want him to fall a victim,' teased Richard. "'Remember our good John's inflammability. He's a very laden jar again at present.' "'No, indeed, I don't,' said Mary, with emphasis. "'But the children are the first consideration.' "'Oh, dear, it does seem a shame that Tilly shouldn't have them to look after.' and it would relieve John of so much responsibility. As it is, he's even asked me to make it plain to Tilly that he wishes Trotty to spend her holidays at school. The forsaking of the poor little motherless flock cut Mary to the heart. Trotty had clung to her, inconsolable. "'Oh, Auntie, take me with you! Oh, what shall I do without you?' "'It's not possible, darling. Your papa would never agree. But I tell you what, Trotty, you must be a good girl and make haste and learn all you can.' "'for soon I'm sure he'll want you to come and be his little housekeeper "'and look after the other children.' "'Sounded on this subject, however, John said dryly, "'Emma's influence would be undesirable for the little ones. "'His prejudice in favour of his second wife's children "'was an eternal riddle to his sister. "'He dandled even the youngest, whom he'd not seen since its birth, "'with visible pleasure. "'It must be the black eyes,' said Mary to herself, "'and shook her head at men's irrationality.' for Ginny's offspring had none of the grace and beauty that marked the two elder children. And now the last night had come, and they were gathered, a family party, round John's mahogany. The cloth had been removed, nuts and port were passing. As it was a unique occasion, the ladies had been excused from withdrawing, and the gentlemen left their cigars unlighted. Mary's eyes roved fondly from one face to another. There was Tilly, come over from her hotel— "'Nothing would induce me to spend a night under his roof, Mary.' Tilly sat hugging one of the children, who had run in for the almonds and raisins of dessert. "'What a mother lost in her,' sighed Mary once more. There was Zara, so far reconciled to her brother as to consent to be present, but only speaking at him, not to him. And dear Jerry, eager and alert, taking so intelligent a share in what was said. Poor Ned alone was wanting, neither Richard nor John having offered to pay his fare to town. Young Johnny's seat was vacant, too, for the boy had vanished directly dinner was over. In the harmony of the evening there was just one jarring note for Mary, and at moments she grew very thoughtful. For the first time Mrs. Kelly, the motherly widow on whom her choice had fallen, sat opposite John at the head of the table, and already Mary was the prey of a nagging doubt, for this person had doffed the neat morning garb she had worn when being engaged, and come forth in a cap trimmed with cherry-coloured ribbons. Not only this, she smiled in sugary fashion and far too readily, while the extreme humility with which she deferred to John's opinion and hung on his lips made another bad impression on Mary. Nor was she alone in her observations. After a particularly glaring example of the widow's complacence, Tilly looked across and shut one eye in an unmistakable wink. Meanwhile the men's talk had gradually petered out. There came long pauses in which they twiddled and twirled their wine-glasses, unable to think of anything to say. At heart both John and Marnie hailed with a certain relief the coming break. "'After all, I dare say such a queer faddy fellow is out of his element here. He'll go down better over there,' was John's mental verdict. Marnie is a characteristic. 
"'Thank God I shall not have to put up much longer with his confounded self-importance, or suffer under his matrimonial muddles.' When, at a question from Mary, John began animatedly to discuss the tuition of the younger children, Mahony seized the chance to slip away. He would not be missed. He never was, here or anywhere. On the veranda a dark form stirred and made a hasty movement. It was the boy Johnny, now grown as tall as Mahony himself, and to judge from the smell what he tried to smuggle into his pocket was a briar. "'Oh, well, yes, I'm smoking,' he said sullenly, after a feeble attempt at evasion. "'Go in and blab on me, if you feel you must, Uncle Richard.' "'Nonsense. But telling fibs about a thing does no good.' "'Oh, yes, it does. It saves a hiding,' retorted the boy, and added with a youthful vehemence, "'I'm hanged if I let the Governor take a stick to me nowadays. I'm turned sixteen, and if he dares to touch me—' "'Come, come, you know you've been something of a disappointment to your father, Johnny. That's the root of the trouble.' "'Glad if I have. He hates me anyway. He never cared for my mother's children.' "'answered Johnny, with a quaint dignity. "'I think he couldn't have cared for her, either. "'There you're wrong. "'He was devoted to her. "'Her death nearly broke his heart. "'She was one of the most beautiful women "'I have ever seen, my boy.' "'Was she?' said Johnny civilly, "'but with meagre interest. "'This long-dead mother had bequeathed him "'not even a memory of herself, "'was as unreal to him as a dream at second hand. From the chilly contemplation of her, he turned back impatiently to his own affairs, which were burning and insistent, and scenting a vague sympathy in this stranger uncle, who, like himself, had drifted out from the intimacy of the candle-lit room, he made a clean breast of his troubles. "'I can't stand the life here, Uncle Richard, and I'm not going to. Not if Father cuts me off with a shilling. I mean to see the world. This isn't the world, this dead and alive old country.' Oh, it's got to seem like it to the Governor, he's been here so long. And he cleared out from his before he was even as old as I am. Of course there isn't another blessed old Australia for me to decamp to. He might be a bit sweeter about it if there was. But America's good enough for me, and I'm off there. Yes, even if I have to work my passage out. Early next morning, fully equipped for their journey, the Marnie stood on the Williamstown Pier, the centre of the usual crowd of relatives and friends. This had been further swelled by the advent of Mrs. Devine, who came panting up, followed by her husband, and by Agnes Ocock and Amelia Grindle, who had contrived to reach Melbourne the previous evening. Even John's children were tacked on, clad in their Sunday best. Everybody talked at once, and laughed or wept, while the children played hide-and-seek round the ladies' crinolines. Strange eyes were bent on their party, strange ears cocked in their direction— and yet once again Mahony's dislike of a commotion in public choked off his gratitude toward these good and kindly people. But his star was rising. Tears and farewells and vows of constancy had to be cut short, a jaunt planned by the whole company to the ship itself abandoned, for a favourable wind had sprung up, and the captain was impatient to weigh anchor. And so the very last kisses and hand-clasps exchanged, the travellers climbed down into a boat already deep in the water with other cuddy passengers and their luggage, and were rowed out to where lay that good clipper-ship, the Red Jacket. Sitting side by side, husband and wife watched, with feelings that had little in common the receding key, Mary fluttering her damp handkerchief until the separate figures had merged in one dark mass, and even Tilly, planted in front, her handkerchief tied flagwise to the top of Jerry's cane, could no longer be distinguished from the rest. Mahony's foot met the ribbed teak of the deck with the liveliest satisfaction. His nostrils drank in the smell of tarred ropes and oiled brass. Having escorted Mary below, seen to the stowing away of their belongings, and changed his town clothes for a set of comfortable baggy garments, he returned to the deck, where he passed the greater part of the day tirelessly pacing. They made good headway, and soon the ports and towns at the water's edge were become mere whitey smudges. The hills in the background lasted longer— but first the Macedon group faded from sight, then the Dandenong Ranges, grown bluer and bluer, were also lost in the sky. The vessel crept around the outside of the great bay, to clear shoals and sandbanks, and by afternoon, with the sails close-rigged in the freshening wind, they were running parallel with the cliff. The cliff, thought Mahony, with a curl of the lip. And indeed there was no other, nothing but low scrub-grown sandhills which flattened out till they were almost level with the sea. The passage through the heads was at hand. Impulsively he went down to fetch Mary. Threading his way through the saloon, in the middle of which grew up one of the masts, he opened a door leading off it. 
"'Come on deck, my dear, and take your last look at the old place. It's not likely you'll ever see it again.' But Mary was already encoffined in her narrow berth. "'Don't ask me to even lift my head from the pillow, Richard. Besides, I've seen it so often before.' He lingered to make some arrangements for her comfort, fidgeted to know where she had put his books, then mounted a locker and craned his neck at the porthole. "'Now for the rip, wife! By God, Mary, I little thought this time last year that I should be crossing it to-day. But the cabin was too dark and small to hold him. Climbing the steep companionway, he went on deck again, and resumed his flittings to and fro. He was no more able to be still than was the good ship under him. He felt himself one with her, and gloried in her growing unrest. She was now come to the narrow channel between two converging headlands, where the waters of Hobson's Bay met those of the open sea. They boiled and churned in an eternal commotion over treacherous reefs which thrust far out below the surface, and were betrayed by straight white lines of foam. Once safely out, the vessel hove to to drop the pilot. Leaning over the gunwale, Mahony watched a boat come alongside, the man of oilskins climb down the rope ladder, and row away. Here in the open a heavy swell was running, but he kept his foot on the swaying boards long after the last of his fellow-passengers had vanished, a tall, thin figure with an eager, pointed face, and hair just greying at the temples. Contrary to habit, he had a word for every one who passed from mate to cabin-boy, and he drank a glass of wine with the captain in his cabin. Their start had been auspicious, said the latter. Seldom had he had such a fair wind to come out with. Then the sun fell into the sea, and it was night, a fine, starry night, clear with the hard, cold radiance of the south. Mahony looked up at the familiar constellations, and thought of those others long missed that he was soon to see again. Over. This page of his history was turned and done with, and he had every reason to feel thankful— for many and many a man, though escaping with his life, had left youth and health and hope on these difficult shores. He had got off scot-free. Still in his prime, his faculties green, his zest for living unimpaired, he was heading for the dear old mother country, for home. Alone and unaided he would never have accomplished it. Strength to will the enterprise, steadfastness in the face of obstacles, had been lent him from above. And as he stood gazing down into the black and fathomless deep, which sent crafty licking tongues up the vessel's side, he freely acknowledged his debt, gave honour where honour was due. From thee cometh victory, thee cometh wisdom, and thine is the glory, and I am thy servant. The last spark of a coastlight went out. Buffeted by the rising wind, the good ship began to pitch and roll. Her canvas rattled, her joints creaked and groaned, as lunging forward she cut her way through the troubled seas that break on the reef-bound coasts of this old new world. End of Part 4 Chapter 12 Recording by Tabithat This is also the end of Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. The continuation of Richard Marnie's story may be found at www.gutenberg.net.au slash ebooks zero one slash zero one zero 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 nine dot txt.